Preface to the Gospel According to St. Mark Of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Catina Aria, St. Mark, Volume 3, Part 1, by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by John Henry Newman. Preface to the Gospel According to St. Mark Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6 My God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. The prophet Isaiah foretells in a clear prophecy the calling of the Gentiles and the cause of their salvation, saying, My God shall be my strength. And he said, etc. Jerome, in which words it is shown that Christ is called a servant, because he is formed from the womb. For before these words it is said, Thus saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb to be his servant. It had indeed been the will of the Father, that the wicked tillers of the vineyard should receive the Son whom he had sent. Wherefore Christ says of them to his disciples, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because then Israel was not brought back to God. For that reason the Son of God speaks to the unbelieving Jews, saying, My God shall be my strength, who also has consoled me on the casting away of my people. And he hath said to me, It is a small thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob which have fallen by their own wickedness, and to restore the preserved, or remnant of Israel. For instead of them I have given thee a light to all the Gentiles, that thou shouldest illuminate the whole world, and shouldest cause my salvation, by which men are saved, to reach to the ends of the world. Gloss. From the words, then, which have been quoted, we can infer two things. First, the divine virtue which was in Christ, by which he was able to lighten the Gentiles. For it is said, My God shall be my strength. God therefore was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. As the Apostle says to the Corinthians, Whence also the gospel, by which believers are saved, is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone who believeth, as the same Apostle says to the Romans. The second thing is the enlightening of the Gentiles, and the salvation of the world, fulfilled by Christ, according to the will of the Father. For it is said, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Wherefore the Lord, after his resurrection, that he might fulfill the will of the Father, sent his disciples to preach, saying, Go ye and teach all nations. Some he sent to the Jews, some received the ministry of preaching to the Gentiles. But because it was right that the gospel should not only be preached for those who then lived, but also be written for those who were to come, the same distinction is observed in the writers of the gospel. For Matthew wrote the gospel to the Jews in Hebrew, and Mark was the first to write a gospel amongst the Gentiles. Eusebius. For when the glorious light of the word of God had arisen over the city of Rome, the doctrine of truth and light, which Peter was then preaching to them, so shone upon the minds of them, by their patience and listening, that they heard him daily without ever being weary. Hence also they were not content with hearing only, but they earnestly beg of Mark his disciple to commit to these writings those things which he had preached by word of mouth, that they might have a perpetual memorial of them, and might continue both at home and abroad in meditations of this sort upon the word. And they did not leave off their importunities, till they had obtained what they had requested. This then was the cause of the writing of the Gospel of Mark. But Peter, when by the Holy Ghost he discovered the pious theft which had been put upon him, was filled with joy, for he saw by this their faith and devotion, and gave his sanction to what was done, and handed down the writings to the churches, to be read forever. Pseudo-Jerome. He begins at once with the announcement of the more perfect age of Christ nor does he spend his labor on the birth of Christ as a little child, 
for he speaks of his perfection as the Son of God. Chrysostom. But he makes a compendious and brief beginning, in which he has intimated his master Peter, who was a lover of brevity. Augustine. Matthew, who had undertaken to relate what concerned the kingly person of Christ, had Mark assigned to him for a companion and abbreviator, who was to attend upon his steps, for it belongs to kings not to be without a train of attendants. Since again, the priest used to enter alone into the Holy of Holies, Luke, whose design had regard to the priesthood of Christ, had no companion to follow his footsteps, and in a manner to abbreviate his narration. Bede. It is also to be observed that the holy evangelists have each fixed upon a different commencement for their narration, in each a different ending, for Matthew, setting out from the beginning of the preaching of the gospel, has carried on the thread of his narrative up to the time of our Lord's resurrection. Mark, beginning with the first preaching of the gospel, goes on to the ascension of the Lord, and the preaching of his disciples to all nations throughout the world. But Luke, commencing with the birth of the forerunner, has ended with our Lord's ascension. John, taking his beginning from the eternity of the word of God, reaches in his gospel up to the time of the Lord's resurrection. Ambrose, because then Mark began with expressing the divine power, he is rightly represented under the figure of a lion. Rigmig, Mark is signified by the lion, for as a lion sends forth his dreadful voice in the wilderness, so Mark begins with the voice in the wilderness, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Augustine, although the figure might also be otherwise interpreted, for Mark did not wish to relate either his kingly race as Matthew did, who for this figured by a lion, or his priestly kindred, or consecration as Luke, figured by a calf. Yet he is shown to have had for his subject the things which the man Christ did, and therefore appears to be signified by the figure of a man in the four animals. Theophylact, or the eagle points out the gospel according to Mark, for it begins with the prophecy of John, for prophecy views with acuteness things which are afar, as an eagle. End of the preface to the Gospel according to St. Mark. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Commentary on the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jerome, Mark the evangelist who served the priesthood in Israel, according to the flesh a Levite, having been converted to the Lord, wrote his Gospel in Italy, showing in it how even his family benefited Christ. For commencing his Gospel with the voice of the prophetic cry, he shows the order of the election of Levi declaring that John the son of Zechariah was sent forth by the voice of an angel, and saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Pseudo-Jerome. The Greek word evangelium means good tidings. In Latin it is explained bona annunciatio, or the good news. These terms properly belong to the kingdom of God and to the remission of sins. For the gospel is that by which comes the redemption of the faithful and the beatitude of the saints. But the four Gospels are one, and one Gospel is four. In Hebrew, his name is Jesus, in Greek, Soter, in Latin, Salvator. But men say Christos in Greek, Messias in Hebrew, Unctos in Latin, that is, King and Priest. Bede. The beginning of this Gospel should be compared with that of Matthew, in which it is said, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But here he is called the son of God. Now from both we must understand one Lord Jesus Christ, son of God and son of man. And fitly, the first evangelist names him son of man, the second son of God, that from less things our senses may by degrees mount up to greater and by faith and the sacraments of the human nature assumed, arise to the acknowledgment of his divine eternity. 
Fitly also did he who was about to describe his human generation begin with a son of man, namely David or Abraham. Fitly again, he who was beginning his book with the first preaching of the gospel chose rather to call Jesus Christ the Son of God, for it belonged to the human nature to take upon him the reality of our flesh, of the race of the patriarchs, and it was the work of divine power to preach the gospel to the world. Hilary, he has testified that Christ was the Son of God, not in name only, but by his own proper nature. We are the sons of God, but he is not a son as we are, for he is the very and proper son, by origin, not by adoption, in truth, not in name, by birth, not by creation. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Bede, being about to write his gospel, Mark rightly puts first the testimonies of the prophets, that he might notify to all that what he should write was to be received without scruple of doubt, in that he showed that these things were beforehand foretold by the prophets. At once, by one and the same beginning of his gospel, he prepared the Jews, who had received the law and the prophets, for receiving the grace of the gospel, and those sacraments, which their own prophecies had foretold. And he also calls upon the Gentiles, who came to the Lord by publishing of the gospel, to receive and venerate the authority of the law and the prophets. Whence he says, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, behold, etc., Jerome, but this is not written in Isaiah, but in Malachi, the last of the twelve prophets. Pseudo Chrysostom, but it may be said that it is a mistake of the writer. Otherwise, it may be said that he has compressed into one two prophecies delivered in different places by two prophets. For in the prophet Isaiah, it is written after the story of Hezekiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But in Malachi, behold, I send mine angel. The evangelist, therefore, taking parts of two prophecies, has put them down as spoken by Isaiah, and refers them here to one passage, without mentioning, however, by whom it is said, Behold, I send mine angel. Pseudo-Augustine, for knowing that all things are to be referred to their author, he has brought these sayings back to Isaiah, who was the first to intimate the sense. Lastly, after the words of Malachi, he immediately subjoins the voice of one crying in the wilderness, in order to connect the words of each prophet, belonging as they do to one meaning, under the person of the elder prophet. Bede, or otherwise we must understand that although these words are not found in Isaiah, still the sense of them is found in many other places, and most clearly in this which he has subjoined, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. For that which Malachi has called the angel to be sent before the face of the Lord to prepare his way, is the same thing as Isaiah has said is to be heard, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. But in each sentence alike, the way of the Lord to be prepared is proclaimed, it may be, too, that Isaiah occurred to the mind of Mark in writing his gospel, instead of Malachi, as often happens, which he would, however, without doubt correct, at least when reminded by other persons, who might read his work whilst he was yet in the flesh, unless he thought that, since his memory was then ruled by the Holy Spirit, it was not without a purpose that the name of one prophet had occurred to him instead of the other. For thus whatsoever things the Holy Spirit spoke by the prophets are implied each to have belonged to all, and all to each. Jerome. By Malachi, therefore, the voice of Benemantas Agio of the Holy Spirit resounds in the Father concerning the Son, who is the countenance of the Father, by which he has been known. Bede. But John is called an angel, not by community of nature, according to the heresy of origin, but by the dignity of his office. For angel in Greek is in Latin nuntios, messenger, by which name that man is rightly called, who is sent by God, 
that he might bear witness of the light and announce to the world the Lord, coming in the flesh, since it is evident that all who are priests may by their office of preaching be called angels, as the prophet Malachi says, the lips of the priest keep knowledge, and they seek the law at his mouth, because he is the angel of the Lord of hosts. Theophylact. The forerunner of Christ, therefore, is called an angel, on account of his angelic life and lofty reverence. Again, where he says, Before thy face, it is as if he said, Thy messenger is near thee. Whence is shown the intimate connection of the forerunner with Christ, for those walk next to kings who are their greatest friends. There follows, Who will prepare thy way before thee? For by baptism he prepared the minds of the Jews to receive Christ. Pseudo Jerome. Or the way of the Lord by which he comes into men is patience, by which God comes down to us and we mount up to him. And for this reason, the beginning of John's preaching was, Repent ye, bead. But as John might be called an angel, because he went before the face of the Lord by his preaching, so he might also be rightly called a voice, because by his sound he preceded the word of the Lord. Wherefore there follows the voice of one crying, etc. For it is an acknowledged thing that the only begotten Son is called the word of the Father. And even we, from having uttered words ourselves, know that the voice sounds first, in order that the word may afterwards be heard. Pseudo Jerome, but it is called the voice of one crying, for we are wont to use a cry to deaf persons, and those afar off. Or when we are indignant, all which things we know applied to the Jews, for salvation is far from the wicked, and they stop their ears like deaf adders, and deserved to hear indignation and wrath and tribulation from Christ. Pseudo Chrysostom. But the prophecy by saying in the wilderness plainly shows that the divine teaching was not in Jerusalem, but in the wilderness, which was fulfilled to the letter by John the Baptist in the wilderness of Jordan, preaching the healthful appearing of the word of God. The word of prophecy also shows that besides the wilderness, which was pointed out by Moses, where he made pass, there was another wilderness, in which it proclaimed that the salvation of Christ was present. Pseudo Jerome, or else the voice and the cry is in the desert, because they were deserted by the Spirit of God, as a house empty and swept out, deserted also by prophet, priest, and king. Bede, what he cried is revealed, and that which is subjoined, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. For whosoever preaches a right faith and good works, what else does he but prepare the way for the Lord's coming to the hearts of his hearers? That the power of grace might penetrate these hearts and the light of truth shine in them. And the paths he makes straight when he forms pure thoughts in the soul by the word of preaching. Pseudo Jerome, or else prepare ye the way of the Lord, that is, act out of repentance and preach it, make his path straight, and walking in the royal road, we may love our neighbors as ourselves, and ourselves as our neighbors. For he who loves himself and loves not his neighbor turns aside to the right. For many act well and do not correct their neighbor well, as Eli. He, on the other hand, who hating himself loves his neighbor, turns aside to the left. For many, for instance, rebuke well, but act not well themselves, as did the scribes and Pharisees. Paths are mentioned after the way, because moral commands are laid open after penitence. Theophylact, or the way is the New Testament, and the paths are the old, because it is a trodden path, for it was necessary to be prepared for the way, that is, for the New Testament. But it was right that the paths of the Old Testament should be straightened. Verses 4 through 8. John did baptize in the wilderness, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair, and was girt of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, 
the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Pseudo Jerome, according to the above mentioned prophecy of Isaiah, the way of the Lord is prepared by John, through faith, baptism, and penitence. The paths are made straight by the rough marks of the hair cloth garment, the girdle of skin, the feeding on locusts and wild honey, and the most lowly voice, whence it is said, John was in the wilderness. For John and Jesus seek what is lost in the wilderness, where the devil conquered. There he is conquered, where man fell. There he rises up. But the name of John means the grace of God, and the narrative begins with grace. For it goes on to say, baptizing. For by baptism grace is given, seeing that by baptism sins are freely remitted. But what is brought to perfection by the bridegroom is introduced by the friend of the bridegroom. Thus catechumens, which word means persons instructed, begin by the ministry of the priest, receive the chrism from the bishop, and to show this it is subjoined, and preaching the baptism of repentance, etc. Bede. It is evident that John not only preached, but also gave to some the baptism of repentance. But he could not give baptism for the remission of sins, for remission of sins is only given to us by the baptism of Christ. It is therefore only said, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, for he preached a baptism which could not remit sins, since he could not give it. Wherefore, as he was the forerunner of the incarnate word of the Father, by the word of his preaching, so by his baptism, which could not remit sins, he preceded that baptism of penitence, by which sins are remitted. Theophylact, the baptism of John had not remission of sins, but only brought men to penitence. He preached, therefore, the baptism of repentance, that is, he preached that to which the baptism of penitence led, namely remission of sins, and that they who in penitence received Christ might receive him to the remission of their sins. Pseudo Jerome, now by John as by the bridegroom's friend, the bride is brought to Christ, as by the servant Rebecca was brought to Isaac. Wherefore there follows, and there went out to him all, etc. For confession and beauty are in his presence, that is, the presence of the bridegroom. And the bride leaping down from her camel signifies the church, who humbles herself on seeing her husband Isaac, that is, Christ. But the interpretation of Jordan, where sins are washed away, is an alien descent. For we heretofore, aliens to God by pride, are by the sign of baptism made lowly, and thus exalted on high. Bede, an example of confessing their sins, and of promising to lead a new life, is held out to those who desire to be baptized, by those words which follow, confessing their sins. Chrysostom, because indeed John preached repentance, he wore the marks of repentance in his garment, and in his food, wherefore there follows, and John was clothed in camel's hair. Bede, it says, clothed in a garment of hair, not in woolen clothes. The former is the mark of an austere garb, the latter of effeminate luxury. But the girdle of skins with which he was girt, like Elias, is a mark of mortification, and this meat, locusts, and wild honey is suited to a dweller in the wilderness, so that his object in eating was not the deliciousness of meats, but the satisfying of the necessity of human flesh. Pseudo Jerome, the dress of John, his food and employment, signifies the austere life of preachers, and that future nations are to be joined to the grace of God, which is John, both in their minds and in externals. For by camel's hair is meant the rich among the nations, and by the girdle of skin, the poor, dead to the world, and by the wandering locusts, the wise men of this world, who, leaving the dry stalks to the Jews, draw off with their legs the mystic grain, and, in the warmth of their faith, leap up towards heaven, and the faithful, being inspired by the wild honey, are full-fed from the untilled wood. Theophylact, or else the garment of camel's hair, was significative of grief, for John pointed out that he who repented should mourn, for sackcloth signifies grief. But the girdle of skins shows the dead state of the Jewish people. The food also of John not only denotes abstinence, but also shows forth the intellectual food, 
which the people then were eating without understanding anything lofty, but continually raising themselves on high, and again sinking to the earth. For such is the nature of locusts, leaping on high and again falling. In the same way the people ate honey, which had come from bees, that is, from the prophets. It was not, however, domestic, but wild, for the Jews had the scriptures, which are as honey, but did not rightly understand them. Gregory, whereby the kind itself of his food, he pointed out the Lord, of whom he was the forerunner. For in that our Lord took to himself the sweetness of the barren Gentiles, he ate wild honey. In that he, in his own person, partly converted the Jews, he received locusts for his food, which suddenly leaping up, at once fall to the ground. For the Jews leaped up when they promised to fulfill the precepts of the Lord, but they fell to the ground when by their evil works they affirmed that they had not heard them. They made therefore the leap upwards in words, and fell down by their actions. Bede, the dress and food of John may also express of what kind was his inward walk, for he used a dress more austere than was usual, because he did not encourage the life of sinners by flattery, but chide them by the vigor of his rough rebuke. He had a girdle of skin round his loins, for he was one who crucified his flesh with the affections and lusts. He used to eat locusts and wild honey, because his preaching had some sweetness for the multitude, whilst the people debated whether he was the Christ himself or not. But this soon came to an end, when his hearers understood that he was not the Christ, but the forerunner and prophet of Christ. For in honey there is sweetness, in locusts swiftness of flight. Whence there follows, and he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me. Gloss. He said this to do away with the opinion of the crowd, who thought that he was the Christ. But he announces that Christ is mightier than he, who was to remit sins, which he himself could not do. Jerome, who again is mightier than the grace, by which sins are washed away, which John signifies. He who seven times and seventy times seven remits sin. Grace indeed comes first, but remits sins once only by baptism. But mercy reaches to the wretched from Adam up to Christ through seventy-seven generations, and up to one hundred and forty-four thousand. Pseudochrysostom, but lest he should be thought to say this by way of comparing himself to Christ, he subjoins, of whom I am not worthy, etc. It is not, however, the same thing to loose the shoe latchet, which Mark here says, and to carry his shoes, which Matthew says. And indeed the evangelists follow the order of the narrative, and not able to err in anything, say that John spoke each of these sayings in a different sense. But commentators on this passage have expounded each in a different way, for he means by the latchet the tie of the shoe. He says this, therefore, to extol the excellence of the power of Christ and the greatness of his divinity, as if he said, Not even the station of his servant am I worthy to be reckoned. For it is a great thing to contemplate, as it were, stooping down those things which belong to the body of Christ, and to see from below the image of things above, and to untie each of those mysteries about the incarnation of Christ, which cannot be unraveled. Pseudo Jerome, the shoe is in the extremity of the body, for in the end the incarnate Saviour is coming for justice, whence it is said by the prophets, Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Gregory, shoes also are made from the skins of dead animals. The Lord, therefore, coming incarnate, appeared as it were with shoes on his feet, for he assumed in his divinity the dead skins of our corruption. Or else it was a custom among the ancients that if a man refused to take as his wife the woman whom he ought to take, he who offered himself as her husband by right of kindred took off that man's shoe. Rightly then does he proclaim himself unworthy to loose his shoe latchet, as if he said openly, I cannot make bare the feet of the Redeemer, for I usurp not the name of the bridegroom, a thing which is above my deserts. Theophylact. Some persons also understand it thus. All who came to John and were baptized, through penitence were loosed from the bands of their sins by believing in Christ. John then, in this way, loosed the shoe latchet of all the others, that is, the bands of sin. But Christ's shoe latchet he was not able to unloose, 
but because he found no sin in him. Bede. Thus then John proclaims the Lord, not yet as God or the Son of God, but only as a man mightier than himself. For his ignorant hearers were not yet capable of receiving the hidden things of so great a sacrament, that the eternal Son of God, having taken upon him the nature of man, had been lately born into the world of a virgin. But gradually, by the acknowledgment of his glorified lowliness, they were to be introduced to the belief of his divine eternity. To these words, however, he subjoins, as if covertly declaring that he was the true God, I baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. For who can doubt that none other but God can give the grace of the Holy Ghost? Jerome, for what is the difference between water and the Holy Ghost, who was born over the face of the waters? Water is the ministry of man, but the Spirit is ministered by God. Bede, now we are baptized by the Lord in the Holy Ghost, not only when, in the day of our baptism, we are washed in the fount of life to the remission of our sins, but also daily by the grace of the name Spirit we are inflamed to do those things which please God. End of chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. Of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 9 through 11. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Pseudo-Jerome Mark the evangelist, like a heart longing after the fountains of water, leaps forward over places, smooth and steep, and as a bee laden with honey, he sips the tops of the flowers. Wherefore he hath shown us in his narrative Jesus coming from Nazareth, saying, And it came to pass in those days, etc. Pseudo Chrysostom, for as much as he was ordaining a new baptism, he came to the baptism of John, which in respect of his own baptism was incomplete, but different from the Jewish baptism, as being between both. He did this that he might show by the nature of his baptism that he was not baptized for the remission of sins, nor as wanting the reception of the Holy Ghost, for the baptism of John was destitute of both these. But he was baptized that he might be made known to all, that they might believe on him and fulfill all righteousness, which is keeping of the commandments. For it had been commanded to men that they should submit to the prophet's baptism. Bede. He was baptized that by being baptized himself he might show his approval of John's baptism, and that by sanctifying the waters of Jordan through the descent of the dove he might show the coming of the Holy Ghost in the laver of believers. Whence there follows, and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending, and resting upon him. But the heavens are opened, not by the unclosing of the elements, but to the eyes of the Spirit, to which Ezekiel in the beginning of his book relates that they were opened. Or this, his seeing the heavens opened after baptism, was done for our sakes, to whom the door of the kingdom of heaven is opened by the laver of regeneration. Pseudo Chrysostom. Or else, that from heaven sanctified might be given to men, and earthly things be joined to heavenly. But the Holy Spirit is said to have descended upon him, not as if he then first came to him, for he never had left him, but that he might show forth the Christ, who was preached by John, and point him out to all, as it were, by the finger of faith. Bede, this event also, in which the Holy Ghost was seen to come down upon baptism, was a sign of spiritual grace, to be given to us in baptism. Pseudo Jerome, but this is the anointing of Christ according to the flesh, namely the Holy Ghost, of which anointing it is said, 
God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Bede. Well, indeed, in the shape of a dove did the Holy Ghost come down, for it is an animal of great simplicity, and far removed from the malice of gall, that in a figure he might show us that he looks out for simple hearts, and deigns not to dwell in the minds of the wicked. Pseudo Jerome. Again, the Holy Ghost came down in the shape of a dove, because in the canticles it is sung of the church, My bride, my love, my beloved, my dove. Bride in the patriarchs, love in the prophets, near of kin in Joseph and Mary, beloved in John the Baptist, dove in Christ and his apostles, to whom it is said, Be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Bede. The dove sat on the head of Jesus, lest any one should think that the voice of the Father was addressed to John, and not to Christ. And well did he add, abiding on him, for this is particular to Christ, that the Holy Ghost, once filling him, should never leave him. For it sometimes to his faithful disciples, the grace of the Spirit is conferred for signs of virtue, and for the working of miracles. Sometimes it is taken away, though for the working of piety and righteousness, for the preservation of love to God and to one's neighbor, the grace of the Spirit is never absent. But the voice of the Father showed that he himself, who came to John to be baptized with the others, was the very Son of God, willing to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Whence there follows, and there came a voice from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee am I well pleased. Not that this uninformed the Son himself of a thing of which he was ignorant, but it shows to us that we ought to believe. Augustine. Wherefore Matthew relates that the voice said, This is my beloved Son, for he wished to show that the words, This is my Son, were in fact said, and thus the persons who heard it might know that he, and not another, was the Son of God. But if you ask, which of these two sounded forth in that voice? Take which you will, only remember that the evangelists, though not relating the same form of speaking, relate the same meaning, and that God delighted himself in his Son. We are reminded in these words, In thee am I well pleased. Bede, the same voice has taught us that we also, by the water of cleansing and by the spirit of sanctification, may be made the sons of God. The mystery of the Trinity also is shown forth in the baptism. The Son is baptized, the Spirit comes down in the shape of a dove. The voice of the Father bearing witness to the Son is heard. Pseudo Jerome. Morally also it may be interpreted, we also, drawn aside from the fleeting world by the smell and purity of flowers, run with the young maidens after the bridegroom, and are washed in the sacrament of baptism, from the two fountains of the love of God and of our neighbor, by the grace of remission and the mounting up by hope, gaze upon heavenly mysteries with the eyes of a clean heart. Then we receive in a contrite and lowly spirit, with simplicity of heart, the Holy Spirit, who comes down to the meek and abides in us by a never failing charity. And the voice of the Lord from heaven is directed to us, the beloved of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And then the Father with the Son and the Holy Spirit is well pleased with us, and we are made one spirit with God. Verses 12 and 13. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Chrysostom. Because all that Christ did and suffered was for our teaching, he began after his baptism to dwell in the wilderness and fought against the devil, that every baptized person might patiently sustain greater temptations after his baptism, nor be troubled, as if this which happened to him was contrary to his expectation, but might bear up against all things and come off a conqueror. For although God allows that we should be tempted for many other reasons, yet for this cause also he allows it, that we may know that man, when tempted, is placed in a station of greater honor, 
for the devil approaches not save where he has beheld one set in a place of greater honor and therefore it is said and immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness and the reason why he does not simply say that he went into the wilderness but was driven is that thou mayest understand that it was done according to the word of divine providence by which also he shows that no man should thrust himself into temptation but that those from whom some other state are as it were driven into temptation remain conquerors bede and that no one might doubt by what spirit he said that christ was driven into the wilderness luke has on purpose premised that jesus being full of the spirit returned from jordan and then has added and was led by the spirit into the wilderness lest the evil spirit should be thought to have any power over him who being full of the holy spirit departed whither he was willing to go and did what he was willing to do chrysostom but the spirit drove him into the wilderness because he deigned to provoke the devil to tempt him and thus gave him an opportunity not only by hunger but also by place for then most of all does the devil thrust himself in when he sees men remaining solitary bede but he retires into the desert that he may teach us leaving the allurements of the world and the company of the wicked we should in all things obey the divine commands he is left alone and tempted by the devil that he might teach us that all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution whence it follows and he was in the wilderness forty days and forty nights and was tempted of satan but he was tempted forty days and forty nights that he might show us that as long as we live here and serve god whether prosperity smile upon us which is meant by the day or adversity smite us which agrees with the future of night at all times our adversary is at hand who ceases not to trouble our way by temptations for the forty days and forty nights imply the whole time of this world for the globe in which we are serving god is divided into four quarters again there are ten commandments by observing which we fight against our enemy but four times ten are forty there follows and he was with the wild beasts pseudo chrysostom but he says this to show of what nature it was the wilderness for it was impassable by man and full of wild beasts it goes on and angels ministered unto him for after temptation and a victory against the devil he worked the salvation of man and thus the apostle says angels are sent to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation we must also observe that to those who conquer in temptation angels stand near and minister bede consider also that christ dwells among the wild beasts as man but as god uses the ministry of angels thus when in the solitude of a holy life we bear with unpolluted mind the bestial manners of men we merit to have the ministry of angels by whom when freed from the body we shall be transferred to everlasting happiness pseudo jerome or then the beasts dwell with us in peace as in the ark clean animals with the unclean when the flesh lusts not against the spirit after this ministering angels are sent to us that they may give answers and comforts to hearts that watch verses fourteen and fifteen now after that john was put in prison jesus came into galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of god and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel pseudo chrysostom the evangelist mark follows matthew in his order and therefore after having said that angels minister he subjoins but after that john was put into prison jesus came etc after the temptation and the ministry of angels he goes back to galilee teaching us not to resist the violence of evil men theophylact and to show us that in persecutions we ought to retire and not to await them but when we fall into them we must sustain them pseudo chrysostom he retired also that he might keep himself for teaching and for healing before he suffered 
and after fulfilling all these things, might become obedient unto death. Bede. John being put in prison, fitly does the Lord begin to preach. Wherefore there follows, preaching the gospel, etc. For when the law ceases, the gospel arises in its steps. Pseudo Jerome. When the shadow ceases, the truth comes on. First John in prison, the law in Judea, then Jesus in Galilee. Paul among the Gentiles, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. For to an earthly kingdom succeeds poverty. To the poverty of Christians is given an everlasting kingdom. But earthly honor is like the form of water, or smoke, or sleep. Bede. Let no one, however, suppose that the putting of John in prison took place immediately after the forty days' temptation and the fast of the Lord. For whosoever reads the Gospel of John will find that the Lord taught many things before the putting of John in prison, and also did many miracles. For you have in his Gospel this beginning of miracles did Jesus, and afterwards, for John was not yet cast into prison. Now it is said that when John read the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he approved indeed the text of the history, and affirmed that they had spoken the truth, but said that they had composed the history of only one year after John was cast into prison, in which year also he suffered. Passing over then, the year of which the transactions had been published by the three others, he related the events of the former period, before John was cast into prison. When therefore Mark had said that Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he subjoins, saying, Since the time is fulfilled, etc. Pseudo Chrysostom. Since then the time was fulfilled, when the fullness of time was come, and God sent his Son, it was fitting that the race of man should obtain the last dispensation of God. And therefore he says, For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But the kingdom of God is essentially the same as the kingdom of heaven, though they differ in idea. For by the kingdom of God is to be understood that in which God reigns. And this in truth is in the region of the living, where seeing God face to face, they will abide in the good things now promised to them. Whether by this region one chooses to understand love, or some other confirmation of those who put on the likeness of things above, which are signified by the heavens. For it is clear enough that the kingdom of God is confined neither by place nor by time. Theophylact. Or else the Lord means that the time of the law is completed. As if he said, up to this time the law was at work, from this time the kingdom of God will work. That is, a conversation according to the gospel which is with reason likened to the kingdom of heaven. For when you see a man clothed in flesh, living according to the gospel, do you not say that he has the kingdom of heaven, which is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost? The next word is repent. Pseudo Jerome. For he must repent, who would keep close to eternal good, that is, to the kingdom of God. For he who would have the kernel breaks the shell. The sweetness of the apple makes up for the bitterness of its root. The hope of gain makes the dangers of the sea pleasant. The hope of health takes away from the painfulness of medicine. They are able worthily to proclaim the preaching of Christ, who have deserved to attain to the reward of forgiveness. And therefore, after he has said, Repent, he subjoins and believe the gospel. For unless ye have believed, ye shall not understand. Bede. Repent, therefore, and believe. That is, renounce dead works. For of what use is believing without good works? The merit of good works does not, however, bring to faith. But faith begins that good works may follow. End of chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. Chapter 1, verses 16 through 31 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 16 through 20. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. 
And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Gloss. The evangelist, having mentioned the preaching of Christ to the multitude, goes on to the calling of the disciples, whom he made ministers of his preaching, whence it follows, and passing along the Sea of Galilee, etc. Theophylact. As the evangelist John relates, Peter and Andrew were disciples of the forerunner, but seeing that John had borne witness to Jesus, they joined themselves to him. Afterwards, grieving that John had been cast into prison, they returned to their trade. Wherefore there follows casting nets into the sea, for they were fishers. Look then upon them, living on their own labors, not on the fruits of iniquity. For such men were worthy to become the first disciples of Christ. Whence it is subjoined, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me. Now he calls them for the second time, for this is the second calling in respect of that, of which we read in John, but it is shown to what they were called when it is added, I will make you become fishers of men. Rigmig. For by the net of holy preaching they drew fish, that is, men from the depths of the sea, that is, of infidelity, to the light of the faith. Wonderful indeed is this fishing, for fishes, when they are caught, soon die. When men are caught by the word of preaching, they rather are made alive. Bede. Now fishers and unlettered men are sent to preach, that the faith of believers might be thought to lie in the power of God, not in eloquence or in learning. It goes on to say, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Theophylact. For we must not allow any time to lapse, but at once follow the Lord. After these again he catches James and John, because they also, though poor, supported the old age of their father. Wherefore there follows, and when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee, etc. But they left their father, because he would have hindered them in following Christ. Do thou also, when thou art hindered by thy parents, leave them and come to God. It is shown by this that Zebedee was not a believer, but the mother of the apostles believed, for she followed Christ when Zebedee was dead. Bede. It may be asked how he could call two fishers from each of the boats. First Peter and Andrew, then having gone a little further, the two others, sons of Zebedee, when Luke says that James and John were called to help Peter and Andrew, and that it was to Peter only that Christ said, Fear not, from this time thou shalt catch men. He also says that at the same time, when they had brought their ships to land, they followed him. We must therefore understand that that transaction which Luke intimates happened first, and afterwards that they, as their custom was, had returned to their fishing, so that what Mark here relates happened afterwards. For in this case they followed the Lord without drawing their boats ashore, which they would have done had they meant to return, and followed him as one calling them and ordering them to follow. Pseudo Jerome Further, we are mystically carried away to heaven like Elias by this chariot, drawn by these fishers, as by four horses. On these four cornerstones the first church is built. On these, in the four Hebrew letters, we acknowledge the Tetragamaton, the name of the Lord, we who are commanded, after their example, to hear the voice of the Lord, and to forget the people of wickedness, and the house of our Father's conversation, which is folly before God, and the spider's net, in the meshes of which we, like gnats, were all but fallen, and were confined by things vain as the air, which hangs on nothing, loathing also the ship of our former walk. For Adam our forefather, according to the flesh, is clothed with the skins of dead beasts. But now, having put off the old man with his deeds, following the new man, we are clothed with those skins of Solomon, with which the bride rejoices, that she has been made beautiful. Again, Simon means obedient. Andrew, manly. James, supplanter. 
John Grace, by which four names we are knit together into God's host, by obedience that we may listen, by manliness that we do battle, by overthrowing that we may persevere, by grace that we may be preserved, which four virtues are called cardinal. For by prudence we obey, by justice we bear ourselves manfully, by temperance we tread the serpent underfoot, by fortitude we earn the grace of God. Theophylact, we must know also that action is first called, then contemplation, for Peter is the type of the active life, for he was more ardent than the others, just as the active life is the more bustling. But John is the type of the contemplative life, for he speaks more fully of divine things. Verses 21 and 22. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. Pseudo Jerome, Mark arranging the sayings of the gospel as they were in his own mind, not in themselves, quits the order of the history and follows the order of the mysteries. Wherefore he relates the first miracle on the Sabbath day, saying, And they go into Capernaum. Theophylact, quitting Nazareth. Now on the Sabbath day, when the scribes were gathered together, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Wherefore there follows, and straightway on the Sabbath day, having entered into the synagogue, he taught them. For this end the law commanded them to give themselves up to rest on the Sabbath day, that they might meet together to attend to sacred reading. Again, Christ taught them by rebuke, not by flattery as did the Pharisees. Wherefore it says, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having power, and not as the scribes. He taught them also in power, transforming men to do good, and he threatened punishment to those who did not believe on him. Bede, the scribes themselves taught the people what was written in Moses and the prophets, but Jesus as God and Lord of Moses himself, by the freedom of his own will, either added those things which appeared wanting in the law, or altered things as he preached to the people. As we read in Matthew, it was said to them of old time, but I say unto you. Verses 23 through 28. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Bede, since by the envy of the devil death first entered into the world, it was right that the medicine of healing should first work against the author of death. And therefore it is said, there was in the synagogue a man, etc. Pseudo Chrysostom, the word spirit is applied to an angel, the air, the soul, and even the Holy Ghost. Lest therefore, by the sameness of the name, we should fall into error, he adds unclean. And he is called unclean on account of his impiousness and far removal from God, and because he employs himself in all unclean and wicked works. Augustine, moreover, how great is the power which the lowliness of God, appearing in the form of a servant, has over the pride of devils. The devils themselves know so well that they express it to the same Lord clothed in the weakness of flesh. For there follows, and he cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth, etc.? For it is evident in these words that there was in them knowledge, but there was not charity. And the reason was that they feared their punishment from him, and loved not the righteousness in him. Bede. For the devils, seeing the Lord on the earth, thought that they were immediately to be judged. Pseudo Chrysostom. Or else the devil so speaks, as if he said, By taking away uncleanness, and giving to the souls of men divine knowledge, 
thou allowest us no place in men. Theophylact, for to come out of man the devil considers as his own perdition, for devils are ruthless, thinking that they suffer some evil, so long as they are not troubling men. There follows, I know that thou art the Holy One of God. Pseudo Chrysostom, as if he said, Methinks that thou art come, for he had not a firm and certain knowledge of the coming of God. But he calls him holy, not as one of many, for every prophet was also holy. But he proclaims that he was the Holy One. By the article in Greek, he shows him to be the One. But by his fear, he shows him to be the Lord of all. Augustine, for he was known to them in that degree in which he wished to be known, and he wished as much as was fitting. He was not known to them as to the holy angels, who enjoy him by partaking of his eternity according as he is the word of God, but as he was to be made known in terror to those things from whose tyrannical power he was about to free the predestinate. He was known, therefore, to the devils, not in that he is eternal life, but by some temporal effects of his power, which might be more clear to the angelic senses of even bad spirits than to the weakness of men. Pseudo Chrysostom. Further, the truth did not wish to have the witness of unclean spirits. Wherefore there follows, and Jesus threatened him, saying, etc. Whence a healthful precept is given to us, let us not believe devils, howsoever they may proclaim the truth. It goes on, and the unclean spirit tearing him, etc. For because the man spoke as one in his senses, and uttered his words without discretion, lest it should be thought that he put together his words, not from the devil, but out of his own heart, he permitted the man to be torn by the devil, that he might show that it was the devil who spoke. Theophylact that they might know, when they saw it, from how great an evil the man was freed, and on account of the miracle might believe. Bede, but it may appear to be a discrepancy, that he should have gone out of him, tearing him, or as some copies have it, vexing him, when, according to Luke, he did not hurt him. But Luke himself says, when he had cast him into the midst, he came out from him without hurting him. Wherefore it is inferred that Mark meant by vexing or tearing him what Luke expresses in the words when he had cast him into the midst, so that what he says goes on to say and did not hurt him may be understood to mean that the tossing of his limbs and vexing did not weaken him, as devils are wont to come out even with the cutting off and tearing away of limbs. But seeing the power of the miracle, they wonder at the newness of our Lord's doctrine, and aroused to search into what they had heard by what they had seen. Wherefore there follows, and they all wondered, etc. For miracles were done, that they might more firmly believe the gospel of the kingdom of God, which was being preached, since those who were promising heavenly joys to men on earth were showing forth heavenly things and divine works even on earth. For before, as the evangelist says, he was teaching them as one who had power, and now as the crowd witnesses, with power he commands the evil spirits, and they obey him. It goes on, and immediately his fame spread abroad, etc. Gloss. For those things which men wonder at, they soon divulge. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So do Jerome. Moreover, Capernaum has mystically interpreted the town of consolation, and the Sabbath as rest. The man with an evil spirit is healed by rest and consolation, that the place and time may agree with his healing. This man with an unclean spirit is the human race, in which uncleanness reigned from Adam to Moses, for they sinned without the law and perished without the law. And he, knowing the Holy One of God, is ordered to hold his peace, for they, knowing God, did not glorify him as God, but rather served the creature than the Creator. The spirit tearing the man came out of him. When salvation is near, temptation is at hand also. Pharaoh, when about to let Israel go, pursues Israel. The devil, when despised, rises up to create scandals. Verses 29 through 31. And forthwith 
when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Bede, first it was right that the serpent's tongue should be shut up, that it might not spread any more venom. Then that the woman who was first seduced should be healed from the fever of carnal concupiscence. Wherefore it is said, and forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue, etc. Theophylact, he retiring then, as the custom was on the Sabbath day, about evening to eat in his disciples' house, but she who ought to have ministered was prevented by a fever. Wherefore it goes on, but Simon's wife's mother was lying sick of a fever. Pseudo Chrysostom, but the disciples, knowing that they were to receive a benefit by that means, without waiting for the evening, prayed that Peter's mother should be healed. Wherefore there follows, who immediately tell him of her. Bede, but in the Gospel of Luke it is written that they besought him for her. For the Savior sometimes, after being asked, sometimes of his own accord, heals the sick, showing that he always assents to the prayers of the faithful, when they pray also against bad passions, and sometimes gives them to understand things which they do not understand at all, or else, when they pray unto him dutifully, forgives their want of understanding, as the psalmist begs of God, Cleanse me, O Lord, from my secret faults. Wherefore he heals her at their request. For there follows, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Theophylact. By this it is signified that God will heal a sick man, if he ministers to the spirits, through love to Christ. Bede. But in that he gives most profusely his gifts of healing and doctrine on the Sabbath day, he teaches that he is not under the law, but above the law. He does not choose the Jewish Sabbath, but the true Sabbath, and our rest is pleasing to the Lord, if, in order to attend to the health of our souls, we abstain from slavish work, that is, from all unlawful things. It goes on, and immediately the fever left her, etc. The health which is conferred at the command of the Lord returns at once entire, accompanied with such strength that she is able to minister to those of whose help she had before stood in need. Again, if we suppose that the man delivered from the devil means, in the moral way of interpretation, the soul purged from unclean thoughts, fitly does the woman cured of a fever by the command of God mean the flesh, restrained from the heat of its concupiscence by the precepts of continence. Pseudo Jerome, for the fever means intemperance, from which we the sons of the synagogue, by the hand of discipline, and by the lifting up of our desires, are healed, and minister to the will of him who heals us. Theophylact, but he has a fever who is angry, and in the unruliness of his anger stretches forth his hands to do hurt. But if reason restrains his hands, he will arise and so serve reason. End of chapter 1, verses 16 through 31. Chapter 1, verses 32 through 45, of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 32 through 34, And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. Theophylact, because the multitude thought that it was not lawful to heal on the Sabbath day, they waited for the evening to bring those who were to be healed to Jesus. Wherefore it is said, and at even when the sun had set, there follows, and he healed many that were vexed with diverse diseases. Pseudo Chrysostom, now in that he says many, all are to be understood according to the scripture mode of expression. Theophylact, or he says many because there were some faithless persons who could not at all be cured on account of their unfaithfulness. Therefore he healed many of those who were brought, that is, all who had faith. 
it goes on and cast out many devils. Pseudo-Augustine, for the devils knew that he was the Christ, who had been promised by the law, for they saw in him all the signs which had been foretold by the prophets, but they were ignorant of his divinity, as also were their princes, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Bede, for him whom the devil had known as a man, wearied by his forty days fast, without being able by tempting him to prove whether he was the Son of God, he now by the power of his miracles understood, or rather suspected to be the Son of God. The reason, therefore, why he persuaded the Jews to crucify him was not because he did not think that he was the Son of God, but because he did not foresee that he himself was to be condemned by Christ's death. Theophylact. Furthermore, the reason that he forbade the devils to speak was to teach us not to believe them, even if they say true. For if once they find persons to believe them, they mingle truth with falsehood. Pseudo Chrysostom. And Luke does not contradict this when he says that devils came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ the Son of God. For he subjoins, and he rebuking them suffered them not to speak. For Mark, who passes over many things for the sake of brevity, speaks about what happened subsequently to the above mentioned words. Bede. Again, in a mystical sense, the setting of the sun signifies the passion of him who said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when the sun was going down, more demoniacs and sick persons were healed than before. Because he who was living for a time taught a few Jews, has transmitted the gifts of faith and health to all the Gentiles throughout the world. Pseudo Jerome. But the door of the kingdom, morally, is repentance and faith, which works health for various diseases. For diverse are the vices with which the city of this world is sick. Verses 35 through 39. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. Theophylact. After that the Lord had cured the sick, he retired apart. Wherefore it is said, and rising very early in the morning, he went out and departed into a deserted place, by which he taught us not to do anything for the sake of appearance, for if we do any good, not to publish it openly. It goes on, and there prayed. Pseudo Chrysostom, not that he required prayer, for it was he who himself received the prayers of men, but he did this by way of an economy, and became to us the model of good works. Theophylact, for he shows to us that we ought to attribute to God whatever we do well, and to say to him, Every good gift cometh down from above, from thee. It continues, And Simon followed him, and they that were with him. Pseudo Chrysostom, Luke, whoever says that crowds came to Christ, and spoke what Mark here relates that the apostles said, adding, And when they came to him, they said to him, All seek thee but they did not contradict each other, for Christ received after the apostles the multitude, breathlessly anxious to embrace his feet. He received them willingly, but chose to dismiss them, that the rest also might be partakers of his doctrine, as he was not to remain long in the world. And therefore there follows, and he said, Let us go into the neighboring villages and towns, that there also I may preach. Theophylact for he passes on to them as being more in need, since it was not right to shut up doctrine in one place, but to throw out his rays everywhere. It goes on, For therefore am I come, Pseudo Chrysostom, in which word he manifests the mystery of his emptying himself, that is, of his incarnation, and the sovereignty of his divine nature, and that he here asserts that he came willingly into the world. Luke, whoever says, To this end was I sent, 
proclaiming the dispensation and the good pleasure of God the Father concerning the incarnation of the Son. There follows, and he continued preaching in their synagogues in all Galilee. Augustine. But by this preaching, which he says, he continued in all Galilee, is also meant the sermon of the Lord delivered on the mount, which Matthew mentions, and Mark has entirely passed over, without giving anything like it, save that he has repeated some sentences, not in continuous order, but in scattered places, spoken by the Lord at other times. Theophylact. He also mingled action with teaching, for whilst employed in preaching, he afterwards put to flight devils, for there follows in casting out devils. For unless Christ showed forth miracles, his teaching would not be believed. So do thou also, after teaching, work, that thy word be not fruitless in itself. Bede. Again mystically, if by the setting of the sun the death of the Savior is intended, why should not his resurrection be intended by the returning dawn? For by its clear light he went far into the wilderness of the Gentiles, and there continued praying in the person of his faithful disciples. For he aroused their hearts by the grace of the Holy Spirit to the virtue of prayer. Verses 40-45 through 45, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no longer openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Bede, after the serpent tongue of the devils was shut up, and the woman who was first seduced cured a fever, in the third place the man who listened to the evil counsels of the woman was cleansed from his leprosy, that the order of restoration in the Lord might be the same as was the order of the fall in our first parents. Whence it goes on, and there came a leper to him, beseeching him. Augustine, Mark puts together circumstances from which one may infer that he is the same as the one whom Matthew relates to have been cleansed, when our Lord came down from the mount after the sermon. Bede, and because the Lord said that he came not to destroy the law but to fulfill, he who was excluded by the law, inferring that he was cleansed by the power of the Lord, showed that that grace which could wash away the stain of the leper was not from the law, but over the law. And truly, as in the Lord, authoritative power, so in him the constancy of faith is shown. For there follows, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He falls on his face, which is at once a gesture of lowliness and of shame, to show that every man should blush for the stains of his life. But his shame did not stifle confession. He showed his wound and begged for medicine. And the confession is full of devotion and of faith. For he refers the power to the will of the Lord. Theophylact. For he said not, If thou wilt, pray unto God, but if thou wilt, as thinking him very God. Bede. Moreover, he doubted of the will of the Lord, not as disbelieving his compassion, but as conscience of his own filth, he did not presume. It goes on, But Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. It is not, as many of the Latins think, to be taken to mean and read, I wish to cleanse thee, but that Christ should say separately, I will, and then command, Be thou clean. Chrysostom. Further, the reason why he touches the leper, he did not confer health upon him by word alone, was that it is said by Moses in the law that he who touches a leper shall be unclean till the evening, that is, that he might show that his uncleanness is a natural one, that the law was not laid down for him, but on account of mere men. 
Furthermore, he shows that he himself is the Lord of the law, and the reason why he touched the leper, though the touch was not necessary to the working of the cure, was to show that he gives health, not as a servant, but as the Lord. Bede. Another reason why he touched him was to prove that he could not be defiled, who freed others from pollution. At the same time, it is remarkable that he healed in the way in which he had been begged to heal. If thou wilt, says the leper, thou canst make me clean. I will, he answered. Behold, thou hast my will, be clean. Now thou hast at once the effect of my compassion. Chrysostom. Moreover, by this, not only did he not take away the opinion of him entertained by the leper, but he confirmed it, for he puts to flight the disease by a word, and what the leper had said in word he filled up in deed. Wherefore there follows, and when he had spoken immediately, etc. Bede, for there is no interval between the work of God and the command, because the work is in the command. For he commanded, and they were created. There follows, and he straightly charged him, and forthwith, etc. See thou, tell no man, Chrysostom, as if he said, It is not yet time that my works should be preached. I require not thy preaching. By which he teaches us not to seek worldly honor as a reward for our works. It goes on, But go thy way, show thyself to the chief of the priests. Our Savior set him to the priest for the trial of his cure, and that he might not be cast out of the temple, but still be numbered with the people in prayer. He sends him also that he might fulfill all the parts of the law, in order to stop the evil-speaking tongue of the Jews. He himself indeed completed the work, leaving them to try it. Bede. This he did in order that the priest might understand that the leper was not healed by the law, but by the grace of God above the law. There follows, And offer for thy cleansing, what Moses, etc. Theophylact, he ordered him to offer the gift, which they who were healed were accustomed to offer, as if for a testimony, that he was not against the law, but rather confirmed the law, inasmuch as he himself worked out the precepts of the law. Bede, if anyone wonders how the Lord seems to approve of the Jewish sacrifice, which the church rejects, let him remember that he had not yet offered his own holocaust in his passion, and it was not right that signative sacrifices should be taken away, before that which they signified was confirmed by the witness of the apostles in their preaching, and by the faith of the believing people. Theophylact, But the leper although the Lord forbade him, disclosed the benefit. Wherefore it goes on, but he, having gone out, began to publish and to blaze abroad the tale. For the person benefited ought to be grateful, and to return thanks, even though his benefactor requires it not. Bede. Now it may well be asked why our Lord ordered his action to be concealed, and yet it could not be kept hid for an hour. But it is to be observed that the reason why, in doing a miracle, he ordered it to be kept secret, and yet for all that it was noised abroad, was that his elect, following the example of his teaching, should wish indeed that in the great things which they do, they should remain concealed, but should nevertheless unwillingly be brought to light for the good of others. Not then that he wished anything to be done which he was not able to bring about, but by the authority of his teaching he gave an example of what his members ought to wish for, and of what should happen to them even against their will. Bede. Further, this perfect cure of one man brought multitudes to the Lord, wherefore it is added that he could not any more openly enter into the city, but could only be without in desert places. Chrysostom. For the Lord everywhere proclaimed his wonderful cure, so that all ran to see and to believe on the healer. Thus the Lord could not preach the gospel, but walked in desert places. Wherefore there follows, and they came together to him from all places. Pseudo Jerome. Mystically our leprosy is the sin of the first man, which began from the head, when he desired the kingdoms of the world. For covetousness is the root of all evil. Wherefore Gehazi, 
engaged in an avarous pursuit, is covered with leprosy. Bede. But when the hand of the Savior, that is, the incarnate word of God, is stretched out and touches human nature, it is cleansed from the various parts of the old error. Pseudo Jerome. This leprosy is cleansed on offering an oblation to the true priest after the order of Melchizedek. For he tells us, Give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But in that Jesus could not openly enter into the city, it is meant to be conveyed that Jesus is not manifested to those who are enslaved to the love of praise in the broad highway, and to their own wills, but to those who with Peter go into the desert, which the Lord chose for prayer, and for refreshing his people, that is, those who quit the pleasures of the world, and all that they possess, that they may say, The Lord is my portion. But the glory of the Lord is manifested to those who meet together on all sides, that is, through smooth ways and steep, whom nothing can separate from the love of Christ. Bede, even after working a miracle in that city, the Lord retires into the desert, to show that he loves best a quiet life and one far removed from the cares of the world, and that it is on account of this desire he applied himself to the healing of the body. End of chapter 1「Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that they may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Bede, because of the compassion of God, deserts not even carnal persons. He accords to them the grace of his presence by which even they may be made spiritual. After the desert, the Lord returns into the city. Wherefore it is said, and again he entered into Capernaum, etc. Augustine. But Matthew writes this miracle as if it were done in the city of the Lord, whilst Mark places it in Capernaum, which would be more difficult of a solution if Matthew had also named Nazareth. But seeing that Galilee itself might be called the city of the Lord, who can doubt that the Lord did these things in his own city, since he did them in Capernaum, a city of Galilee, particularly as Capernaum was of such importance in Galilee as to be called its metropolis. Or else Matthew passed by the things which were done after he came into his own city, until he came to Capernaum, and so adds on the story of the paralytic healed, subjoining, and behold, they presented to him a man sick of the palsy after he had said that he came into his own city. Pseudo Chrysostom. Or else, Matthew called Capernaum his city because he went there frequently, and there did many miracles. It goes on, and it was noise that he was in the house, etc. For the desire of hearing him was stronger than the toil of approaching him. After this, they introduced the paralytic, of whom Matthew and Luke speak. 
wherefore there follows, and they came unto him, bearing one sick of the palsy, who was carried by four. Finding the door blocked up by the crowd, they could not by any means enter that way. Those who carried him, however, hoping that he could merit the grace of being healed, raising the bed with their burden, and uncovering the roof, lay him with his bed before the face of the Savior. And this is that which is added, and when they could not lay him before him, etc. There follows, but when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. He did not mean the faith of the sick man, but of his bearers, for it sometimes happens that a man is healed by the faith of another. Bede. It may indeed be seen how much each person's faith weighs with God, when that of another had such influence that the whole man at once rose up, healed body and soul, and by one's man merit another should have his sins forgiven him. Theophylact. He saw the faith of the sick man himself, since he would not have allowed him to be carried unless he had faith to be healed. Bede. Moreover, the Lord being about to cure the man of the palsy, first loosed the chains of his sins, in order to show that he was condemned to the loosing of his joints, because of the bonds of his sins, and could not be healed to the recovery of his limbs, unless these were first loosed. But Christ's wonderful humility calls this man despised, weak, with all the joints of his limbs unstrung, a son when the priest did not deign to touch him, or at least he therefore calls him a son, because his sins are forgiven him. It goes on, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man speak blasphemies? Cyril, now they accuse him of blasphemy, anticipating the sentence of his death, for there was a command in the law, that whosoever blasphemed should be put to death, and this charge they laid upon him, because he claimed for himself the divine power of remitting sins. Wherefore it is added, Who can forgive sin, save God only? For the judge of all alone has power to forgive sin. Bede, who remits sin by those also to whom he has assigned the power of remitting, and therefore Christ is proved to be very God, for he is able to remit sins as God. The Jews then are in error, who although they hold the Christ both to be God and to be able to remit sins, do not, however, believe that Jesus is the Christ. But the Arians err much more madly, who, although overwhelmed with the words of the evangelist, so that they cannot deny that Jesus is the Christ and can remit sin, nevertheless fear not to deny that he is God. But he himself, desiring to shame the traitors, both by his knowledge of things hidden and by the virtue of his works, manifests himself to be God. For there follows, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? In which he shows himself to be God, since he can know the hidden things of the heart. And in a manner, though silent, he speaks thus, With the same power and majesty, by which I look upon your thoughts, I can forgive the sins of men. Theophylact. But though their thoughts were laid bare, still they remained insensible, refusing to believe that he who knew their hearts could forgive sins. Wherefore the Lord proves to them the cure of the soul by that of the body, showing the invisible by the visible, that which is more difficult by that which is easier, although they did not look upon it as such. For the Pharisees thought it more difficult to heal the body as being more open to view, but the soul more easy to cure, because the cure is invisible. So that they reasoned thus, Lo, he does not now cure the body, but heals the unseen soul. If he had had more power, he would at once have cured the body, and not have fled for refuge to the unseen world. The Savior, therefore, showing that he can do both, says, Which is easier? As if he said, I, indeed, by the healing of the body, which is in reality more easy, but appears to you more difficult, will prove to you the health of the soul, which is really more difficult. Pseudo Chrysostom, and because it is easier to say than to do, there was still manifestly something to say in opposition, for the work was not yet manifested. Wherefore he subjoins, but that ye may know, etc. 
as if he said, Since ye doubt my word, I will bring a work which will confirm what was unseen. But he says in a marked manner, On earth to forgive sins, that he might show that he has joined the power of the divinity to the human nature by an inseparable union. Because although he was made man, yet he remained the word of God. And although by an economy he conversed on the earth with men, nevertheless he was not prevented from working miracles and from giving remission of sins. For his human nature did not in anything take away from these things which essentially belong to his divinity, nor the divinity hinder the word of God from becoming on earth, according to the flesh, the son of man, without change and in truth. Theophylact. Again he says, take up thy bed, to prove the greater certainty of the miracle, showing that it is not a mere illusion, and at the same time to show that he not only healed, but gave strength. Thus he not only turns away souls from sin, but gives them the power of working out the commandments. Bede. A carnal sign therefore is given, that the spiritual sign may be proved, although it belongs to the same power, to do away with the distempers of both soul and body. Whence it follows, and immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. Chrysostom. Further, he first healed by the remission of sins that which he had come to seek, that is, a soul, so that, when they faithlessly doubted, then he might bring forward a work before them, and in this way his word might be confirmed by the work, and a hidden sign be proved by an open one, that is, the health of the soul by the healing of the body. Bede, we are also informed that many sicknesses of body arise from sins, and therefore perhaps sins are first remitted, that the causes of sickness being taken away, health may be restored. For men are afflicted by fleshly troubles for five causes, in order to increase their merits, as Job and the martyrs, or to preserve their lowliness, as Paul by the messenger of Satan, or that they may perceive and correct their sins, as Miriam, the sister of Moses, and this paralytic, or for the glory of God, as the man born blind in Lazarus, or as the beginnings of the pains of damnation, as Herod and Antiochus. But wonderful is the virtue of the divine power, where without the least interval of time, by the commandment of the Savior, a speedy health accompanies his words. Wherefore there follows, insomuch that they were all amazed, leaving the greater thing, that is, the remission of sins, they only wonder at that which is apparent, that is, the health of the body. Theophylact. This is not, however, the paralytic, whose cure is related by John, for he had no man with him. This one had four. He is cured in the pool of the sheep market, but this one in a house. It is the same man, however, whose cure is related by Matthew and Mark. But mystically, Christ is still in Capernaum, in the house of consolation. Bede. Moreover, whilst the Lord is preaching in the house, there is not room for them, not even at the door, because whilst Christ is preaching in Judea, the Gentiles are not yet able to hear him, to whom, however, though placed without, he directed the words of his doctrine by his preachers. Pseudo-Jerome. Again, the palsy is a type of the tuper, in which man lies slothful in the softness of the flesh, though desiring health. Theophylact. If therefore I, having the powers of my mind unstrung, remain, whenever I attempt anything good without strength, as a palsied man, and if I be raised on high by the four evangelists, and be brought to Christ, and there hear myself called son, then also are my sins quitted by me. For a man is called the Son of God, because he works the commandments. Bede. Or else because there are four virtues, by which a man is through an assured heart, exalted so that he merits safety, which virtues some call prudence, fortitude, temperance, and justice. Again, they desire to bring the palsied man to Christ, but they are impeded on every side by the crowd which is between them, because often the soul desires to be renewed by the medicine of divine grace, but through the sluggishness of the groveling body is held back by the hindrance of old custom. 
oftentimes amidst the very sweetness of secret prayer, and as it may be called, a pleasant converse with God, a crowd of thoughts, cutting off the clear vision of the mind, shuts out Christ from its sight. Let us not then remain in the lowest ground, where the crowds are bustling, but aim at the roof of the house, that is, the sublimity of the Holy Scripture, and meditate on the law of the Lord. Theophylact, but how should I be born to Christ, if the roof be not opened? For the roof is the intellect, which is set above all those things which are within us. Here it has much earth about it. In the tiles which are made of clay, I mean earthly things, but if these things be taken away, the virtue of the intellect within us is freed from its load. After this, let it be let down, that is, humbled, for it does not teach us to be puffed up, because our intellect has its load cleared away, but to be humbled still more. Bede, or else the sick man is let down after the roof is opened, because when the scriptures are laid open to us, we arrive at the knowledge of Christ. That is, we descend to his lowliness, by the dutifulness of faith. But by the sick man being let down with his bed, it is meant that Christ should be known by man, whilst yet in the flesh. But by rising from the bed is meant the soul's rousing itself from carnal desires, in which it was lying in sickness. To take up the bed is to brittle the flesh itself by the bands of continence, and to separate it from earthly pleasures, through the hope of heavenly rewards. But to take up the bed and to go home is to return to paradise. Or else the man now healed, who had been sick, carries back home his bed, when the soul, after receiving remission of sins, returns, even though encompassed with the body, to its internal watch over itself. Theophylact. It is necessary to take up also one's bed, that is the body, to the working of good, for then shall we be able to arrive at contemplation, so that our thoughts should say within us, Never have we seen in this way before, that is, never understood as we have done since we have been cured of the palsy, for he who is cleansed from sin sees more purely. Verses 13 through 17 And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Bede, after that the Lord taught at Capernaum, he went to the sea, that he might not only set in order the life of the men in towns, but also preach the gospel of the kingdom to those who dwelt near the sea, and might teach them to despise the restless motions of those things which pass away like the waves of the sea, and to overcome them by the firmness of faith. Wherefore it is said, and he went forth again to the sea, and all the multitude, etc. Theophylact, or else after the miracle he goes to the sea, as if wishing to be alone, but the crowd runs to him again, that thou mightest learn that the more thou fliest from glory, the more she herself pursues thee. But if thou followest her, she will fly from thee. The Lord, passing on from thence, called Matthew. Wherefore there follows, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting, etc. Chrysostom. Now this is the same publican who is named by all the evangelists, Matthew by Matthew, simply Levi by Luke, and Levi the son of Alphaeus by Mark, for he was the son of Alphaeus. And that you may find persons with two names in other parts of Scripture, as Moses' father-in-law is sometimes called Jethro, sometimes Raglul. Bede. So also the same person is called Levi and Matthew. But Luke and Mark, on account of their reverence and the honor of the evangelist, are unwilling to put the common name. 
while Matthew is a just accuser of himself, who calls himself Matthew and publican, he wishes to show to his hearers that no one who is converted should despair of his salvation, since he himself was suddenly changed from a publican into an apostle. But he says that he was sitting at the telonium, that is, the place where the customs are looked after and administered. For telos in Greek is the same as vectigil, customs in Latin, theophylact, for he sat at the receipt of custom, either, as is often done, extracting from some, or making up accounts, or doing some actions of the sort, which publicans are wont to do in their abodes. Yea, this man, who was raised on high, from the state of life, that we may leave all things and follow Christ. Wherefore it goes on, and he saith to him, Follow me, etc. Bede. Now to follow is to imitate, and therefore in order to imitate the poverty of Christ, in the feeling of his soul, even more than an outward condition, he who used to rob his neighbor's wealth now leaves his own. And not only did he quit the gain of the customs, but he also despised the peril, which might come from the princes of this world, because he left the accounts of the customs imperfect and unsettled. For the Lord himself, who externally by human language called him to follow, inflamed him inwardly by divine inspiration to follow him the moment he had called him. Pseudo Jerome. Thus then, Levi, which means appointed, followed from the custom house of human affairs. The word who says, he who doth not quit all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Theophylact. But he who used to plot against others becomes so benevolent that he invites many persons to eat with him. Wherefore it goes on, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house. Bede. The persons here called publicans are those who exact the public customs, or men who farm the customs of the exchequer or of republics. Moreover, those also who follow after the gain of this world by business are called by the same name. They who had seen that the publicans converted from his sins to better things had found a place of pardon. Even for this reason themselves also do not despair of salvation. And they come to Jesus, not remaining in their former sins, as the Pharisees and scribes complain, but in penitence, as the following words of the evangelist show, saying, For there were many who followed him. For the Lord went to the feast of sinners, that he might have an opportunity of teaching them, and might set before his entertainers spiritual meats, which also is carried on in mystical figures. For he who receives Christ into his inward habitation is fed with the highest delights of overflowing pleasures. Therefore the Lord enters willingly and takes up his abode in the affection of him who hath believed on him. And this is the spiritual banquet of good works, which the rich cannot have, and on which the poor feast. Theophylact. But the Pharisees blame this, making themselves pure. Whence there follows, and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat, etc. Bede. If by the election of Matthew and calling of the publicans, the faith of the Gentiles is expressed, who formerly were intent on the gains of this world, certainly the haughtiness of the scribes and Pharisees intimates the envy of the Jewish people, who are vexed at the salvation of the Gentiles. It goes on, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole need not the physician, but they that are sick. He aims at the scribes and Pharisees, who, thinking themselves righteous, refuse to keep company with sinners. He calls himself the physician, who, by a strange mode of healing, was wounded on account of our iniquities, and by his wound we were healed. And he calls those whole and righteous, who, wishing to establish their own righteousness, are not subject to the righteousness of God. Moreover, he calls those rich and sinners, who, overcome by the consciousness of their own frailty, and seeing that they cannot be justified by the law, submit their necks to the grace of Christ by repentance. Wherefore it is added, For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, etc. Theophylact. Not indeed that they should continue sinners, but be converted to that repentance. End of chapter 2, verses 1 through 17.
Chapter 2, verses 18 through 28 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 18 through 22. And the disciples of John and the Pharisees used to fast, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? Then Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast, while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. Gloss. As above, the master was accused to the disciples for keeping company with sinners in their feasts. So now, on the other hand, the disciples are complained of to the master for their omission of fasts that so matter for dissension might arise among them. Wherefore it is said, and the disciples of John and the Pharisees used to fast, Theophylact, for the disciples of John, being in an imperfect state, continued in Jewish customs, Augustine, but it may be thought that he added Pharisees, because they joined with the disciples of John, in saying this to the Lord, whilst Matthew relates the disciples of John alone said it. But the words which follow rather show that those who said it spoke not of themselves but of others. For it goes on, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples fast, etc.? For these words show that the guests who were there came to Jesus, and had said this same thing to the disciples. So that in the words which he uses, they came, he speaks not of those same persons of whom he had said, and the disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. But as they were fasting, those persons who remembered it come to him. John then says this, And there came to him the disciples of John, saying, Because the apostles also were there, and all eagerly, as each could, objected these things. Chrysostom. The disciples of John, therefore, and the Pharisees, being zealous of Christ, ask him whether he alone of all men with his disciples could without abstinence and toil conquer in the fight of the passions bead but john did not drink wine and strong drink because he who has no power by nature obtains more merit by abstinence but why should the lord to whom it naturally belonged to forgive sins shun those whom he could make more pure than those who fast but Christ also fasted, lest he should break the precept. He ate with sinners, that thou mightest see his grace and acknowledge his power. It goes on, and Jesus said unto them, Can the children, etc. Augustine. Mark here calls them children of the nuptials, whom Matthew calls children of the bridegroom. For we understand the children of the nuptials to be not only those of the bridegroom, but also of the bride. Pseudo Chrysostom. He then calls himself a bridegroom, as if about to be betrothed to the church. For the betrothal is giving in earnest, namely, that of the grace of the Holy Spirit, by which the world believed. Theophylact. He also calls himself a bridegroom, not only as betrothing to himself virgin minds, but because the time of his first coming is not a time of sorrow, nor of sadness to believers. Neither does it bring with it toil, but rest. For it is without any works of the law, giving rest by baptism, by which we easily obtain salvation without toil. But the sons of the nuptials, or of the bridegroom, are the apostles, because they, by the grace of God, are made worthy of every heavenly blessing, by the grace of God, and partakers of every joy. Pseudo Chrysostom. But intercourse with him, he says, is far removed from all sorrow, when he adds, as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. He is sad, from whom some good is far removed. 
but he who has it present with him rejoices and is not sad, but that he might destroy their elation of heart and show that he intended not his own disciples to be licentious, he adds, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken, etc., as if he said, the time will come when they will show their firmness. For when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, they will fast as longing for his coming, and in order to unite to him their spirits, cleansed by bodily suffering. He shows also that there is no necessity for his disciples to fast, as having present with them the bridegroom of human nature, who everywhere executes the words of God, and who gives the seed of life. The sons of the bridegroom also cannot, because they are infants, be entirely conformed to their father, the bridegroom, who, considering their infancy, deigns to allow them not to fast. But when the bridegroom is gone, they will fast through desire of him. When they have been made perfect, they will be united to the bridegroom in marriage, and will always feast at the king's banquet. Theophylact, we must also understand that every man whose works are good is the son of the bridegroom. He has the bridegroom with him, even Christ, and fasts not, that is, does no works of repentance, because he does not sin. But when the bridegroom is taken away by the man's falling into sin, then he fasts and is penitent, that he may cure his sin. Bede, but in a mystical sense it may thus be expressed, that the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, because every man who boasts of the works of the law without faith, who follows the traditions of men and receives the preaching of Christ with his bodily ear, and not by the faith of the heart, keeps aloof from spiritual goods and wastes away with a fasting soul. But he who is incorporated into the members of Christ by a faithful love cannot fast, because he feasts upon his body and blood. It goes on, No one soweth a piece of rough, that is, new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filleth it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. Pseudo Chrysostom, as if he said, Because these are preachers of the New Testament, it is not possible that they should serve old laws. But ye who follow old customs fitly observe the fasts of Moses. But for these who are about to hand down to men new and wonderful observances, it is not necessary to observe the old traditions, but to be virtuous in mind. Some time or other, however, they will observe fasting with other virtues. But this fasting is different from the fasting of the law, for that was one of restraint, this of goodwill, on account of the fervor of the Spirit, whom they cannot yet receive. Wherefore it goes on, and no one putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put in new bottles. Bede, for he compares his disciples to old bottles, who would burst at spiritual precepts, rather than be held in restraint by them. But they will be new bottles, when, after the ascension of the Lord, they are renewed by desiring his consolation. And then new wine will come to the new bottles. That is, the fervor of the Holy Ghost will fill the hearts of spiritual men. The teacher must also take heed not to commit the hidden things of new mysteries to a soul hardened in wickedness. Theophylact, or else the disciples are likened to old garments on account of the infirmity of their minds, on which it was not fitting to impose the heavy command of fasting. Bede, neither was it fitting to sew on a new piece, that is, a portion of doctrine which teaches a general fast from all the joy of temporal delights. For if this be done, the teaching is rent, and agrees not with the old part. But by a new garment is intended good works, which are done externally, and by the new wine is expressed the fervor of faith, hope, and charity, by which we are reformed in our minds. Verses 23 through 28. And it came to pass that as he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began, as they went, to pluck the ears of corn, and the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did, when he had need, and was in hungered, and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God, 
in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and give it also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Pseudo-Chrysostom The disciples of Christ, freed from the figure and united to the truth, do not keep the figurative feast of the Sabbath. Wherefore it is said, and it came to pass, that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began, as they went, to pluck the ears of corn. Bede We read also in the following part that they who had come and went away were many, and that they had not time enough to take their food. Wherefore, according to man's nature, they were hungry. Chrysostom, but being hungry, they ate simple food, not for pleasure, but on account of the necessity of nature. The Pharisees, however, serving the figure and the shadow, accused the disciples of doing wrong. Wherefore there follows, but the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? Augustine, for it was a precept in Israel, delivered by a written law, that no one should detain a thief found in his fields, unless he tried to take something away with him. For the man who had touched nothing else but what he had eaten, they were commanded to allow to go away free and unpunished. Wherefore the Jews accused our Lord's disciples, who were plucking the ears of corn, of breaking the Sabbath, rather than of theft. Pseudo Chrysostom. But our Lord brings forward David, to whom it once happened to eat, though it was forbidden by the law, when he touched the priest's food, that by his example he might do away with their accusation of the apostles. For there follows, Have ye never read, etc. Theophylact. For David, when flying from the face of Saul, went to the chief priest, and ate the showbread, and took away the sword of Goliath, which things had been offered to the Lord. But a question has been raised how the evangelist called Abiathar, at this time high priest, when the book of Kings called him Abimelech. Bede. There is, however, no discrepancy, for both were there when David came to ask for bread and received it. That is to say, Abimelech, the high priest, and Abiathar his son. But Abimelech, having been slain by Saul, Abiathar fled to David, and became the companion of all his exile afterwards. When he came to the throne, he himself also received the rank of high priest, and the son became of much greater excellence than his father, and therefore was worthy to be mentioned as the high priest, even during his father's lifetime. It goes on, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. For greater is the care to be taken of the health and life of a man than the keeping of the Sabbath. Therefore, the Sabbath was ordered to be observed in such a way that, if there was a necessity, he should not be guilty who broke the Sabbath day. Therefore, it was not forbidden to circumcise on the Sabbath, because that was a necessary work. And the Maccabees, when necessity pressed on them, fought on the Sabbath day. Wherefore, his disciples being hungry, but was not allowed in the law, became lawful through their necessity of hunger. As now, if a sick man break a fast, he is not held guilty in any way. It goes on, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord, etc. As if he said, David the King is to be excused for feeding on the food of the priests, how much more the Son of Man, the true King and Priest, the Lord of the Sabbath, is free from fault, for pulling ears of corn on the Sabbath day. Pseudo Chrysostom, he calls himself properly Lord of the Sabbath and Son of Man, since being the Son of God, he deigned to be called Son of Man for the sake of men. Now the law has no authority over the lawgiver and Lord, for more is allowed the king than is appointed by the law. The law is given to the weak indeed, but not to the perfect and those who work above what the law enjoins. Bede. But in a mystical sense, the disciples pass through the cornfields when the holy doctors look with the care of a pious solicitude upon those whom they have initiated in the faith, and who, it is implied, are hungering for the best of all things, the salvation of men. But to pluck the ears of corn means to snatch men away from the eager desire of earthly things, 
and to rub with the hands is by examples of virtue to put from the purity of their minds the concupiscence of the flesh as men do husks to eat the grains is when a man cleansed from the filth of vice by the mouths of preachers is incorporated amongst the members of the church again fitly are the disciples related to have done this walking before the face of the lord for it is necessary that the discourse of the doctor should come first although the grace of visitation from on high following it must enlighten the heart of the hearer and well on the sabbath day for the doctors themselves in preaching labor for the hope of future rest and teach their hearers to toil over their tasks for the sake of eternal repose theophylact or else because when they have rest from their passions then they are made doctors to lead others to virtue plucking away from them earthly things bead again they walk through the cornfields with the lord who rejoice in meditating upon his sacred words they hunger when they desire to find in them the bread of life and they hunger on sabbath days as soon as their minds are in a soothing rest and they rejoice in freedom from troubled thoughts they pluck the ears of corn and by rubbing cleanse them until they come to what is fit to eat when by meditation they take to themselves the witness of scriptures to which they arrive by reading and discuss them continually until they find in them the marrow of love this refreshment of the mind is truly unpleasing to fools but is approved by the lord end of chapter two chapter three verses one through eighteen of catina aria gospel of saint mark by saint thomas aquinas this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three verses one through five and he entered again into the synagogue and there was a man there which had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal him on the sabbath day that they might accuse him and he saith unto the man which had the withered hand stand forth and he saith unto them is it lawful to do good on the sabbath days or to do evil to save life or to kill but they held their peace and when he had looked round about on them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their hearts he saith unto the man stretch forth thine hand and he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other theophylact after confounding the jews who had blamed his disciples for pulling the ears of corn on the sabbath day by the example of david the lord now further bringing them to the truth works a miracle on the sabbath showing that if it is a pious deed to work miracles on the sabbath for the health of men it is not wrong to do on the sabbath things necessary for the body he says therefore and he entered again into the synagogue and there was a man there which had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal him on the sabbath day that they might accuse him bead for since he had defended the breaking of the sabbath which they objected to his disciples by an approved example now they wish by watching him to calumniate him that they might accuse him of a transgression if he cured on the sabbath of cruelty or of folly if he refused it goes on and he saith unto the man which had the withered hand stand in the midst pseudo chrysostom he placed him in the midst that they might be frightened at the sight and on seeing him compassionate him and lay aside their malice bead and anticipating the calumny of the jews which they had prepared for him he accused them of violating the precepts of the law by a wrong interpretation wherefore there follows and he saith unto them is it lawful to do good on the sabbath day or to do evil and this he asks because they thought that on the sabbath they were to rest even from good works whilst the law commands to abstain from bad saying ye shall do no servile work therein that is sin for whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin what he first says to do good on the sabbath day or to do evil is the same as what he afterwards adds to save a life or to lose it that is to cure a man or not 
Not that God, who is in the highest degree good, can be the author of perdition to us, but that his not saving is in the language of Scripture to destroy. But if it be asked, wherefore the Lord, being about to cure the body, asked about the saving of the soul, let him understand either that in the common way of Scripture the soul is put for the man, as it is said, all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob, or because he did those miracles for the saving of a soul, or because the healing itself of the hand signified the saving of the soul. Augustine, but someone may wonder how Matthew could have said that they themselves asked the Lord if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath day, when Mark rather relates that they were asked by our Lord, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? Therefore we must understand that they first asked the Lord if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath day, then that understanding their thoughts, and that they were seeking an opportunity to accuse him, he placed in the middle of them whom he was about to cure, and put those questions which Mark and Luke relate. We must then suppose that when they were silent, he propounded the parable of the sheep, and concluded that it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. It goes on, but they were silent, pseudo Chrysostom, for they knew that he would certainly cure him. It goes on, and looking round about upon them with anger, is looking round upon them in anger, and being saddened at the blindness of their hearts, is fitting for his humanity, which he deigned to take upon himself for us. He connects the working of the miracle with the word, which proves that the man is cured by his voice alone. It follows, therefore, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, answering by all these things for his disciples, and, at the same time, showing that his life is above the law. Bede. But mystically the man with a withered hand shows the human race, tried up as to its fruitfulness in good works, but now cured by the mercy of God. The hand of man, which in our first parent had been dried up when he plucked the fruit of the forbidden tree, through the grace of the Redeemer, who stretched his guiltless hands on the tree of the cross, has been restored to health by the juices of good works. Well, too, was it in the synagogue that the hand was withered, for where the gift of knowledge is greater, there also the danger of inexcusable guilt is greater. Pseudo Jerome, or else it means the avarice, who being able to give had rather receive, and love robbery rather than making gifts. And they are commanded to stretch forth their hands, that is, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hand, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Theophylact, or he has his right hand withered, who does not the works which belong to the right side. For from the time that our hand is employed in forbidden deeds, from that time it is withered to the working of good. But it will be restored whenever it stands firm in virtue. Wherefore Christ saith, Arise, that is from sin, and stand in the midst, that thus it may stretch itself forth, neither too little or too much. Verses 6 through 12. And the Pharisees went forth, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples, that a small ship should wait on him, because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him, as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him, and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Bede. The Pharisees, thinking it a crime, that the word of the Lord, the hand which was diseased, was restored to a sound state, agreed to make a pretext of the word spoken by our Savior. Wherefore it is said 
that the Pharisees went forth, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. As if every one amongst them did not greater things on the Sabbath day, carrying food, reaching forth a cup, and whatever else is necessary for meals. Neither could he who said, and it was done, be convicted of toiling on the Sabbath day. Theophylact, but the soldiers of Herod, the king, are called Herodians, because a certain new heresy had sprung up, which asserted that Herod was the Christ. For the prophecy of Jacob intimated that when the princes of Judah failed, then Christ should come, because therefore in the time of Herod none of the Jewish princes remained, and he an alien was the sole ruler. Some thought that he was the Christ, and set on foot this heresy. These, therefore, were with the Pharisees trying to kill Christ. Bede, or else he calls Herodians the servants of Herod the Tetrarch, who on account of the hatred which their Lord had for John, pursued with treachery and hate the Savior also, whom John preached. It goes on, but Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. He fled from their treachery, because the hour of his passion had not yet come and no place away from Jerusalem was proper for his passion, by which also he gave an example to his disciples, when they suffer persecution in one city, to flee to another. Theophylact, at the same time again he goes away, that by quitting the ungrateful he might do good to more, for many followed him and he healed them, for there follows in a great multitude from Galilee, etc., Syrians and Sidonians, being foreigners, receive benefit from Christ, but his kindred, the Jews, persecute him. Thus there is no profit in relationship, if there be not a similarity in goodness. Bede, for the strangers followed him, because they saw the works of his powers, and in order to hear the words of his teaching. But the Jews, induced solely by their opinion of his powers, in the vast multitude come to hear him, and to beg for his aiding health. Wherefore there follows, and he spake to his disciples, that they should wait, etc. Theophylact, consider then how he hid his glory, for he begs for a little ship, lest the crowd should hurt him, so that entering into it he might remain unharmed. It follows, as many as had scourges, etc. But he means by scourges diseases, for God scourges us, as a father does his children. Bede, both therefore fell down before the Lord, those who had the plagues of bodily diseases, and those who were vexed by unclean spirits. The sick did this simply with the intention of obtaining health, but the demoniacs, or rather the devils within them, because under the mastery of a fear of God, they were compelled not only to fall down before him, but also to praise his majesty. Wherefore it goes on, and they cried out, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And here we must wonder at the blindness of the Arians, who, after the glory of his resurrection, deny the Son of God, whom the devils confess to be the Son of God, though still clothed with human flesh. There follows, and he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. For God said to the sinner, Why dost thou preach my laws? A sinner is forbidden to preach the Lord, lest anyone listening to his preaching should follow him in his error. For the devil is an evil master, who always mingles false things with true, that the semblance of truth may cover the witness of fraud. But not only devils, but persons healed by Christ, and even the apostles are ordered to be silent concerning him before the passion, lest by the preaching of the majesty of his divinity the economy of his passion should be retarded. But allegorically, in the Lord's coming out of the synagogue and then retiring to the sea, he prefigured the salvation of the Gentiles, to whom he deigned to come through their faith, having quitted the Jews on account of their perfidy. For the nations, driven about in diverse bypaths of error, are fully compared to the unstable sea. Again, a great crowd from various provinces followed him, because he has received with kindness many nations who come to him through the preaching of the apostles. But the ship waiting upon the Lord in the sea is the church, 
collected from amongst the nations, and he goes into it lest the crowd should throng him, because flying from the troubled minds of carnal persons, he delights to come to those who despise the glory of this world, and to dwell within them. Further, there is a difference between thronging the Lord and touching him, for they throng him when by carnal thoughts and deeds they trouble peace, in which truth dwells, but he touches him who by faith and love has received him into his heart, wherefore those who touch him are said to have been saved. Theophylact, morally again the Herodians, that is, persons who love the lusts of the flesh, wish to slay Christ. For the meaning of Herod is of skin, but those who quit their country, that is, our carnal mode of living, follow Christ, and their plagues are healed, that is, the sins which wound their conscience. But Jesus in us is our reason, which commands that our vessel, that is our body, should serve him, lest the troubles of worldly affairs should press upon our reason. Verses 13 through 19. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James. And he surnamed them Boanerges, which is sons of thunder, and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Theadius, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. Bede. After having forbidden the evil spirits to preach him, he chose holy men to cast out the unclean spirits and to preach the gospel. Wherefore it is said, and he went up into a mountain, etc. Theophylact. Luke, however, says that he went up to pray, for after the showing forth of miracles, he prays, teaching us that we should give thanks when we obtain anything good and refer it to divine grace. Pseudo Chrysostom, he also instructs the prelates of the church to pass the night in prayer before they ordain that their office be not impeded. When, therefore, according to Luke, it was day, he called whom he would, for there were many who followed him. Bede, for it was not a matter of their choice and zeal, but of divine condescension and grace, that they should be called to the apostleship. The mount also in which the Lord chose his apostles shows the lofty righteousness in which they were to be instructed, in which they were about to preach to men. Pseudo Jerome, more spiritually, Christ is the mount from which living waters flow, and milk is procured for the health of infants, whence the spiritual feast of fat things is made known, and whatsoever is believed to be most highly good is established by the grace of that mountain. Those, therefore, who are highly exalted in merits and in words are called up into a mountain, that the place may correspond to the loftiness of their merits. It goes on, and they came unto him, etc. For the Lord loved the beauty of Jacob, that they might sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, who also in bands of threes and fours watch around the tabernacle of the Lord, and carry the holy words of the Lord, bearing them forward on their actions, as men do burdens on their shoulders. Bede, for as the sacrament of this the children of Israel once used to encamp about the tabernacle, so that on each of the four sides of the square three tribes were stationed. Now three times four are twelve, and in four bands of three the apostles were sent to preach that through the four quarters of the whole world they might baptize the nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It goes on, and he gave them power, etc. That is, in order that the greatness of their deeds might bear witness to the greatness of their heavenly promises, and that they who preached unheard of things might do unheard of actions. Theophylact. Further, he gives the names of the apostles, that the true apostles might be known, so that men might avoid the false. And therefore continues, and Simon he surnamed Cephas. 
Augustine, but let no one suppose that Simon now received his name and was called Peter, for thus he would make Mark contrary to John, who relates that it had been long before said unto him, Thou shalt be called Cephas. But Mark gives this account by way of recapitulation, for as he wished to give the names of the twelve apostles, and was obliged to call him Peter, his object was to intimate briefly that he was not called this originally, but that the Lord gave him that name. Bede. And the reason that the Lord willed that he should at first be called otherwise was that from the change itself of the name a mystery might be conveyed to us. Peter then in Latin, or in Greek, means the same thing as Cephas in Hebrew. And in each language the name is drawn from a stone. Nor can it be doubted, that is the rock of which Paul spoke, and this rock was Christ. For as Christ was the true light, and allowed also that the apostles should be called the light of the world, so also to Simon, who believed on the rock Christ, he gave the name of rock. Pseudo Jerome, thus from obedience, which Simon signifies, the ascent is made to knowledge, which is meant by Peter. It goes on, and James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Bede, we must connect this with what went before. He goeth up into a mountain, and calleth. Pseudo Jerome, namely James, who has supplanted all the desires of the flesh, and John, who received by grace what others held by labor. There follows, and he surnamed them Boanerges. Pseudo Chrysostom, he called the sons of Zebedee by this name, because they were to spread over the world the mighty and illustrious deeds of the Godhead. Pseudo Jerome, or by this the lofty merit of the three mentioned above is shown, who merited to hear in the mountain the thunders of the Father, when he proclaimed in thunder through a cloud concerning the Son, This is my beloved Son, that they also, through the cloud of the flesh and the fire of the word, might, as it were, scatter the thunderbolts in rain on the earth, since the Lord turned the thunderbolts into rain, so that mercy extinguishes what judgment sets on fire. It goes on, and Andrew who manfully does violence to perdition, so that he had ever ready within him his own death, to give as an answer, and his soul was ever in his hands. Bede. For Andrew is a Greek name, which means manly, from anir, that is, man, for he manfully adhered to the Lord. There follows in Philip, pseudo Jerome, or the mouth of a lamp, that is, one who can throw light by his mouth upon what he has conceived in his heart, to whom the Lord gave the opening of a mouth, which diffused light. We know that this mode of speaking belongs to Holy Scripture, for Hebrew names are put down in order to imitate a mystery. There follows in Bartholomew, which means the son of him who suspends the waters. Of him, that is, who said, I will also command the clouds, that they rain no rain upon it. But the name of Son of God is obtained by peace and loving one's enemy. For blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. And love your enemies, that ye may be the sons of God. There follows in Matthew, that is, given, to whom it is given by the Lord, not only to obtain remission of sins, but to be enrolled in the number of the apostles. And Thomas, which means abyss, for men who have knowledge by the power of God, put forward many deep things. It goes on, and James the son of Alphaeus, that is, of the learned, or the thousandth, besides whom a thousand will fall, this other James is he whose wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. There follows Anthadius, that is, Corculum, which means he who guards the heart, one who keeps his heart in all watchfulness. Bede. But Thaddeus is the same person as Luke calls in the Gospel in the Acts Jude of James, for he was the brother of James, the brother of the Lord, as he himself has written in his epistle. There follows, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. He has added this by way of distinction from Simon Peter, and Jude the brother of James, 
Simon is called the Canaanite from Cana, a village of Galilee, and Judas Scaritos, from the village from which he had his origin, or he is so called from the tribe of Issachar, Theophylact, whom he reckons amongst the apostles, that we may learn that God does not repel any man for wickedness, which is future, but counts him worthy on account of his present virtue. Pseudo Jerome. But Simon is interpreted laying aside sorrow, for blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And he is called Canaanite, that is, zealot, because the zeal of the Lord ate him up. But Judas Iscariot is one who does not do away his sins by repentance, for Judas means boaster or vainglorious, and Iscariot the memory of death. But many are the proud and vainglorious confessors in the church, as Simon Magus and Arius and other heretics, whose death-like memory is celebrated in the church, that it may be avoided. End of chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Chapter 3, verses 19 through 35 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 19 through 22. And they went into a house, and the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils cast he out devils. Bede, the Lord leads the apostles, when they were elected, into a house, as if admonishing them, that after having received the apostleship, they should retire to look on their own consciousnesses. Wherefore it is said, And they came into a house, and the multitude came together again, so that they could not eat bread. Pseudo Chrysostom. Ungrateful indeed were the multitudes of princes, whom their pride hinders from knowledge. But the grateful multitude of people came to Jesus. Bede. And blessed indeed the concourse of the crowd, flocking together, whose anxiety to obtain salvation was so great, that they left not the author of salvation even an hour free to take food. But him whom a crowd of strangers loves to follow, his relations hold in little esteem. For it goes on, and when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold upon him. For since they could not take in the depth of wisdom, which they heard, they thought that he was speaking in a senseless way. Wherefore it continues, for they said he is beside himself. Theophylact, that is, he has a devil and is mad, and therefore they wished to lay hold upon him, that they might shut him up as one who had a devil. And even his friends wished to do this, that is, his relations, perchance his countrymen or his brethren. But it was a silly insanity in them to conceive that the worker of such great miracles of divine wisdom had become mad. Bede. Now there is a great difference between those who do not understand the word of God from slowness of intellect, such as those who are here spoken of, and those who purposely blaspheme, of whom it is added, and the scribes which came down from Jerusalem, etc. For what they could not deny, they endeavored to pervert by a malicious interpretation, as if they were not the works of God, but of a most unclean spirit, that is, of Beelzebub, who was the god of Ekron. For Bel means Baal himself, and Zebub a fly. The meaning of Beelzebub, therefore, is the man of flies, on account of the filth of the blood which was offered, from which most unclean rite they call him prince of the devils, adding, and by the prince of the devils cast ye out devils. Pseudo Jerome. But mystically the house to which they came is the early church. The crowds which prevent their eating bread are sins and vices, for he who eateth unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Bead. The scribes also coming down from Jerusalem blaspheme, but the multitude from Jerusalem and from other regions of Judea, or of the Gentiles, followed the Lord, because so it was to be at the time of his passion, that a crowd of the people of the Jews should lead him to Jerusalem with psalms and praises, 
and the Gentiles should desire to see him, but the scribes and Pharisees should plot together for his death. Verses 23 through 30. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said, He hath an unclean spirit. Pseudo Chrysostom. The blasphemy of the scribes having been detailed, our Lord shows that what they said was impossible, confirming his proof by an example. Wherefore it says, And having called them together unto him, he said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? As if he had said, A kingdom divided against itself by civil war must be desolated, which is exemplified both in a house and in a city. Wherefore also, if Satan's kingdom be divided against itself, so that Satan expels Satan from men, the desolation of the kingdom of the devils is at hand. But the kingdom consists in keeping men under their dominion. If therefore they are driven away from men, it amounts to nothing less than the dissolution of their kingdom. But if they still hold their power over men, it is manifest that the kingdom of evil is still standing. And Satan is not divided against himself. Gloss. And because he has already shown by an example that a devil cannot cast out a devil, he shows how he can be expelled, saying no man can enter into a strong man's house, etc. Theophylact. The meaning of the example is this. The devil is the strong man. His goods are the men into whom he is received. Unless therefore a man first conquers the devil, how can he deprive him of his goods, that is, of the men whom he has possessed? So also I who spoil his goods, that is, free men from suffering by his passion, first spoil the devils and vanquish them, and am their enemy. How then can ye say that I have Beelzebub, and that being the friend of the devils I cast them out? Bede the Lord has also bound the strong man, that is, the devil, which means he has restrained him from seducing the elect and entering into his house, the world. He has spoiled his house and his goods, that is, men, because he has snatched them from the snares of the devil and has united them to his church. Or he has spoiled his house because the four parts of the world over which an old enemy had sway he has distributed to the apostles and their successors, that they may convert the people to the way of life. But the Lord shows that they committed a great sin in crying out that that which they knew to be of God was of the devil, when he subjoins, Verily I say unto you, all sins are forgiven, etc. All sins and blasphemies are not indeed remitted to all men, but to those who have gone through a repentance in this life sufficient for their sins. Thus neither is Novatus right, who denied that any pardon should be granted to penitents who had lapsed in time of martyrdom, nor Origen, who asserts that after the general judgment, after the revolution of ages, all sinners will receive pardon for their sins, which ere the following words of the Lord condemn, when he adds, but he shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, etc. Pseudo Chrysostom. He says indeed that blasphemy concerning himself was pardonable, because he then seemed to be a man despised and of most lowly birth. But calumny against God has no remission. Now blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is against God, for the operation of the Holy Ghost is the kingdom of God. And for this reason he says, that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be remitted. Instead, however, of what is here added, but will be in danger of eternal damnation. Another evangelist says, neither in this world nor in the world to come, by which is understood the judgment which is according to the law, and that which is to come. 
for the law orders one who blasphemes God to be slain, and in the judgment of the second law he has no remission. However, he who is baptized is taken out of this world, but the Jews were ignorant of the remission which takes place in baptism. He therefore who refers to the devil miracles and the casting out of devils, which belong to the Holy Ghost alone, has no room left in him for remission of his blasphemy. Neither does it appear that such blasphemy as this is remitted, since it is against the Holy Ghost. Wherefore he adds, explaining it, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. Theophylact, we must, however, understand that they will not obtain pardon unless they repent. But since it was at the flesh of Christ that they were offended, even though they did not repent, some excuse was allowed them, and they obtained some remission. Pseudo Jerome, or this is meant, that he will not deserve to work out repentance, so as to be accepted, who, understanding who Christ was, declared that he was the prince of the devils. Bede, neither, however, are those who do not believe the Holy Spirit to be God guilty of an unpardonable blasphemy, because they were persuaded to do this by human ignorance, not by devilish malice. Augustine, or else impenitence itself is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which hath no remission. For either in his thought or by his tongue, he speaks a word against the Holy Ghost, the forgiver of sins, who treasures up for himself an impenitent heart. But he subjoins, because they said he hath an unclean spirit, that he might show that his reason for saying it was their declaring that he cast out a devil by Beelzebub, not because there is a blasphemy which cannot be remitted, since even this might be remitted through a right repentance. But the cause why this sentence was put forth by the Lord, after mentioning the unclean spirit, who our Lord shows was divided against himself, was that the Holy Ghost even makes those whom he brings together undivided, by his remitting those sins which divided them from himself, which gift of remission is resisted by no one, but him who has the hardness of an impenitent heart. For in another place the Jews said of the Lord that he hath a devil, without, however, his saying anything there about the blasphemy against the Spirit. And the reason is that they did not there cast in his teeth the unclean Spirit in such a way that that Spirit could by their own words be shown to be divided against himself, as Beelzebub was here shown to be, by their saying, that it might be he who casts out devils. Verses 31 through 35. There came then his brethren and his mother, and, standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat around him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother, and my sister and mother. Theophylact, because the relations of the Lord had come to seize upon him, as if beside himself, his mother urged by the sympathy of her love came to him. Wherefore it is said, And there came unto him his mother, and standing without sent unto him, calling him. Chrysostom, from this it is manifest that his brethren and his mother were not always with him, but because he was beloved by them, they come from reverence and affection, waiting without. Wherefore it goes on, and the multitude sat about him, etc. Bede. The brothers of the Lord must not be thought to be sons of the ever-Virgin Mary, as Helvidius says, nor the sons of Joseph by the former marriage, as some think but rather they must be understood to be his relations. Pseudo Chrysostom, but another evangelist says that his brethren did not believe on him, with which this agrees, which says that they sought him, waiting without, and with this meaning the Lord does not mention them as relations. Wherefore it follows, and he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? But he does not here mention his mother and brethren altogether with reproof, but to show that a man must honor his own soul above all earthly kindred. Wherefore, this is fitly said to those who called him to speak with his mother in relations, as if it were a more useful task than the teaching of salvation. Bede, being asked therefore by a messenger to go out, 
he declines, not as though he refused the dutiful service of his mother, but to show that he owes more to his father's mysteries than to his mother's feelings. Nor does he rudely despise his brothers, but preferring his spiritual work to fleshy relationship, he teaches us that religion is the bond of the heart rather than that of the body. Wherefore it goes on, and looking round on them which sat about him, he said, Behold my mother and my brethren. Chrysostom, by this the Lord shows that we should honor those who are relations by faith rather than those who are relations by blood. A man indeed is made the mother of Jesus by preaching him, for he, as it were, brings forth the Lord, when he pours him into the hearts of his hearers. Pseudo Jerome, but let us be assured that we are his brethren and his sisters, if we do the will of the Father, that we may be joint heirs with him, for he discerns us not by sex but by our deeds. Wherefore it goes on, whosoever shall do the will of God, etc. Theophylact, he does not therefore say this as denying his mother, but as showing that she is worthy of honor, not only because she bore Christ, but on account of her possessing every other virtue. Bede, but mystically the mother and brother of Jesus means the synagogue, from which according to the flesh he sprung, and the Jewish people who, while the Savior is teaching within, come to him, and are not able to enter, because they cannot understand spiritual things. But the crowd eagerly enter, because when the Jews delayed, the Gentiles flocked to Christ. But his kindred, who stand without, wishing to see the Lord, are the Jews who obstinately remained without, guarding the letter, and would rather compel the Lord to go forth to meet them, to teach carnal things, than consent to enter in to learn spiritual things of him. If, therefore, not even his parents, when standing without, are acknowledged, how shall we be acknowledged if we stand without? For the word is within, and the light within. End of chapter 3Chapter 4, verses 1 through 20 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some of it fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him the parable, and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable, and how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, 
and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. Theophylact, although the Lord appears in the transactions mentioned above to neglect his mother, nevertheless he honors her, since on her account he goes forth about the borders of the sea. Wherefore it is said, and Jesus began to teach again by the seaside, etc. Bede, for if we look into the Gospel of Matthew, it appears that this same teaching of the Lord at the sea was delivered on the same day as the former. For after the conclusion of the first sermon, Matthew immediately subjoins, saying, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. Pseudo Jerome, he began to teach at the sea, that the place of his teaching might point out the bitter feelings and instability of his hearers. Bede, after leaving the house also, he began to teach at the sea, because, quitting the synagogue, he came to gather together the multitude of the Gentile people by the apostles. Wherefore it continues, And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. Chrysostom, which we must understand was not done without a purpose, but that he might not leave any one behind, but have all his hearers before his face. Bede. Now this ship showed in a figure the church, to be built in the midst of the nations, in which the Lord consecrates for himself a beloved dwelling place. It goes on, and he taught them many things by parables. Pseudo Jerome. A parable is a comparison made between things discordant by nature, under some similitude. For parable is the Greek for a similitude, when we point out by some comparisons what we would have understood. In this way we say an iron man, when we desire that he should be understood to be hardy and strong. When to be swift we compare him to winds and birds. But he speaks to the multitudes in parables, with his usual providence, that those who could not take in heavenly things might conceive what they heard by an earthly similitude. Chrysostom, for he rouses the minds of his hearers by a parable, pointing out objects to the sight, to make his discourse more manifest. Theophylact, and in order to rouse the attention of those who heard, the first parable that he proposes is concerning the seed, which is the word of God. Therefore it goes on, and he said to them in his doctrine, not in that of Moses, nor of the prophets, because he preaches his own gospel. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Now the sower is Christ. Chrysostom, not that he went out in space, who is present in all space and fills all, but in the form and economy by which he is made more near to us through the clothing of flesh. For since we were not able to go to him, because sins impeded our path, he went out to us. But he went out preaching in order to sow the word of piety, which he spake abundantly. Now he does not needlessly repeat the same word, when he says, a sower went out to sow. For sometimes a sower goes out that he may break up land for tillage, or to pull out weeds, or some other work. But this one went out to sow. Bede, or else he went out to sow, when after calling to his faith the elect portion of the synagogue, he poured out the gifts of his grace in order to call the Gentiles also. Chrysostom, Further, as a sower does not make a distinction in the ground which is beneath him, but simply without distinction puts in the seed, so also he himself addresses all. And to signify this, he says, And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. Theophylact, Take notice that he says not that he threw it in the way, but that it fell, for a sower, as far as he can, throws it into the good ground but if the ground be bad, it corrupts the seed. Now the way is Christ, but infidels are by the wayside, that is, out of Christ. Bede, or else the way is a mind which is a path for bad thoughts, preventing the seed of the word from growing in it. 
and therefore whatsoever good seed comes in contact with such a way perishes and is carried off by devils wherefore there follows and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up and well are the devils called fowls of the air either because they are of a heavenly and spiritual origin or because they dwell in the air or else those who are about the way are negligent and slothful men it goes on and some fell on stony ground he calls stone the hardness of a wanton mind he calls ground the inconstancy of a soul in its obedience and sun the heat of a raging persecution therefore the depth of earth which ought to have received the seed of god is the honesty of a mind trained in heavenly discipline and regularly brought up in obedience to the divine words but the stony places which have no strength for fixing the root firmly are those beasts which are delighted only with the sweetness of the word which they hear and for a time with heavenly promises but in a season of temptation fall away for there is too little of healthy desire in them to conceive the seed of life theophylact or the stony persons are those who adhering a little to the rock that is to christ up to a short time receive the word and afterwards falling back cast it away it goes on and some fell among thorns by which are marked souls which care for many things for thorns are cares chrysostom but further he mentions good ground saying and other fell on good ground for the difference of the fruits follows the quality of the ground but great is the love of the sower for men for the first he commends and rejects not the second and gives a place to the third theophylact see also how the bad are the greater number and the few are those who are saved for the fourth part of the ground is found to be saved chrysostom this however the greater portion of the seed is not lost through the fault of the owner but of the earth which received it that is of the soul which hears and indeed the real husbandman if he sowed in this way would be rightly blamed for he is not ignorant that rock or the road or thorny ground cannot become fertile but in spiritual things it is not so for there it is possible that stony ground may become fertile and that the road should not be trodden down and that the thorns may be destroyed for if this could not take place he would not have sown there by this therefore he gives to us hope of repentance it goes on and he said unto them he that hath ears to hear let him hear bead as often as this is inserted in the gospel or the apocalypse of john that which is spoken is mystical and is pointed out as healthful to be heard and learnt for the ears by which they are heard belong to the heart and the ears by which men obey and do what is commanded are those of an interior sense there follows and when he was alone the twelve that were with him asked of him the parable and he said unto them unto you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of god but to them that are without all things are done in parables pseudo chrysostom as if he said unto them you that are worthy to be taught all things which are fitted for teaching shall learn the manifestation of parables but i use parables with them who are unworthy to learn because of their wickedness for it was right that they who did not hold fast their obedience to that law which they had received should not have any share in a new teaching but should be estranged from both for he showed by the obedience of his disciples that on the other hand the others are become unworthy of mystical doctrine but afterwards by bringing in a voice from prophecy he confounds their wickedness as having been long before reproved wherefore it goes on that seeing they might see and not perceive etc as if he said that the prophecy might be fulfilled which foretells these things theophylact for it was god who made them to see that is to understand what is good but they themselves see not of their own will making themselves not to see lest they should be converted and correct themselves as if they were displeased at their own salvation it goes on lest at any time they should be converted 
and their sins be forgiven them. Pseudo Chrysostom. Thus, therefore, they see and they do not see. They hear and do not understand. For their seeing and hearing comes to them from God's grace. But their seeing and not understanding comes to them from their unwillingness to receive grace. And closing their eyes and pretending that they could not see, neither do they acquiesce in what was said, and so are not charged as to their sins by hearing and seeing, but rather are made worse. Theophylact. Where we may understand in a different way his speaking to the rest in parables, that seeing they might not perceive, and hearing not understand. For God gives sight and understanding to men who seek for them, but the rest he blinds, lest it become a greater accusation against them that though they understood, they did not choose to do what they ought. Wherefore it goes on, lest at any time they should be, etc. Augustine, or else they deserved this, their not understanding, and yet this in itself was done in mercy to them, that they might know their sins, and being converted merit pardon. Bede, to those then who are without, all things are done in parables, that is, both the actions and the words of the Savior, because neither in those miracles which he was working, nor in those mysteries which he preached, were they able to acknowledge him as God. Therefore, they are not able to attain to the remission of their sins. Pseudo Chrysostom. But his speaking to them only in parables, and yet not leaving off speaking to them entirely, shows that to those who are placed near to what is good, Though they may have no good in themselves, still good is shown disguised. But when a man approaches it with reverence and a right heart, he wins for himself an abundant revelation of mysteries. When, on the contrary, his thoughts are not sound, he will be neither made worthy of those things which are easy to many men, nor even of hearing them. There follows, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then shall ye know all parables? Pseudo Jerome, for it was necessary that they to whom he spoke in parables should ask for what they did not understand, and learn by the apostle whom they despised, the mystery of the kingdom which they themselves had not. Gloss, and for this reason the Lord in saying these things shows that they ought to understand both this first and all following miracles. Wherefore, explaining it, he goes on, the sower soweth the word. Chrysostom. And indeed the prophet has compared the teaching of the people to the planting of a vine. In this place, however, it is compared to sowing, to show that obedience is now shorter and more easy, and will sooner yield fruit. Bede. But in this exposition of the Lord, there is embraced the whole range of those who might hear the words of truth, but are unable to attain to salvation. For there are some to whom no faith, no intellect, nay, no opportunity of trying its usefulness, can give a perception of the word which they hear, of whom he says, And these are by the wayside. For unclean spirits take away at once the word committed to their hearts, as birds carry away the seed off the trodden path. There are some who both experience its usefulness and feel desire for it, but some of them the calumnies of the world frighten, and others its prosperity allures, so that they do not attain to that which they approve. Of the first of whom he says, and these are they who fell on stony ground. Of the latter, and these are they which are sown among thorns. But riches are called thorns, because they tear the soul with the piercing of its own thoughts. And after bringing it to sin, they, as one may say, make it bleed by inflicting a wound. Again he says, and the toil of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches. For the man who is deceived by an empty desire of riches must soon be afflicted by the toils of continual cares. He adds, and the lusts of other things, because whosoever despises the commandments of God and wanders away lustfully seeking other things is unable to attain to the joy of beatitude and concupiscences of this sort choke the word, because they do not allow a good desire to enter into the heart, and, as it were, stifle the entrance of vital breath. There are, however, expected from these 
different classes of men, the Gentiles who do not even have grace to hear the words of life. Theophylact. Further, of those who receive the seed as they ought, there are three degrees. Wherefore it goes on, and these are they who are sown on good ground. Those who bear fruit in hundredfold are those who lead a perfect and an obedient life, as virgins and hermits. Those who bear fruit sixtyfold are those who are in the mean as continent persons, and those who are living in convents. Those who bear thirtyfold are those who, though weak indeed, bear fruit according to their own virtue, as laymen and married persons. Bede, or he bears thirtyfold, who instills into the minds of the elect faith in the Holy Trinity, sixtyfold, who teaches the perfection of good works, a hundredfold, who shows the rewards of the heavenly kingdom. For in counting a hundred, we pass on the right hand. Therefore, that number is fitly made to signify everlasting happiness. But the good ground is the conscience of the elect, which does the contrary to all the former three, which both receives with willingness the seed of the word committed to it, and keeps it when received up to the season of fruit. Pseudo Jerome, or else the fruits of the earth are contained in thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold, that is, in the law, the prophets, and the gospel. End of chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Chapter 4, verses 21 through 41 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 21 through 25. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel, or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he saith unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. Persostum. After the question of the disciples concerning the parable and its explanation, he well subjoins, and he said unto them, Is a candle brought, etc.? As if he said, A parable is given, not that it should remain obscure and hidden as if under a bed or a bushel, but that it should be manifested to those who are worthy. The candle within us is that of our intellectual nature, and it shines either clearly or obscurely, according to the proportion of our illumination. For if meditations which feed the light and the recollection with which such a light is kindled are neglected, it is presently extinguished. Pseudo Jerome, or else the candle is the discourse concerning the three sorts of seed. The bushel or the bed is the hearing of the disobedient. The apostles are the candlestick, whom the word of the Lord hath enlightened. Wherefore it goes on, for there is nothing hidden, etc. The hidden and secret thing is the parable of the seed, which comes forth to light, when it is spoken of by the Lord. Theophylact, or else the Lord warns his disciples to be the light, in their life and conversation, as if he said, As a candle is put, so as to give light, so will all look to your life. Therefore be diligent to lead a good life. Sit not in corners, but be ye a candle, for a candle gives light not when placed under a bed, but on a candlestick. This light indeed must be placed on a candlestick, that is, on the eminence of a godly life, that it may be able to give light to others. Not under a bushel, that is, in things pertaining to the palate, nor under a bed, that is, in idleness. For no one who seeks after the delights of his palate, and loves rest, can be a light shining over all. Bede or because the time of our life is contained under a certain measurement of divine providence, it is rightly compared to a bushel. But the bed of the soul is the body, in which it dwells and reposes for a time. He therefore who hides the word of God, 
under the love of this transitory life and of carnal allurements covers his candle with a bushel or a bed but he puts his light on a candlestick who employs his body in the ministry of the word of god therefore under these words he typically teaches them a figure of preaching wherefore it goes on for there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed nor is there anything made secret which shall not come abroad as if he said be not ashamed of the gospel but amidst the darkness of persecution raise the light of the word of god upon the candlestick of your body keeping fixedly in your mind that day when the lord will throw light upon the hidden places of darkness for then everlasting praise awaits you and everlasting punishment your adversaries chrysostom or else there is nothing hidden as if he said if ye conduct your life with care accusation will not be able to obscure your light Theophylact, for each of us whether he have done good or evil is brought to light in this life much more in that which is to come for what can be more hidden than god nevertheless he himself is manifested in the flesh it continues if any man have ears to hear let him hear bead that is if any man have a sense for understanding the word of god let him not withdraw himself let him not turn his ear to fables but let him lend his ear to search those things which truth has spoken his hands for fulfilling them his tongue for preaching them there follows and he said unto them take heed what ye hear theophylact that is that none of those things which are said to you by me should escape you with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you that is whatsoever degree of application you bring in that degree ye will receive profit bead or else if ye diligently endeavor to do all the good which ye can and to teach it to your neighbors the mercy of god will come in to give you both in the present life a sense to take in higher things and a will to do better things and will add for the future an everlasting reward and therefore it is subjoined and to you shall more be given pseudo jerome according to the measure of his faith the understanding of mysteries is divided to every man and the virtues of knowledge will also be added to them it goes on for he that hath to him shall be given that is he who hath faith shall have virtue and he who hath obedience to the word shall also have the understanding of the mystery again he who on the other hand has not faith fails in virtue and he who has not obedience to the word shall not have the understanding of it and if he does not understand he might as well not have heard pseudo chrysostom or else he who has the desire and wish to hear and to seek to him shall be given but he who has not the desire of hearing divine things even what he happens to have of the written law is taken from him bead for sometimes a clever reader by neglecting his mind deprives himself of wisdom of which he tastes the sweetness who though slow in intellect works more diligently chrysostom again it may be said that he hath not who has not truth but our lord says that he hath because he has a lie for every one whose understanding believes a lie thinks that he has something verses twenty six through twenty nine and he said so the kingdom of god as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up he knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear after the full corn in the ear but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come pseudo chrysostom a parable occurred a little above about the three seeds which perished in various ways and the one which was saved in which last he also shows three differences according to the proportion of faith and practice here however he puts forth a parable concerning those only who are saved wherefore it is said and he said so is the kingdom of god as if a man should cast seed into the ground etc pseudo jerome the kingdom of god is the church which is ruled by god 
and herself rules over men, and threads down the powers which are contrary to her, and all wickedness. Pseudo Chrysostom, or else he calls by the name of kingdom of God, faith in him, and in the economy of his incarnation, which kingdom indeed is as if a man should throw seed, for he himself being God and the Son of God, having without change been made man, has cast seed upon the earth, that is, he has enlightened the whole world by the word of divine knowledge. So to Jerome, for the seed is the word of life, the ground is the human heart, and the sleep of the man means the death of the Savior. The seed springs up night and day, because after the sleep of Christ, the number of Christians, through calamity and prosperity, continued to flourish more and more in faith, and to wax greater indeed. Pseudo Chrysostom, or Christ himself, is the man who rises, for he sat waiting with patience, that they who received seed should bear fruit. He rises, that is, by the word of his love, he makes us grow to the bringing forth fruit, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand, by which is meant the day, and on the left, by which is meant the night of persecution. For by these the seed springs up, and does not wither. Theophylact, or else Christ sleeps, that is, ascends into heaven, where, though he seemed to sleep, yet he rises by night, when through temptations he raises us up to the knowledge of himself. And in the daytime, when on account of our prayers, he sets in order our salvation. Pseudo Jerome, but when he says he knoweth not how, he is speaking in a figure, that is, he does not make known to us who amongst us will produce fruit unto the end. Pseudo Chrysostom, or else he says he knoweth not that he may show the free will of those who receive the word, for he commits a work to our will, and does not work the whole himself alone, lest the good should seem involuntary. For the earth brings forth fruits of its own accord, that is, she is brought to bear fruit without being compelled by necessity contrary to her will. First the blade, pseudo Jerome, that is, fear, for the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, then the full corn in the ear, that is charity, for charity is the fulfilling of the law. Pseudo Chrysostom, or first it produces the blade, in the law of nature, by degrees growing up to advancement, afterwards it brings forth the ears, which are to be collected into a bundle, and to be offered on an altar to the Lord, that is, in the law of Moses. Afterwards, the full fruit, in the gospel, or because we must not only put forth leaves by obedience, but also learn prudence, and like the stalk of corn, remain upright without minding the winds which blow us about. We must also take heed to our soul, by a diligent recollection, that, like the ears, we may bear fruit, that is, show forth the perfect operation of virtue. Theophylact, for we put forth the blade when we show a principle of good, then the ear when we can resist temptations, then comes the fruit when a man works something perfect. It goes on, and when it has brought forth the fruit, immediately he sendeth the sickle, because the harvest is come. Pseudo Jerome, the sickle is death or the judgment, which cuts down all things. The harvest is the end of the world. Gregory, or else man casts seed into the ground when he places a good intention in his heart, and he sleeps, when he already rests in the hope which attends on a good work. But he rises night and day because he advances amidst prosperity and adversity, though he knows it not for he is yet unable to measure his increase. And yet virtue, once conceived, goes on increasing. When, therefore, we conceive good desires, we put seed into the ground. When we begin to work rightly, we are the blade. When we increase to the perfection of good works, we arrive at the ear. When we are firmly fixed in the perfection of the same working, we already put forth the full corn in the ear. Verses 30 through 34. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, 
which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake ye the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone he expounded all things to his disciples. Gloss. After having narrated the parable concerning the coming forth of the fruit from the seed of the gospel, he here subjoins another parable, to show the excellence of the doctrine of the gospel, before all other doctrines. Wherefore it is said, and he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Theophylact. More brief indeed is the word of faith. Believe in God, and thou shalt be saved. But the preaching of it has been spread far and wide over the earth, and increased so that the birds of heaven, that is, contemplative men, sublime in understanding and knowledge, dwell under it. For how many wise men among the Gentiles, quitting their wisdom, have found rest in the preaching of the gospel? Its preaching, then, is greater than all. Chrysostom and also because the wisdom spoken amongst the perfect expands, to an extent greater than all other sayings, than which was told to men in short discourses, for there is nothing greater than this truth. Theophylact, again it put forth great bows, for the apostles were divided off as the bows of the tree, some to Rome, some to India, some to other parts of the world. Pseudo Jerome, or else that seed is very small in fear, but great when it is grown into charity, which is greater than all herbs. For God is love, whilst all flesh is grass, but the bows which put forth are those of mercy and compassion, since under its shade the poor of Christ, who are meant by the living creatures of the heavens, delight to dwell. Bede. Again, the man who sows is by many taken to mean the Savior himself, by others, man himself sowing in his own heart. Chrysostom. Then after this, Mark, who delights in brevity, to show the nature of the parables, subjoins, and with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they could hear him. Theophylact. For since the multitude was unlearned, he instructs them from objects of food and familiar names. For this reason he adds, but without a parable spake he not unto them, that is, in order that they might be induced to approach and to ask him. It goes on, and when they were alone he expounded all things to his disciples, that is, all things which they were ignorant, and asked him, not simply all, whether obscure or not. Pseudo Jerome, for they were worthy to hear mysteries apart, in the most secret haunt of wisdom. For they were men who, removed from the crowds of evil thoughts, remained in the solitude of virtue, and wisdom is received in a time of quiet. Verses 35 through 41. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Pseudo-Jerome, after his teaching, they come from that place to the sea, and are tossed by the waves. Wherefore it is said, And the same day, when the even was come, etc. Rigmig, for the Lord is said to have had three places of refuge, namely the ship, the mountain, and the desert. As often as he was pressed upon by the multitude, he used to fly to one of these. When therefore the Lord saw many crowds about him, as a man, he wished to avoid their importunity, 
and ordered his disciples to go over to the other side. There follows, and sending away the multitudes, they took him, etc. Chrysostom, the Lord took the disciples, indeed, that they might be spectators of the miracle which was coming, but he took them alone, that no others might see that they were of such little faith. Wherefore to show that others went across separately, it is said, and there was also with him other ships, lest again the disciples might be proud of being alone taken. He permits them to be in danger, and besides this, in order that they might learn to bear temptations manfully. Wherefore it goes on, and there arose a great storm of wind, and that he might impress upon them a greater sense of the miracle which was to be done, he gives time for their fear by sleeping. Wherefore there follows, and he was himself in the hinder part of the ship, etc. For if he had been awake, they would either not have feared, nor have asked him to save them when the storm arose, or they would not have thought that he could do any such things. Theophylact, therefore he allowed them to fall into the fear of danger, that they might experience his power in themselves, who saw others benefited by him. But he was sleeping upon the pillow of the ship, that is, on a wooden one, Chrysostom, showing his humility, and thus teaching us many lessons of wisdom. But not yet did the disciples who remained about him know his glory. They thought indeed that if he arose he could command the winds, but could by no means do so reposing or asleep. And therefore it follows, they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Theophylact, but he arising rebukes first the wind, which was raising the tempest of the sea, and causing the waves to swell, and this is expressed in what follows. And he arose and rebuked the wind. Then he commands the sea, wherefore it goes on, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. Gloss, for from the troubling of the sea there arises a certain sound, which appears to be its voice threatening danger, and therefore, by a sort of metaphor, he fitly commands tranquility by a word signifying silence. Just as in the restraining of the winds, which trouble the sea with their violence, he uses a rebuke. For men who are in power are accustomed to curb those who rudely disturb the peace of mankind by threatening to punish them. By this, therefore, we are given to understand that as a king can repress violent men by threats, and by his edicts smooth the murmurs of his people, so Christ, the king of all creatures, by his threats restrained the violence of the winds, and compelled the sea to be silent. And immediately the effect followed, for it continues, and the wind ceased, which had threatened, and there arose a great calm, that is, in the sea to which he had commanded silence. Theophylact, he rebuked his disciples for not having faith, for it goes on, and he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have not faith? For if they had had faith, they would have believed that even when sleeping, he could preserve them safe. There follows, and they feared with a great fear, and said one to another, etc. For they were in doubt about him. For since he stilled the sea, not with a rod like Moses, nor with prayers like Elisha at the Jordan, nor with the ark as Joshua, the son of Nun. On this account they thought him truly God, but since he was asleep they thought him a man. Pseudo-Jerome. Mystically, however, the hinder part of the ship is the beginning of the church, in which the Lord sleeps in the body only, for he never sleepeth who keepeth Israel. For the ship, with its skins of dead animals, keeps in the living and keeps out the waves, and is bound together by wood that is, by the cross and the death of the Lord, the church is saved. The pillow is the body of the Lord, on which his divinity, which is his head, has come down. But the wind and the sea are devils and persecutors, to whom he says peace, when he restrains the edicts of impious kings, as he will. The great calm is the peace of the church after oppression, or a contemplative after an active life. Bede or else the ship into which he embarked is taken to mean the tree of his passion, 
by which the faithful attain to the security of the safe shore. The other ships which are said to have been with the Lord signify those who are imbued with faith in the cross of Christ and are not beaten about by the whirlwind of tribulation, or who, after the storms of temptation, are enjoying the serenity of peace. And whilst his disciples are sailing on, Christ is asleep, because the time of our Lord's passion came on his faithful ones when they were meditating on the rest of his future reign. Wherefore it is related that it took place late, and not only the sleep of our Lord, but the hour itself of departing light, might signify the setting of the true sun. Again, when he ascended the cross, of which the stern of the ship was a type, his blaspheming persecutors rose like the waves against him, driven on by the storms of the devils, by which, however, his own patience is not disturbed. But his foolish disciples are struck with amazement. The disciples awake the Lord, because they sought, with most earnest wishes, the resurrection of him whom they had seen die. Rising up, he threatened the wind, because when he had triumphed in his resurrection, he prostrated the pride of the devil. He ordered the sea to be still, that is, and rising again, he cast down the rage of the Jews. The disciples are blamed because after his resurrection, he chided them for their unbelief. And we also, when being marked with the sign of the Lord's cross, we determine to quit the world, embark in the ship with Christ. We attempt to cross the sea, but he goes to sleep as we are sailing amidst the roaring of the waves when amidst the strivings of our virtues, or amidst the attacks of evil spirits, of wicked men, or of our own thoughts, the flame of our love grows cold. Amongst storms of this sort, let us diligently strive to awake him. He will soon restrain the tempest, pour down peace upon us, give us the harbor of salvation. End of chapter 4Chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. When he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much, that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea, and they that fed the swine fled, and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus, and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting in cloth, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, 
and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all the men did marvel. Theophylact, those who were in the ship inquired among themselves, What manner of man is this? And now it is made known who he is by the testimony of his enemies. For the demoniac came up confessing that he was the Son of God. Proceeding to which circumstance the evangelist says, And they came over unto the other side, etc. Bede. Gereza is a noted town of Arabia, across the Jordan, near Mount Gilead, where the tribe of Manasseh held not far from the lake of Tiberias, into which the swine were precipitated, Pseudochrysostom. Nevertheless, the exact reading contains neither Gadarenes nor Gadaresins, but Gergesenes. For Gadara is a city of Judea, which had no sea at all about it, and Geraza is a city of Arabia, having neither lake nor sea near it. And that the evangelists may not be thought to have spoken so manifest a falsehood, well acquainted as they were with the parts around Judea, Gergeres, from which comes the Gergersenes, was an ancient city, now called Tiberias, around which is situated a considerable lake. It continues, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him, etc. Augustine, though Matthew says that there were two, Mark and Luke mention one, that you may understand that one of them was a more illustrious person, concerning whose state that country was much afflicted. Chrysostom, or else Mark and Luke relate what was most worthy of compassion, and for this reason they put down more at length what had happened to this man. For there follows, no man could bind him, no, not with chains. They therefore simply said, a man possessed of a devil, without taking heed to the number, or else that he might show the greater virtue in the worker, for he who had cured one such might cure many others. Nor is there any discrepancy shown here, for they did not say that there was one alone, for then they would have contradicted Matthew. Now devils dwell in tombs, wishing to convey a false opinion to many that the souls of the dead were changed to devils. Gregory of Nyssa. Now the assembly of the devils had prepared itself to resist the divine power. But when he was approaching who had power over all things, they proclaim aloud his eminent virtue. Wherefore there follows, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, saying, etc. Cyril, see how the devil is divided between two passions, fear and audacity. He hangs back and prays, as if meditating a question. He wishes to know what he had to do with Jesus, as though he would say, Do you cast me out from men who are mine? Bede, and how great is the impiety of the Jews to say that he cast out devils by the prince of the devils, when the very devils confess that they have nothing in common with him. Chrysostom, then praying to him, he subjoins, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not, for he considered being cast out to be a torment, or else he was also invisibly tortured. For however bad the devils are, they know that there awaits them at last a punishment for their sins. But that the time of their last punishment was not yet come, they full well know, especially as they were permitted to mix among men. But because Christ had come upon them, as they were doing such dreadful deeds, they thought that, such was the heinousness of their crimes, he would not wait for the last times to punish them. For this reason they beg that they may not be tormented. Bede, for it is a great torment for a devil to cease to hurt a man, and the more severely he possesses him, the more reluctantly he lets him go. For it goes on, for he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Cyril, consider the unconquerable power of Christ. He makes Satan shake, for to him the words of Christ are fire and flame. As the psalmist says, the mountains melted at the presence of the Lord, that is, great and proud powers. 
There follows, and he asked him, What is thy name? Theophylact. The Lord indeed asks, not that he himself required to know, but that the rest might know that there was a multitude of devils dwelling in him. Pseudochrysostom. Lest he should not be believed, if he affirmed there were many, he wishes that they themselves should confess it. Wherefore there follows, and he said unto him, Legion, for we are many. He gives not a fixed number, but a multitude, for such accuracy in the number would not help us to understand it. Bede, and by the public declaration of the scourge which the madman suffered, the virtue of the healer appears more gracious. And even the priests of our time, who know how to cast out devils by the grace of exorcism, are wont to say that the sufferers cannot be cured at all, unless they in confession openly declare, as far as they are able to know, what they have suffered from the unclean spirits, in sight, in hearing, in taste, in touch, or any other sense of body or soul, whether awake or asleep. It goes on, and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Pseudo Chrysostom. Luke, however, says, into the abyss, for the abyss is the separation of this world, for devils deserve to be sent into outer darkness, prepared for the devil and his angels. This Christ might have done, but he allowed them to remain in this world lest the absence of a tempter should deprive men of the crown of victory. Theophylact. Also, that by fighting with us, they may make us more expert. It goes on, Now there was about the mountain a great herd of swine feeding. Augustine. What Mark here says, that the herd was about the mountain, and what Luke calls on the mountain, are by no means inconsistent. For the herd of swine was so large that some part were on the mountain, the rest around it. It goes on, And the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. Rigmigius, The devils entered not into the swine of their own will, but their asking for this concession was that it might be shown that they cannot hurt men without divine permission. They did not ask to be sent into men, because they saw that he by whose power they were tortured bore a human form. Nor did they desire to be sent into the flocks, for they are clean animals offered up in the temple of God. But they desired to be sent into the swine, because no animal is more unclean than a hog, and devils always delight in filthiness. It goes on, and forthwith Jesus gave them leave. Bede. And he gave them leave, that by the killing of the swine the salvation of men might be furthered. Pseudo Chrysostom, he wished to show publicly the fury which devils entertain against men, and that they would inflict much worse things upon men if they were not hindered by divine power, because again his compassion would not allow this to be shown on men. He permitted them to enter into the swine, that on them the fury and power of the devils might be made known. There follows, and the unclean spirits went out. Titus, but the herdsmen also took to flight, lest they should perish with the swine, and spread the same fear amongst the inhabitants of the town. Wherefore there follows, and they that fed them, etc. The necessity of their loss, however, brought these men to the Savior, for frequently when God makes men suffer loss in their possessions, he confers a benefit on their souls. Wherefore it goes on, and they came to Jesus, and see him that was tormented by the devils, etc. That is, at the feet of him from whom he had obtained health. A man whom before, not even in chains, could bind, clothed and in his right mind, though he used to be continually naked, and they were amazed. Wherefore it says, and they were afraid. This miracle, then, they find out, partly by sight, partly by words. Wherefore there follows, and they that saw it told them. Theophylact. But amazed at the miracle which they had heard, they were afraid, and for this reason they beseech him to depart out of their borders, which is expressed in what follows. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts, for they feared, lest some time or other they should suffer a like thing, 
for saddened at the loss of their swine, they reject the presence of the Savior. Bede, or else, conscious of their own frailty, they judge themselves unworthy of the presence of the Lord. It goes on, and when he was going to the ship, he that had been tormented, etc. Theophylact, for he feared lest some time or other the devil should find him and enter into him a second time. But the Lord sends him back to his house, intimating to him that though he himself was not present, yet his power would keep him, at the same time also that he might be of use in the healing of others. Wherefore it goes on, and he did not suffer him, and saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, etc. See the humility of the Savior. He said not, Proclaim all things which I have done to you, but all that the Lord hath done. Do thou also, when thou hast done any good, take it not to thyself, but refer it to God. Chrysostom. But although he bade others whom he healed to tell it to no one, he nevertheless fitly bids this one proclaim it, since all that region, being possessed by devils, remained without God. Theophylact, he therefore began to proclaim it, and all wonder, which is that which follows, and he began to publish. Bede, mystically, however, Gerasa, or Geresi, as some read it, is interpreted casting out a dweller or a stranger approaching, because the people of the Gentiles both expelled the enemy from the heart, and he who was afar off is made near. Pseudo-Jerome. Here again the demoniac is the people of the Gentiles, in a most hopeless case, bound neither by the law of nature, nor of God, nor by human fear. Bede, who dwelt in the tombs, because they delighted in dead works, that is, in sins, who were ever raging night and day, because, whether in prosperity or in adversity, they were never free from the service of malignant spirits. Again, by the foulness of their works, they lay, as it were, in the tombs, in their lofty pride. They wandered over the mountains, by words of most hardened infidelity. They, as it were, cut themselves with stones, but he said, My name is Legion, because the Gentile people were enslaved to diverse, idolatrous forms of worship. Again, that the unclean spirits going out from a man enter into swine, which they cast headlong into the sea, implies that now that the people of the Gentiles are freed from the empire of demons, they who have not chosen to believe in Christ work sacrilegious rites in hidden places. Theophylact or by this it is signified that devils enter into those men who live like swine, rolling themselves in the slough of pleasure. They drive them headlong into the sea, down the precipice of perdition, into the sea of an evil life, where they are choked. Pseudo-Jerome, or they are choked in hell without any touch of mercy by the rushing on of an early death, which evils many persons thus avoid. For by the scourging of the fool, the wise is made more prudent. Bede, but that the Lord did not admit him, though he wished to be with him, signifies that every one, after the remission of his sins, should remember that he must work to obtain a good conscience, and serve the gospel for the salvation of others, that at last he may rest in Christ. Gregory, for when we have perceived ever so little of the divine knowledge, we are at once unwilling to return to human affairs, and seek for the quiet of contemplation. But the Lord commands that the mind should first toil hard at its work, and afterwards should refresh itself with contemplation. Pseudo-Jerome. But the man who was healed preached in Decapolis, where the Jews who hang on the letter of the Decalogue are being turned away from the Roman rule. End of chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 21 through 34. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, 
and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jarius by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. When Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things, of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press, and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. Theophylact. After the miracle of the demoniac, the Lord works another miracle, namely in raising up the daughter of the ruler of the synagogue. The evangelist, before narrating this miracle, says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. Augustine. But we must understand that what is added of the daughter of the ruler of the synagogue took place when Jesus had again crossed the sea in a ship, though how long after does not appear. For if there were not an interval, there could be no time for the taking place of that which Matthew relates, concerning the feast at his own house, after which event nothing follows immediately, except this concerning the daughter of the chief of the synagogue. For he has so put it together that the transition itself shows that the narrative follows the order of time. It goes on, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, etc. Pseudo Chrysostom. He has recorded the name on account of the Jews of that time, that it might mark the miracle. It goes on, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, etc. Matthew indeed relates that the chief of the synagogue reported that his daughter was dead, but Mark says that she was very sick and that afterwards it was told to the ruler of the synagogue, when our Lord was about to go with him, that she was dead. The fact then, which Matthew implies, is the same, namely, that he raised her from the dead. And it is for the sake of brevity that he says that she was dead, which is evident from her being raised. Augustine. But he attaches himself not to the words of the Father, but what is of most importance, his wishes. For he was in such despair that his wish was that she should return to life, not thinking that she could be found alive whom he had left dying. Theophylact. Now this man was faithful in part, inasmuch as he fell at the feet of Jesus, but in that he begged of him to come, he did not show as much faith as he ought. For he ought to have said, Speak the word only, and my daughter shall be healed. There follows, and he went away with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him, and a woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, etc. Chrysostom, this woman who was celebrated and known to all, did not dare to approach the Savior openly, nor to come to him, because according to the law she was unclean. For this reason she touched him behind, and not in front, for that she durst not do, but only ventured to touch the hem of his garment. It was not, however, the hem of the garment, but her frame of mind that made her whole. There follows, for she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Theophylact, Most faithful indeed is this woman, who hoped for healing from his garments. 
for which reason she obtains health. Wherefore it goes on, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed. Pseudo-Chrysostom. Now the virtues of Christ are, by his own will, imparted to those men who touch him by faith. Wherefore there follows, and Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press, and said, Who touched my clothes? The virtues indeed of the Savior do not go out of him locally or corporeally, nor in any respect pass away from him. For being incorporeal, they go forth to others and are given to others. They are not, however, separated from him, from whom they are said to go forth, in the same way as sciences are given by the teacher to his pupils. Therefore it says, Jesus, knowing in himself the virtue which had gone out of him, to show that with his knowledge, and not without his being aware of it, the woman was healed. But he asked, Who touched me? Although he knew her who touched him, that he might bring to light the woman, by her coming forward, and proclaim her faith, lest the virtue of his miraculous work should be consigned to oblivion. It goes on, And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? But the Lord asked, Who touched me? That is, in thought and faith. For the crowds who throng me cannot be said to touch me, for they do not come near to me in thought and in faith. There follows, And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. Theophylact. For the Lord wished to declare the woman, first to give his approbation to her faith, secondly to urge the chief of the synagogue to a confident hope that he could thus cure his child, and also to free the woman from fear. For the woman feared because she had stolen health. Wherefore there follows, but the woman fearing and trembling, etc. Bede. Observe that the object of his question was that the woman should confess the truth of her long want of faith, of her sudden belief in healing, and so herself be confirmed in faith, and afford an example to others. But he said to her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. He said not, Thy faith is about to make thee whole, but has made thee whole, that is, in that thou hast believed, thou hast already been made whole. Chrysostom, he calls her daughter, because she was saved by her faith, for faith in Christ makes us his children. Theophylact, but he said to her, Go in peace, that is, in rest, which means go and have rest, for up to this time thou hast been in pains and torture. Pseudo Chrysostom, or else he says, Go in peace, sending her away into that which is the final good. For God dwells in peace, that thou mayest know that she was not only healed in body, but also from the causes of bodily pain, that is, from her sins. Pseudo Jerome, mystically, however, Jarius comes after the healing of the woman, because when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then shall Israel be saved. Jarius means either illuminating or illuminated, that is, the Jewish people, having cast off the shadow of the letter, enlightened by the spirits and enlightening others, falling at the feet of the word, that is, humbling itself before the incarnation of Christ, prays for her daughter. For when a man lives himself, he makes others live also. Thus Abraham and Moses and Samuel intercede for the people who are dead, and Jesus comes upon their prayers. Bede. Again the Lord, going to the child, who is to be healed, is thronged by the crowd, because though he give healthful advice to the Jewish nation, he is oppressed by the wicked habits of that carnal people. But the woman with an issue of blood, cured by the Lord, is the church gathered together from the nations. For the issue of blood may be either understood of the pollution of idolatry or of those deeds which are accompanied by pleasure to flesh and blood. But whilst the word of the Lord decreed salvation to Judea, the people of the Gentiles, by an assured hope, seized upon the health promised and prepared for others. Theophylact, or else by the woman who had a bloody flux, 
understand human nature, for sin rushed in upon it, which, since it killed the soul, might be said to spill its blood. It could not be cured by many physicians, that is, by the wise men of this world, and of the law and of the prophets. But the moment that it touched the hem of Christ's garment, that is, his flesh, it was healed. For whosoever believes the Son of Man to be incarnate is he who touches the hem of his garment. Bead. Wherefore, one believing woman touches the Lord, whilst the crowd throngs him, because he who is grieved by diverse heresies or by wicked habits is worshipped faithfully with the heart of the Catholic Church alone. But the Church of the Gentiles came behind him, because, though it did not see the Lord present in the flesh, for the mysteries of his incarnation had been gone through, yet it attained to the grace of his faith, and so when by partaking of his sacraments it merited salvation from its sins, as it were, the fountain of its blood was dried up by the touch of his garments. And the Lord looked round about to see her who had done this, because he judges that all who deserve to be saved are worthy of his look and of his pity. Verses 35 through 43. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had pulled them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talathia, Kumai, which is interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Theophylact, those who were about the ruler of the synagogue, thought that Christ was one of the prophets, and for this reason, they thought that they should beg of him to come and pray over the damsel. But because she had already expired, they thought that he ought not to be asked to do so. Therefore it is said, While he yet spake, there came messengers to the ruler of the synagogue, which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master any further? But the Lord himself persuades the father to have confidence. For it goes on, As soon as Jesus heard the word which was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Augustine, it is not said that he assented to his friends who brought the tidings and wished to prevent the master from coming, so that our Lord's saying, Fear not, only believe, is not a rebuke for his want of faith, but was intended to strengthen the belief which he had already. But if the evangelist had related that the ruler of the synagogue joined the friends who came from his house in saying that Jesus should not be troubled, the words which Matthew relates him to have said, namely that the damsel was dead, would then have been contrary to what was in his mind. It goes on, and he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Theophylact, for Christ in his lowliness would not do anything for display. It goes on, and he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. Pseudo Chrysostom, for he himself commands them not to wail, as if the damsel was dead but sleeping. Wherefore it says, And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why makest ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead but sleepeth. Pseudo Jerome, it was told the ruler of the synagogue, Thy daughter is dead. But Jesus said to him, She is not dead, but sleepeth. Both are true, for the meaning is, She is dead to you, but to me she is asleep. Bede. 
For to men she was dead, who were unable to raise her up, but to God she was asleep, in whose purpose both the soul was living and the flesh was resting, to rise again. Whence it became a custom amongst Christians, that the dead, who they doubt not, will rise again, should be said to sleep. It goes on, and they laughed him to scorn. Theophylact, but they laugh at him, as if unable to do anything further, and in this he convicts them, of bearing witness involuntarily, that she was really dead, whom he raised up, and therefore, that it would be a miracle if he raised her. Bede, because they chose rather to laugh at than to believe, in this saying concerning her resurrection, they are deservedly excluded from the place, as unworthy to witness his power in raising her, and the mystery of her rising. Wherefore it goes on, and when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entered in where the damsel was lying. Chrysostom, or else to take away all display, he suffered not all to be with him, that however he might leave behind him witnesses of his divine power. He chose his three chief disciples, and the father and the mother of the damsel, as being necessary above all. And he restores life to the damsel, both by his hand and by word of mouth. Wherefore it says, And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talathia kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. For the hand of Jesus, having a quickening power, quickens the dead body, and his voice raises her as she is lying. Wherefore it follows, and straightway the damsel arose and walked. Jerome. Someone may accuse the evangelist of a falsehood in his explanation, and that he has added, I say unto thee, when in Hebrew, Talathia kumai, only means, damsel arise. But he adds, I say unto thee, arise to express that his meaning was to call and command her. It goes on, for she was of the age of twelve years. Gloss. The evangelist added this, to show that she was of an age to walk. By her walking she is shown to have not only been raised up, but also been perfectly cured. It continues, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Chrysostom. To show that he had raised her really, and not only to the eye of fancy. Bede. Mystically, the woman was cured of a bloody flux, and immediately after the daughter of the ruler of the synagogue is reported to be dead, because as soon as the church of the Gentiles is washed from the stain of vice and called daughter by the merits of her faith, at once the synagogue is broken up on account of its zealous treachery and envy, treachery because it did not choose to believe in Christ, envy because it was vexed at the faith of the church. What the messengers told the ruler of the synagogue, Why troublest thou the master any more, is said by those in this day who, seeing the state of the synagogue, deserted by God, believe that it cannot be restored, and therefore think that we are not able to pray that it should be restored. But if the ruler of the synagogue, that is, the assembly of the teachers of the law, determined to believe, the synagogue also, which is subject to them, will be saved. Further, because the synagogue lost the joy of having Christ to dwell in, as its faithlessness deserved, it lies dead, as it were, amongst persons weeping and wailing. Again, our Lord raised the damsel by taking hold of her hand, because the hands of the Jews, which are full of blood, must first be cleansed, else the synagogue which is dead cannot rise again. But in the woman with the bloody flux, and the raising of the damsel, is shown the salvation of the human race, which was so ordered by the Lord, that first some from Judea, then the fullness of the Gentiles might come in, and so all Israel might be saved. Again the damsel was twelve years old, and the woman had suffered for twelve years, because the sinning of unbelievers was contemporary with the beginning of the faith of believers. Wherefore it is said, Abraham believed on God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Gregory. Morally again, our Redeemer raised the damsel in the house, the young man without the gate, Lazarus in the tomb. He lies dead in the house, whose sin is concealed. He is carried without the gate, whose sin has broken forth into the madness of an open deed. He lies crushed under the mound of the tomb, 
who in the commission of sin lies powerless beneath the weight of habit. Bede. And we may remark that lighter and daily errors may be cured by the remedy of a lighter penance. Wherefore the Lord raises the damsel, lying in the inner chamber, with a very easy cry, saying, Damsel, arise. But that he who had been four days dead might quit the prison of the tomb, he groaned in the spirit, he was troubled, he shed tears. In proportion, then, as the death of the soul presses the more heavily, so much the more ardently must the fervor of the penitent press forward. But this, too, must be observed, that a public crime requires a public reparation. Wherefore Lazarus, when called from the sepulchre, was placed before the eyes of the people. But slight sins require to be washed out by a secret penance. Wherefore the damsel lying in the house is raised up before a few witnesses, and those who are desired to tell no man. The crowd also is cast out before the damsel is raised. For if a crowd of worldly thoughts be not first cast out from the hidden parts of the heart, the soul which lies dead within cannot rise. Well, too, did she arise and walk, for the soul raised from sin ought not only to rise from the filth of its crimes, but also to make advances in good works. And soon it is necessary that it should be filled with heavenly bread, that is, made partaker of divine word and of the altar. End of chapter 5、Chapter、6, 1 through 16. Of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Theophylact, after the miracles which have been related, the Lord returns to his own country. Not that he was ignorant that they would despise him, But that they might have no reason to say, If thou hadst come, we had believed thee. Wherefore it is said, And he went out from thence, and came into his own country. Bede, he means by his country Nazareth, in which he was brought up. But how great the blindness of the Nazarenes! They despise him, who by his words and deeds they might know to be the Christ, solely on account of his kindred. It goes on. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? By wisdom is meant his doctrine, by powers the cures and miracles which he did. It goes on, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Augustine. Matthew indeed says that he was called the son of a carpenter. Nor are we to wonder, since both might have said, for they believed him to be the carpenter, because he was the son of a carpenter. Pseudo Jerome. Jesus is called the son of a workman. Of that one, however, whose work was the morning and the sun, that is, the first and second church, as a figure of which the woman and the damsel are healed. Bede. For although human things are not to be compared with divine, still the type is complete, because the Father of Christ works by fire and spirit. It goes on, the brother of James and Joseph, of Jude and of Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? They bear witness that his sisters and brothers were with him, who nevertheless 
are not to be taken for the sons of Joseph or of Mary, as heretics say, but rather as is usual in Scripture. We must understand them to be his relations, as Abraham and Lot are called brothers. Though Lot was brother's son to Abraham, and they were offended at him, the stumbling and error of the Jews is our salvation and the condemnation of heretics. For so much did they despise the Lord Jesus Christ as to call him a carpenter and the son of a carpenter. It goes on, and Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. Even Moses bears witness that the Lord is called a prophet in the scriptures. For predicting his future incarnation to the sons of Israel, he says, A prophet shall the Lord raise up unto you of your brethren. But not only he himself who is Lord of prophets, but also Elias, Jeremiah, and the remaining lesser prophets, were worse received in their own country than in strange cities. For it is almost natural for men to envy their fellow townsmen, for they do not consider the present works of the man, but they remember the weakness of his infancy. Pseudo Jerome, oftentimes also the origin of a man brings him contempt, as it is written, Who is the son of Jesse? For the Lord hath respect unto the lowly, as to the proud, he beholdeth them afar off. Theophylact, or again, if the prophet has noble relations, his countrymen hate them, and on that account do not honor the prophet. There follows, and he could there do no mighty work, etc. What, however, is here expressed by he could not, we must take to mean he did not choose, because it was not that he was weak, but that they were faithless. He does not therefore work any miracles there, for he spared them, lest they should be worthy of greater blame, if they believe not, even with miracles before their eyes. Or else, for the working of miracles, not only the power of the worker is necessary, but the faith of the recipient, which was wanting in this case. Therefore, Jesus did not choose to work many signs there. There follows, and he marveled at their unbelief. Bede, not as if he who knows all things before they are done wonders at what he did not expect or look forward to, but knowing the hidden things of the heart and wishing to intimate to men that it was wonderful, he openly shows that he wonders. And indeed the blindness of the Jews is wonderful, for they neither believed what their prophets said of Christ, nor would their own persons believe on Christ who was born amongst them. Mystically again, Christ is despised in his own house and country, that is, amongst the people of the Jews, and therefore he worked few miracles there, lest they should become altogether inexcusable. But he performs greater miracles every day amongst the Gentiles, not so much in the healing of their bodies as in the salvation of their souls. Verses 6 through 13. And he went round about the villages teaching, and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two, and give them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, nor bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Theophylact, the Lord not only preached in the cities, but also in villages, that we may learn not to despise little things, nor always to seek for great cities, but to sow the word of the Lord in abandoned and lowly villages. Wherefore it is said that he went round about the villages, teaching. Bede, now our kind and merciful Lord and Master did not grudge his servants and their disciples his own virtues. And as he himself had healed every sickness and every infirmity, so also he gave the same power to his disciples. 
Wherefore it goes on, and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and give them power over unclean spirits. Great is the difference between giving and receiving. Whatsoever he does is done in his own power as Lord. As if they do anything, they confess their own weakness in the power of the Lord, saying, In the name of Jesus, arise and walk. Theophylact. Again he sends the apostles two and two, that they might become more active. For, as says the preacher, two are better than one. But if he had sent more than two, there would not have been sufficient number to allow of their being sent to many villages. Gregory. Further, the Lord sent the disciples to preach two and two, because there are two precepts of charity, namely the love of God and of our neighbor, and charity cannot be less than two. By this, therefore, he implies to us that he who has not charity towards his neighbor ought in no way to take upon himself the office of preaching. There follows, and he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip nor bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. Bede, for such should be the preacher's trust in God that though he takes no thought for supplying his own wants in this present world, yet he should feel most certain that these will not be left unsatisfied, lest while his mind is taken up with temporal things, he should provide less of eternal things to others. Pseudo Chrysostom. The Lord also gives them this command, that they might show by their mode of life how far removed they were from the desire of riches. Theophylact instructing them also by this means not to be fond of receiving gifts in order to that those who saw them proclaim poverty might reconcile to it when they saw that the apostles themselves possessed nothing augustine or else according to matthew the lord immediately subjoined the workman is worthy of his meat which sufficiently proves why he forbade their carrying or possessing such things not because they were not necessary but because he sent them in such a way as to show that they were due to them from the faithful to whom they preached the gospel. From this it is evident that the Lord did not mean by this precept that the evangelists ought to live only on the gifts of those to whom they preached the gospel, else the apostle transgressed this precept when he procured his livelihood by the labor of his own hands. But he meant that he had given them power in virtue, of which they might be assured these things were due to them. It is also often asked how it comes that Matthew and Luke have related that the Lord commanded his disciples not to carry even a staff, whilst Mark says, and he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only. Which question is solved by supposing that the word staff has a meaning in Mark, who says that it ought to be carried, different from that which it bears in Matthew and Luke, who affirm the contrary. For in a concise way, one might say, take none of the necessaries of life with you, nay, not a staff, save a staff only, so that the saying, nay, not a staff, may mean, nay, not the smallest thing, but that which is added, save a staff only, may mean that, through the power received by them from the Lord, of which a rod is the ensign, nothing, even of those things which they do not carry, will be wanting to them. The Lord therefore said both, but because one evangelist has not given both, men suppose that he who has said that the staff, in one sense, should be taken, is contrary to him who again has declared that in another sense it should be left behind. Now, however, that a reason has been given, let no one think so, So also, when Matthew declares that shoes are not to be worn on the journey, he forbids anxiety about them. For the reason why men are anxious about carrying them is that they may not be without them. This is also to be understood of the two coats, that no man should be troubled about having only that with which he is clad, from anxiety lest he should need another, when he could always obtain one from the power given by the Lord. In like manner, Mark, by saying that they are to be shod with sandals or soles, 
warns us that this mode of protecting the feet has a mystical signification, that the foot should neither be covered above nor be naked on the ground, that is, that the gospel should neither be hid nor rest upon earthly comforts, and in that he forbids their possessing or taking with them, or more expressly their wearing, two coats, he bids them walk simply, not with duplicity, but whosoever thinks that the Lord could not in the same discourse say some things figuratively, other things in a literal sense, let him look into his other discourses, and he shall see how rash and ignorant is his judgment. Bede. Again, by the two tunics he seems to me to mean two sets of clothes. Not that in places like Scythia, covered with ice and snow, a man should be content with only one garment, but a coat. I think a suit of clothing is implied, that being clad with one, we should not keep another through anxiety as to what may happen. Pseudo Chrysostom, or else Matthew and Luke neither allow shoes nor staff, which is meant to point out the highest perfection. But Mark bids them take a staff and be shod with sandals, which is spoken by permission. Bede, again allegorically under the figure of a script, is pointed out the burdens of this world. By bread is meant temporal delights. By money in the purse, the hiding of wisdom. Because he who receives the office of a doctor should neither be weighed down by the burden of worldly affairs, nor be made soft by carnal desires, nor hide the talent of the word committed to him under the ease of an inactive body. It goes on, And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place, where he gives a general precept of constancy, that they should look to what is due to the tie of hospitality, adding that it is inconsistent with the preaching of the kingdom of heaven to run about from house to house. Theophylact, that is, lest they should be accused of gluttony in passing from one to the other. It goes on, and whoever shall not receive you, etc., this the Lord commanded them, that they might show that they had walked a long way for their sakes and to no purpose, or because they received nothing from them, not even dust, which they shake off, that it might be a testimony against them, that is, by way of convicting them. Pseudo Chrysostom, or else that it might be a witness of the toil of the way, which they sustained for them, or as if the dust of the sins of the preachers was turned against themselves. It goes on, and they went and preached that men should repent, and they cast out many devils, and anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. Mark alone mentions their anointing with oil. James, however, in his canonical epistle, says a thing similar, for oil both refreshes our labors and gives us light and joy. But again, oil signifies the mercy of the unction of God, the healing of infirmity, and the enlightening of the heart, the whole of which is worked by prayer. Theophylact. It also means the grace of the Holy Ghost, by which we are eased from our labors and receive light and spiritual joy. Bede. Wherefore it is evident from the apostles themselves that it is an ancient custom of the Holy Church that persons possessed or afflicted with any disease whatsoever should be anointed with oil consecrated by priestly blessing. Verses 14 through 16. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Gloss. After the preaching of the disciples of Christ and the working of miracles, the evangelist fitly subjoins an account of the report, which arose amongst the people. Wherefore he says, And King Herod heard of him. Pseudo Chrysostom. This Herod is the son of the first Herod, under whom Joseph had led Jesus into Egypt but Matthew calls him Tetrarch, and Luke mentions him as ruling over one-fourth of his father's kingdom. For the Romans, after the death of his father, divided his kingdom into four parts. But Mark calls him a king, either after the title of his father, or because it was consonant to his own wish. Pseudo-Jerome. 
It goes on, for his name was spread abroad, for it was not right that a candle should be placed under a bushel. And they said, that is, some of the multitude, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show themselves forth in him. Bede. Here we are taught how great was the envy of the Jews, for lo, they believed that John, of whom it was said that he did no miracle, could rise from the dead, and that without the witness of any one. But Jesus approved of God by miracles and signs, whose resurrection angels and apostles, men and women, preached, they chose to believe was carried away by stealth, rather than suppose that he had risen again. And these men, in saying that John was risen from the dead, and that therefore mighty works were wrought in him, had just thoughts of the power of the resurrection. For men, when they shall have risen from the dead, shall have much greater power than they possessed when still weighed down by the weakness of the flesh. There follows, but others said that it is Elias, Theophylact, for John confuted many men when he said, Ye generation of vipers. It goes on, but others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. Pseudochrysostom. It seems to me that this prophet means that one of whom Moses said, God will raise up a prophet unto thee of thy brethren. They were right indeed, but because they feared to say openly, This is the Christ, they used the voice of Moses, veiling their own surmise through the fear of the rulers. There follows, but when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Herod expressly says this in irony. Theophylact, or else Herod, knowing that he, without a cause, had slain John, who was a just man, thought that he had risen from the dead, and had received through his resurrection the power of working miracles. Augustine, but in these words, Luke bears witness to Mark, to this point at least, that others and not Herod said that John had risen. But Luke had represented Herod as hesitating, and has put down his words as if he said, John have I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? We must suppose that after this hesitation, he had confirmed in his own mind what others had said, for he says to his children, as Matthew relates, This is John the Baptist, he has risen from the dead. Or else these words are to be spoken as to indicate that he is still hesitating, particularly as Mark, who had said above, that others had declared that John had risen from the dead. Afterwards, however, is not silent as to Herod's plainly saying, It is John whom I beheaded, he is risen from the dead. Which words also may be spoken in two ways. Either they may be understood as those of a man affirming or doubting. End of chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. Chapter 6, verses 17 through 34. Of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 17 through 29. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man, and an holy, and observed him. And when he had heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in, and danced and pleased Herod, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee, unto half my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king, and asked, saying, I will that thou give me, by and by in a charger, the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes, which sat with him, 
he would not reject her, and immediately the king sent an executioner, and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse, and laid it in a tomb. Theophylact, the evangelist Mark, taking an occasion from what went before, here relates the death of the forerunner, saying, For Herod himself had sent forth, and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodias's sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Bede, ancient history relates, that Philip the son of Herod the Great, under whom the Lord fled unto Egypt, the brother of this Herod, under whom Christ suffered, married Herodias, the daughter of King Eratas. But afterwards, that his father-in-law, after certain disagreements, had arisen with his son-in-law, had taken his daughter away, and, to the grief of her former husband, had given her in marriage to his enemy. Therefore John the Baptist rebukes Herod and Herodias for contracting an unlawful union, and because it was not allowed for a man to marry his brother's wife during his lifetime. Theophylact, the law also commanded a brother to marry his brother's wife, if he died without children. But in this case there was a daughter, which made the marriage criminal. There follows, therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. Bede, for Herodias was afraid, lest Herod should repent at some time, or be reconciled to his brother Philip, and so the unlawful marriage be divorced. It goes on, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and an holy. Gloss, he feared him, I say, because he revered him, for he knew him to be just in his dealings with men, and holy towards God. And he took care that Herodias should not slay him. And when he heard him, he did many things, for he thought that he spake by the Spirit of God, and heard him gladly, because he considered that what he said was profitable. Theophylact, but see how great is the fury of lust. For though Herod had such an awe and fear of John, he forgets it all, that he may minister to his fornication. Rigmigius, for his lustful will drove him to lay hands on a man whom he knew to be just and holy. And by this we may see how a less fault became the cause to him of a greater. As it is said, he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. It goes on, and when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. Bede, the only men whom we read of, as celebrating their birthdays with festive joys, are Herod and Pharaoh, but each with an evil presage, stained his birthday with blood. Herod, however, was so much the greater wickedness, as he slew the holy and guiltless teacher of truth, and that by the wish, and at the instance of a female dancer. For there follows, and when the daughter of the said Herodias came in, and danced, and pleased Herod, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. Theophylact, for during the banquet Satan danced in the person of the damsel, and the wicked oath is completed. For it goes on, and he swore unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto half my kingdom. Bede, his oath does not excuse his murder, for perchance his reason for swearing was that he might find an opportunity for slaying, and if she had demanded the death of his father and mother, he surely would not have granted it. It goes on, and she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Worthy is blood to be asked as the reward of such a deed as dancing. It goes on, and she came in straightway with haste, etc. Theophylact. The malignant woman begs that the head of John be given to her immediately, that is, at once, in that very hour, for she feared lest Herod should repent. There follows, and the king was exceeding sorry. Bede. As is usual with scripture, that the historian should relate events as they were then believed by all. Thus Joseph is called the father of Jesus by Mary herself. 
So now also Herod is said to be exceeding sorry. For so the guests thought, since the hypocrite bore sadness on his face, when he had joy in his heart. And he excuses his wickedness by his oath, that he might be impious under pretense of piety. Wherefore there follows, for his oath's sake, and for their sakes who sat with him, he would not reject her. Theophylact, Herod not being his own master, but full of lust, fulfilled his oath, and slew the just man. It would have been better, however, to break his oath, than to commit so great a sin. Bede, and that again which is added, and for their sakes who sat with him, he wishes to make all partakers in his guilt, that a bloody feast might be set before luxurious and impure guests. Wherefore it goes on, by sending an executioner, he commanded his head to be brought in a charger. Theophylact. Speculator is the name for the public servant commissioned to put men to death. Bede. Now Herod was not ashamed to bring before his guests the head of a murdered man, but we do not read of such an act of madness in Pharaoh. From both examples, however, it is proved to be more useful, often to call to mind the coming day of our death, by fear and by living chastely, than to celebrate the day of our birth with luxury. For man is born in the world to toil, but the elect pass by death out of the world to repose. It goes on, and he beheaded him in prison, etc. Gregory, I cannot, without the greatest wonder, reflect that he who was filled, even in his mother's womb, with the spirit of prophecy, and who was the greatest that had arisen amongst those born of women, is sent into prison by wicked men, is beheaded for the dancing of a girl, and though a man of so great austerity meets his death through such a foul instrument. Are we to suppose that there was something evil in his life to be wiped out by such an ignominious death? When, however, could he commit a sin even in his eating, whose food was only locusts and wild honey? How could he offend in his conversation, who never quitted the wilderness? How is it that Almighty God so despises in this life those whom he had so sublimely chosen before all ages? if it not be for the reason which is plain to the piety of the faithful, that he thus sinks them into the lowest place, because he sees how he is rewarding them in the highest, and outwardly he throws them down amongst things despised, because inwardly he draws them up even to incomprehensible things. Let each then infer from this what they shall suffer, whom he rejects, if he so grieves those whom he loves. Speed. There follows, and when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Josephus relates that John was brought bound into the castle of Macarion, and there slain, and ecclesiastical history says that he was buried in Sebastate, a city of Palestine, once called Samaria. But the beheading of John the Baptist signifies the lessening of that fame by which he was thought to be Christ by the people, as the raising of our Savior on the cross typifies the advance of the faith, and that he himself, who was first looked upon as a prophet by the multitude, was recognized as the Son of God by all the faithful. Wherefore John, who was destined to decrease, was born when the daylight begins to wax short. But the Lord, at the season of the year in which the day begins to lengthen, Theophylact. In a mystical way, however, Herod, whose name means of skin, is the people of the Jews, and the wife to whom he was wedded means vainglory, whose daughter even now encircles the Jews with her dance, namely a false understanding of the scriptures. They indeed beheaded John, that is, the word of prophecy, and hold to him without Christ his head. Pseudo-Jerome. Or else the head of the law, which is Christ, is cut off from his own body, that is, the Jewish people, and is given to a Gentile damsel, that is, the Roman church, and the damsel gives it to her adulterous mother, that is, to the synagogue, who in the end will believe. The body of John is buried, his head is put in a dish. Thus the human letter is covered over, the spirit is honored and received on the altar. 
verses 30 through 34. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were money coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by a ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion towards them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Gloss. The evangelist, after relating the death of John, gives an account of those things which Christ did with his disciples after the death of John, saying, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Pseudo Jerome, for they return to the fountain head whence the streams flow. Those who are sent by God always offer up thanks for those things which they have received. Theophylact, let us also learn when we are sent on any mission not to go far away and not to overstep the bounds of the office committed, but to go often to him who sends us and report all that we have done and taught. For we must not only teach, but act. Bede. Not only do the apostles tell the Lord what they themselves had done and taught, but also his own and John's disciples together tell him what John had suffered during the time that they were occupied in teaching, as Matthew relates. It goes on, and he said to them, Come ye yourselves apart, etc. Augustine. This is said to have taken place after the Passion of John. Therefore, what is first related took place last. For it was by these events that Herod was moved to say, This is John the Baptist, whom I beheaded. Theophylact. Again he goes to a desert place from his humility. But John makes his disciples rest, that men who are set over others may learn that they who labor in any work or in the word deserve rest, and ought not to labor continually. Bede. How arose the necessity for giving rest to his disciples, he shows, when he adds, For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. We may then see how great was the happiness of that time, both from the toil of the teachers and from the diligence of the learners. It goes on, And embarking in a ship, they departed into a desert place privately. The disciples did not enter into the ship alone, but taking up the Lord with them, they went to a desert place, as Matthew shows. Here he tries the faith of the multitude, and by seeking a desert place he would see whether they care to follow him, and they follow him, and that not on horseback, nor in carriages, but laboriously coming on foot, they show how great is their anxiety for their salvation. There follows, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and outwent them. And saying that they outwent them on foot, it is proved that the disciples with the Lord did not reach the other bank of the sea, or of the Jordan, but they went to the nearest places of the same country, where the people of those parts could come to them on foot. Theophylact. So do thou not wait for Christ till he himself call you, but outrun him, and come before him. There follows, and Jesus, when he had come out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion towards them, because they were as sheep having no shepherd. The Pharisees, being ravening wolves, did not feed the sheep, but devoured them, for which reason they gathered themselves to Christ, the true shepherd, who gave them spiritual food, that is, the word of God. Wherefore it goes on, and he began to teach them many things, foreseeing that those who followed him on account of his miracles were tired from the length of the way, he pitied them, and wished to satisfy their wish by teaching them. Bede. Matthew says that he healed their sick, for the real way of pitying the poor is to open to them the way of truth by teaching them, and to take away their bodily pains. Pseudo Jerome. Mystically, however, the Lord took apart those whom he chose, 
that though living amongst evil men, they might not apply their minds to evil things, as Lot in Sodom, Job in the land of Uz, and Obadiah in the house of Ahab. Bede, leaving also Judea, the holy preachers, in the desert of the church, overwhelmed by the burden of the tribulations amongst the Jews, obtained rest by the imparting of the grace of faith to the Gentiles. Pseudo Jerome, little indeed is the rest of the saints here on earth. Long is their labor, but afterwards they are bidden to rest from their labors. But as in the ark of Noah, the animals that were within were sent forth, and they that were without rushed in. So it is in the church. Judas went, the thief came to Christ. But as long as men go back from the faith, the church can have no refuge from grief. For Rachel weeping for her children would not be comforted. Moreover, this world is not the banquet in which the new wine is drunk, when the new song will be sung by men made anew, when this mortal shall have put on immortality. Bede. But when Christ goes to the deserts of the Gentiles, many bands of the faithful, leaving the walls of their cities, that is, their old manner of living, follow him. End of chapter 6, verses 17 through 34. Chapter 6, verses 35 through 56. Of Catina Aurea, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 35 through 44. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a deserted place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred pennyworth of bread to give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and brake the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men. Theophylact, the Lord placing before them first what is most profitable, that is, the food of the word of God, afterwards also gave the multitude food for their bodies, in beginning to relate, which the evangelist says, and when the day was now far spent. His disciples came unto him and said, This is a deserted place. Bede, the time being far spent, points out that it was evening, Wherefore, Luke says, but the day had begun to decline. Theophylact, see now how those who are disciples of Christ grow in love to man, for they pity the multitudes and come to Christ to intercede for them. But the Lord tried them to see whether they would know that his power was great enough to feed them. Wherefore it goes on, he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. Bede. By these words he calls on his apostles to break bread for the people, that they might be able to testify that they had no bread, and thus the greatness of the miracle might become more known. Theophylact, But the disciples thought that he did not know what was necessary for the feeding of so large a multitude, for their answer shows that they were troubled. For it goes on, And they said unto him, Let us go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread, and give them to eat. Augustine. This in the Gospel of John is the answer of Philip, but Mark gives it as the answer of the disciples, wishing it to be understood that Philip made this answer as a mouthpiece of the others, although he might put the plural number for the singular, as is usual. It goes on, and he saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. The other evangelists pass over this being done by the Lord. It goes on, and when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. 
this which was suggested by andrew as we learn from john the other evangelists using the plural for the singular have put into the mouth of the disciples it goes on and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties and we need not be perplexed though luke says they were ordered to sit down by fifties and mark by hundreds and fifties for one has mentioned a part the other the whole mark who mentions the hundreds fills up what the other has left out theophylact we are given to understand that they lay down in parties separate from one another for what is translated by companies is repeated twice over in the greek as though it were by companies and companies it goes on and when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them and the two fishes divided he among them all chrysostom now it was with fitness that he looked up to heaven for the jews when receiving manna in the desert presumed to say of god can he give us bread to prevent this therefore before he performed the miracle he referred to his father what he was about to do theophylact he also looks up to heaven that he may teach us to seek our food from god and not from the devil as they do who unjustly feed on another man's labors by this also he intimated to the crowd that he could not be opposed to god since he called upon god and he gives the bread to his disciples to set before the multitude that by handling the bread they might see that it was an undoubted miracle it goes on and they did all eat and were filled and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments twelve baskets of fragments remained over and above that each of the apostles carrying a basket on his shoulder might recognize the unspeakable wonder of the miracle for it was a proof of overflowing power not only to feed so many men but also to leave such a superabundance of fragments even though moses gave manna yet what was given to each was measured by his necessity and what was over and above was overrun with worms elias also fed the woman but gave her just what was enough for her but jesus being the lord makes his gift with superabundant profusion bead again in a mystical sense the saviour refreshes the hungry crowds at the day's decline because either now that the end of the world approaches or now that the sun of justice has set in death for us we are saved from wasting away in spiritual hunger he calls the apostles to him at the breaking of bread intimating that daily by them our hungry souls are fed that is by their letters and examples by the five loaves are figured the five books of moses by the two fishes the psalms and the prophets theophylact or the two fishes are the discourses of fishermen that is their epistles and gospel bead there are five senses in the outward man which shows that by the five thousand men are meant those who living in the world know how to make a good use of external things gregory the different ranks in which those who ate lie down mark out the diverse churches which make up the one catholic but the jubilee rest is contained in the mystery of the number fifty and fifty must be doubled before it reaches up to a hundred and then the first step is to rest from doing evil that afterwards the soul may rest fully from evil thoughts some lie down in parties of fifty others of a hundred bead again those men lie down on grass and are fed by the food of the lord who have trodden underfoot their concupiscences by continence and apply themselves diligently to hear and fulfill the words of god the saviour however does not create a new sort of food for when he came in the flesh he preached no other things than were predicted but showed how pregnant with mysteries of grace were the writings of the law and the prophets he looks up to heaven that he may teach us that there we must look for grace he breaks and distributes to the disciples that they may place the bread before the multitudes because he has opened the mysteries of prophecy to holy doctors who are to preach them to the whole world 
what is left by the crowd is taken up by the disciples, because the more sacred mysteries which cannot be received by the foolish are not to be passed by with negligence, but are to be inquired into by the perfect. For by the twelve baskets the apostles and the following doctors are typified, externally indeed despised by men, but inwardly full of healthful food. For all know that carrying baskets is a part of the work of slaves. Pseudo Jerome, or in the gathering of the twelve baskets full of fragments, is signified the time when they shall sit on thrones, judging all who are left out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel, when the remnant of Israel shall be saved. Verses 45 through 52. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship, and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And as he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Gloss. The Lord indeed, by the miracle of the loaves, showed that he is the creator of the world. But now by walking on the waves, he proved that he had a body free from the weight of all sin. And by appeasing the winds, and by calming the rage of the waves, he declared himself to be the master of the elements. Wherefore it is said, and straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship, and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. Pseudo Chrysostom. He dismisses indeed the people with his blessing, and with some cures. But he constrained his disciples, because they could not, without pain, separate themselves from him, and that not only on account of the very great affection which they had for him, but also because they were at a loss how he would join them. Bede. But it is with reason that we wonder how Mark says that after the miracle of the loaves, the disciples crossed the Sea of Bethsaida. When Luke relates that the miracle was done in the parts of Bethsaida, unless we understand that Luke means by the desert, which is Bethsaida, not the country immediately around the town, but the desert places belonging to it. But when Mark says that they should go before unto Bethsaida, the town itself is meant. It goes on, and when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Pseudochrysostom. This we must understand of Christ, in that he is man. He does it also to teach us to be constant in prayer. Theophylact. But when he had dismissed the crowd, he goes up to pray, for prayer requires rest and silence. Bede. Not every man, whoever, who goes up into a mountain but he alone who prays well, who seeks God in prayer. But he who prays for riches or worldly honor, or for the death of his enemy, sends up from the lowest depths of his vile prayers to God. John says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. It goes on, And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. Theophylact. Now the Lord permitted his disciples to be in danger, that they might learn patience. Wherefore he did not immediately come to their aid, but allowed them to remain in danger all night, that he might teach them to wait patiently, and not to hope at once for help in tribulations. For there follows, and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea. Pseudochrysostom Holy Scripture reckons four watches in the night, making each division three hours. Wherefore, by the fourth watch, it means that which is after the ninth hour, that is, in the tenth or some following hour. There follows and would have passed them. Augustine. 
but how could they understand this except from his going a different way, wishing to pass them as strangers, for they were so far from recognizing him as to take him for a spirit? For it goes on, and when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. Theophylact, see again how Christ, though he was about to put an end to their dangers, puts them in greater fear. But he immediately reassured them by his voice. For it continues, and immediately he talked with them, and said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Chrysostom, as soon then as they knew him by his voice, their fear left them. Augustine, how then could he wish to pass them, whose fear he so reassures, if it were not that his wish to pass them would wring them from that cry which called for his help? Bede. But Theodorus, who was bishop of Phanara, wrote that the Lord had no bodily weight in his flesh, and walked on the sea without weight. But the Catholic faith declares that he had weight according to the flesh. For Dionysus says, we know not how, without plunging in his feet, which had bodily weight and the gravity of matter, he could walk on the wet and unstable surface. Theophylact. Then by entering into the ship, the Lord restrained the tempest. For it continues, and he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. Great indeed is the miracle of our Lord's walking on the sea. But the tempest and the contrary wind were there as well, to make the miracle greater. For the apostles, not understanding from the miracle of the five loaves the power of Christ, now more fully knew it from the miracle of the sea. Wherefore it goes on, and they were amazed in themselves, for they understood not concerning the loaves. Bede. The disciples indeed, who were still carnal, were amazed at the greatness of his virtue, and could not yet, however, recognize in him the truth of the divine majesty. Wherefore it goes on, for their hearts were hardened, but mystically the toil of the disciples in rowing and the contrary wind mark out the labors of the holy church who amidst the beating waves of the world and the blasts of unclean spirits strives to reach the repose of her celestial country and well as it said that the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land for sometimes the church is afflicted by a pressure from the gentiles so overwhelming that her Redeemer seems to have entirely deserted her. But the Lord sees his own, toiling on the sea, for, lest they faint in tribulations, he strengthens them by the look of his love, and sometimes frees them by a visible assistance. Further, in the fourth watch he came to them as daylight approached. For when man lifts up his mind to the light of guidance from on high, the Lord will be with him, and the dangers of temptations will be laid asleep. Pseudochrysostom, or else the first watch means the time up to the deluge, the second up to Moses, the third up to the coming of the Lord. In the fourth the Lord came and spoke to his disciples. Bede, often then does the love of heaven seem to have deserted the faithful in tribulation, so that it may be thought that Jesus wishes to pass by his disciples, as it were toiling in the sea. And still do heretics suppose that the Lord was a phantom, it did not take upon him real flesh from the virgin. Pseudodrome. And he says to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, because we shall see him as he is. But the wind and the storm ceased when Jesus sat down, that is, reigned in the ship, which is the Catholic Church. Bede. And whatsoever heart also he is present by the grace of his love, there soon all the strivings of vice and the adverse world or of the evil spirits, are kept under and put to rest. Verses 53 through 56. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret, and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him, and ran through that whole region round about, and began to carry about in beds those that were sick, where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered, into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets, and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment, and as many touched him were made whole. Gloss, the evangelist having shown the danger which the disciples had sustained in their passage, and their deliverance from it, 
now shows the place to which they sailed, saying, And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret, and drew to the shore. Theophylact, The Lord remained at the above-mentioned place for some time. Therefore the evangelist subjoins, And when they had come out of the ship, straightway they knew him, that is, the inhabitants of the country. Bede, but they knew him by report, not by his features, or through the greatness of his miracles. Even his person was known to some. See, too, how great was the faith of the men of the land of Gennesaret, so that they were not content with the healing of those who were present, but sent to other towns round about, that all might hasten to the physician. Wherefore there follows, and ran through the whole region round about, and began to carry about in beds those that were sick, where they heard he was. Theophylact, for they did not call him to their houses that he might heal them, but rather the sick themselves were brought to him. Wherefore it also follows, and whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, etc. For the miracle which had been wrought on the woman with the issue of blood had reached the ears of many, and caused in them that great faith by which they were healed. It goes on, and as many as touched him were made whole. Bede, again in a mystical sense, do thou understand by the hem of his garment the slightest of his commandments. For whosoever shall transgress it shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, or else his assumption of our flesh, by which we have come to the word of God, and afterwards shall have the enjoyment of his majesty. Pseudo Jerome. Furthermore, that which is said, and as many as touched him were made whole, shall be fulfilled, when grief and mourning shall pass away. End of chapter 6、7. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 30 Of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 13 Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem, and when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashen hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashen hands? He answered and said unto them, Well has Elias prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curses father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Bede, the people of the land of Gennesaret, Who seemed to be unlearned men, not only come themselves, but also bring their sick to the Lord, that they may but succeed in touching the hem of his garment. But the Pharisees and the scribes, who ought to have been the teachers of the people, run together to the Lord, not to seek for healing, but to move capacious questions. Wherefore it is said, Then there came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, coming from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with common, that is, with unwashen hands, they found fault. Theophylact. For the disciples of the Lord, who were taught only the practice of virtue, 
used to eat in a simple way, without washing their hands. But the Pharisees, wishing to find an occasion of blame against them, took it up. They did not indeed blame them as transgressors of the law, but for transgressing the traditions of the elders. Wherefore it goes on, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. Bede. For taking the spiritual words of the prophets in a carnal sense, they observe by washing the body alone commandments which concerned the chastening of the heart and deeds, saying, Wash you, make you clean. And again, Be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. It is therefore a superstitious human tradition that men who are clean already should wash oftener because they eat bread and that they should not eat on leaving the market without washing. But it is necessary for those who desire to partake of the bread which comes down from heaven often to clean their evil deeds by alms, by tears, and the other fruits of righteousness. It is also necessary for a man to wash thoroughly away the pollutions which he has contracted from the cares of temporal business, by being afterwards intent on good thoughts and works. In vain, however, do the Jews wash their hands and cleanse themselves after the market, so long as they refuse to be washed in the font of the Savior. In vain do they observe the washing of their vessels, who neglect to wash away the filthy sins of their bodies and of their hearts. It goes on, then the scribes and Pharisees asked him, Why walk not thy disciples after the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with common hands? Jerome Wonderful is the folly of the scribes and Pharisees. They accuse the Son of God because he keeps not the traditions and precepts of men. But common is here put for unclean, for the people of the Jews, boasting that they were the portion of God, called those meats common, which all made use of. Pseudo-Jerome, he beats back the vain words of the Pharisees with his arguments, as men drive back dogs with weapons, by interpreting Moses and Isaiah, that we too, by the word of Scripture, may conquer the heretics who oppose us. Wherefore it goes on, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Pseudo Chrysostom, for since they unjustly accuse the disciples not of transgressing the law, but the commands of the elders, he sharply confounds them, calling them hypocrites, as looking with reverence upon what was not worthy of it. He adds, however, the words of Isaiah the prophet, as spoken of them, as though he would say, As those men of whom it is said that they honor God with their lips, whilst their heart is far from me, in vain pretend to observe the dictates of piety, whilst they honor the doctrines of men, so ye also neglect your soul, of which ye should take care, and blame those who live justly. Pseudo Jerome, but pharisaical tradition, as to tables and vessels, is to be cut off and cast away, for they often make the commands of gods yield to the traditions of men. Wherefore it continues, for laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold to the traditions of men, as the washing of pots and cups. Pseudo Chrysostom, Moreover, to convict them of neglecting the reverence due to God for the sake of the tradition of the elders, which was opposed to the Holy Scriptures, he subjoins, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Bede. The sense of the word honor in Scripture is not so much the saluting and paying court to men as almsgiving and bestowing gifts. Honor, says the Apostle, widows who are widows indeed. Pseudo Chrysostom, notwithstanding the existence of such a divine law and the threats against such as break it, ye lightly transgress the commandment of God, observing the traditions of the elders. Wherefore there follows, but ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, understand he will be freed from the observation of the foregoing command. Wherefore it continues, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Theophylact, for the Pharisees wishing to devour the offerings, 
instructed sons, when their parents asked for some of their property, to answer them, What thou hast asked of me is Corban, that is, a gift, and I have already offered it up to the Lord. Thus the parents would not require it, as being offered up to the Lord, and in that way profitable for their own salvation. Thus they deceived the sons into neglecting their parents, whilst they themselves devoured the offerings. With this, therefore, the Lord reproaches them, as transgressing the law of God for the sake of gain. Wherefore it goes on, making the word of God of none effect through your traditions, which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye, transgressing, that is, the commandments of God, that ye may observe the traditions of men. Pseudo Chrysostom. Or else it may be said that the Pharisees taught young persons that if a man offered a gift in expiation of the injury done to his father or mother, he was free from sin, as having given to God the gifts which are owed to a parent. And in saying this, they did not allow parents to be honored. Bede. The passage may, in a few words, have this sense. Every gift which I have to make will go to do you good. For ye compel children, it is meant, to say to their parents, that gift which I was going to offer to God, I expend on feeding you, and does you good. O father and mother, speaking this ironically, thus they would be afraid to accept what had been given into the hands of God, and might prefer a life of poverty to living on consecrated property. Pseudo Jerome. Mystically again, the disciples eating with unwashed hands signifies the future fellowship of the Gentiles with the apostles. The cleansing and washing of the Pharisees is barren, but the fellowship of the apostles, though without washing, has stretched out its branches as far as the sea. Verses 14 through 23. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly? and goeth out to the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defile the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lavishness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and defile the man. Pseudo Chrysostom, the Jews regard and murmur about only the bodily purification of the law. Our Lord wishes to bring in the contrary. Wherefore it is said, And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me every one, and understand that there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of a man, those are they which defile a man, that is, which make him unclean. The things of Christ have relation to the inner man, but those which are of the law are visible and external, to which, as being bodily, the cross of Christ was shortly to put an end. Theophylact, but the intention of the Lord in saying this was to teach men that the observing of meats, which the law commands, should not be taken in a carnal sense, and from this he began to unfold to them the intent of the law. So Chrysostom, Again he subjoins, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. For he had not clearly shown them what those things are which proceed out of a man, and defile a man. And on account of this saying, the apostles thought that the foregoing discourse of the Lord implied some other deep thing. Wherefore there follows, And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. They called it parable, because it was not clear. Theophylact. The Lord begins by chiding them, wherefore there follows, are ye so without understanding also? Bede. 
for that man is a faulty hearer who considers what is obscure to be clear speech, or what is clear to be obscurely spoken. Theophylact, then the Lord shows what was hidden, saying, Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot make him common? Bede, for the Jews boasting themselves to be the portion of God, call common those meats which all men use, as shellfish, hares, and animals of that sort. Not even, however, what is offered to idols is unclean, in as far as it is food and God's creature. It is the invocation of devils which makes it unclean. And he adds the cause of it, saying, Because it entereth not into his heart. The principal seat of the soul, according to Plato, is the brain, but according to Christ it is in the heart. Gloss. It says, therefore, into his heart, that is, into his mind, which is the principal part of his soul, on which his whole life depends. Wherefore it is necessary that according to the state of his heart a man should be called clean or unclean, and thus whatsoever does not reach the soul cannot bring pollution to the man. Meats, therefore, since they do not reach the soul, cannot in their own nature defile a man. But an inordinate use of meats, which proceeds from a want of order in the mind, makes men unclean. But that meats cannot reach the mind, he shows by that which he adds, saying, But into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. This, however, he says, without referring to what remains from the food in the body, for that which is necessary for the nourishment and growth of the body remains. But that which is superfluous goes out, and thus, as it were, purges the nourishment which remains. Augustine, for some things are joined to others in such a way as both to change and to be changed, just as food, losing its former appearance, is both itself turned into our body, and we too are changed, and our strength is refreshed by it. Further, a most subtle liquid, after the food has been prepared and digested in our veins and other arteries by some hidden channels, called from a Greek word, pores, passes through us and goes into the draught. Bead. Thus then, it is not meat that makes men unclean, but wickedness, which works in us the passions which come from within. Wherefore it goes on, and he said, That which cometh out of a man, that defileth a man. Loss. The meaning of which he points out when he subjoins, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. And thus it appears that evil thoughts belong to the mind, which is here called the heart, and according to which a man is called good or bad, clean or unclean. Bede. From this passage are condemned those men who suppose that thoughts are put into them by the devil, and do not arise from their own evil will. The devil may excite and help on evil thoughts. He cannot be their author. Gloss. From evil thoughts, however, evil actions proceed to greater lengths, concerning which it is added adulteries, that is, acts which consist in the violation of another man's bed, fornications, which are unlawful connections between persons not bound by marriage, murders, by which hurt is inflicted on the person of one's neighbor, thefts, by which his goods are taken from him, covetousness, by which things are unjustly kept, wickedness, which consists in calumniating others, deceit in overreaching them, lavaciousness, to which belongs any corruption of mind or body, theophylact, an evil eye, that is, hatred and flattery, for he who hates turns an evil and envious eye on him whom he hates, and a flatterer, looking askance at his neighbor's goods, leads him into evil, blasphemies, that is, faults committed against God, pride, that is, contempt of God, when a man ascribes the good which he does not to God but to his own virtue, foolishness, that is, an injury against one's neighbor. Gloss, or foolishness consists in wrong thoughts concerning God, for it is opposed to wisdom, which is the knowledge of divine things. It goes on, all these evil things come from within and defile the man, for whatsoever is in the power of a man is imputed to him as a fault, 
because all such things proceed from the interior will, by which man is master of his own actions. Verses 24 through 30. And from thence he arose, and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread, and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone, and her daughter laid upon the bed. Theophylact, after the Lord had finished his teaching concerning food, seeing that the Jews were incredulous, he enters into the country of the Gentiles. For the Jews being unfaithful, salvation turns itself to the Gentiles. Wherefore it is said, And from thence he arose, and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. Pseudo Chrysostom. Tyre and Sidon were the places of the Canaanites. Therefore the Lord comes to them, not as to his own, but as to men who had nothing in common with the fathers to whom the promise was made. And therefore he comes in such a way that his coming should not be known to the Tyrenians and Sidonians. Wherefore it continues, and entered into a house, and would have no man know it. For the time had not come for his dwelling with the Gentiles, and bringing them to the faith. For this was not to be, till after his cross and resurrection. Theophylact, or else his reason for coming in secret was that the Jews should not find occasion of blame against him, as if he had passed over to the unclean Gentiles. It goes on, but he could not be hid. Pseudo-Augustine, but if he wished to do so, and could not, it appears as if his will was impotent. It is not possible, however, that our Savior's will should not be fulfilled, nor can he will a thing which he knows ought not to be. Therefore, when a thing has taken place, it may be asserted that he has willed it. But we should observe that this happened amongst the Gentiles, to whom it was not time to preach. Nevertheless, not to receive them when they came to the faith of their own accord would have been to begrudge them the faith. So then it came to pass that the Lord was not made known by his disciples. Others, however, who had seen him entering the house, recognized him, and it began to be known that he was there. His will, therefore, was that he should not be proclaimed by his own disciples, but that others should come to seek him. And so it took place. Bede. Having entered also into the house, he commanded his disciples not to betray who he was to any one in this unknown region, that they on whom he had bestowed the grace of healing might learn by his example, as far as they could, to shrink from the glory of human praise to the showing forth of their miracles. Yet they were not to cease from the pious work of virtue, when either the faith of the good justly deserved that miracles should be done, or the unfaithfulness of the wicked might necessarily compel them. For he himself made known his entry into that place to the Gentile woman, and to whomsoever he would. Pseudo-Augustine. Lastly, the Canaanitish woman came in to him, on hearing of him. If she had not first submitted herself to the God of the Jews, she would not have obtained their benefit. Concerning her, it continues, for a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit, as soon as she had heard of him, came in and fell at his feet. Pseudo Chrysostom. Now by this the Lord wished to show his disciples that he opened the door of faith even to the Gentiles, wherefore also the nation of the woman is described when it is added, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by nation, that is, from Syria of Phoenici. It goes on, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Augustine, 
It appears, however, that some question about a discrepancy may be raised, because it is said that the Lord was in the house when the woman came to her, asking about her daughter. When, however, Matthew says that his disciples had suggested to him, send her away, for she crieth after us, he appears to imply nothing less than that the woman uttered supplicating cries after the Lord as he walked. How then do we infer that she was in the house except by gathering it from Mark, who says that she came in to Jesus, after having before said that he was in the house? But Matthew, in that he says, he answered her not a word, give us to understand that he went out during that silence from the house. Thus, too, the other events are connected together, so that they now in no way disagree. It continues, But he said unto her, Let the children be first filled. Bede. The time will come when even you who are the Gentiles will obtain salvation. But it is right that first the Jews, who deservedly are wont to be called by the name of children of God's ancient election, should be refreshed with heavenly bread, and that so at length the food of life should be ministered to the Gentiles. There follows, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. Pseudochrysostom. These words he uttered not that there is in him a deficiency of virtue to prevent his ministering to all, but because his benefit, if ministered to both Jews and Gentiles who had no communication with each other, might be a cause of jealousy. Theophylact. He calls the Gentiles dogs as being thought wicked by the Jews, and he means by bread the benefit which the Lord promised to the children, that is, to the Jews. The sense, therefore, is that it is not right for the Gentiles first to be partakers of the benefit, promised principally to the Jews. The reason, therefore, why the Lord does not immediately hear, but delays his grace, is that he may also show that the faith of the woman was firm, and that we may learn not at once to grow weary in prayer, but to continue earnest till we obtain. Pseudochrysostom in like manner also to show the Jews that he did not confer healing on foreigners in the same degree as to them, and that by the discovery of the woman's faith, the unfaithfulness of the Jews might be the more laid bare. For the woman did not take it ill, but with much reverence assented to what the Lord had said. Wherefore it goes on, And she answered and said unto him, Truth, Lord, but the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Theophylact as if she had said, The Jews have the whole of that bread which comes down from heaven, and thy benefits also. I ask for the crumbs, that is, a small portion of the benefit. Pseudochrysostom. Replacing herself, therefore, in the rank of dogs, is a mark of her reverence, as if she said, I hold it as a favor to be even in the position of a dog, and to eat not from another table, but from that of the master himself. Theophylact. Because, therefore, the woman answered with much wisdom, she obtained what she wanted. Wherefore there follows, and he said unto her, etc. He said not, My virtue hath made thee whole, but for this saying, that is, for thy faith, which is shown by this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. It goes on, and when she was come into her house, she found her daughter laid upon the bed, and the devil gone out. Bede. On account, then, of the humble and faithful saying of her mother, the devil left the daughter. Here is given a precedent for catechizing and baptizing infants, seeing that by the faith and confession of the parents, infants are freed in baptism from the devil, though they can neither have knowledge in themselves or do either good or evil. Pseudo Jerome. Mystically, however, the Gentile woman who prays for her daughter is our mother of the Church of Rome, her daughter afflicted with the devil is the barbarian western race, which by faith has been turned from a dog into a sheep. She desires to take the crumbs of spiritual understanding, not the unbroken bread of the letter. Theophylact, the soul of each of us also, when he falls into sin, becomes a woman, and this soul has a daughter who is sick, that is, evil actions. This daughter again has a devil, for evil actions arise from devils. Again, sinners are called dogs, being filled with uncleanness. 
for which reason we are not worthy to receive the bread of God, or be made partakers of the immaculate mysteries of God. If, however, in humility, knowing ourselves to be dogs, we confess our sins, then the daughter, that is, our evil life, shall be healed. End of chapter 7, verses 1 through 30. Chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. Of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 31 through 37. And again, departing from the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coasts of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf, and had an impediment of speech. And they besought him to put his hands upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude, and put his fingers into his ears, and spit, and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephrathah, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it and were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear, and the dumb to speak. Theophylact, the Lord did not wish to stay in the parts of the Gentiles, lest he should give the Jews occasion to say that they esteemed him a transgressor of the law, because he held communion with the Gentiles. And therefore he immediately returns, wherefore it is said, and again, departing from the coast of Tyre, he came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, through the midst of the borders of Decapolis. Bede. Decapolis is a region of ten cities across the Jordan to the east, over against Galilee. When therefore it is said that the Lord came to the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the borders of Decapolis, it does not mean that he entered the confines of Decapolis themselves. For he is not said to have crossed the sea, but rather to have come to the borders of the sea, and to have reached quite up to the place which was opposite to the midst of the coast of Decapolis, which were situated at a distance across the sea. It goes on, And they bring him one that was deaf and dumb, and they besought him to lay hands upon him. Theophylact, which is rightly placed after the deliverance of one possessed with a devil, for which an instance of suffering came from the devil. There follows, and he took him aside from the multitude, and put his fingers into his ears. Pseudo Chrysostom, he takes the deaf and dumb man, who was brought to him apart from the crowd, that he might not do his divine miracles openly, teaching us to cast away vainglory and swelling of heart. For no one can work miracles as he can who loves humility and is lowly in his conduct. But he puts his fingers into his ears, when he might have cured him with a word, to show that his body, being united to deity, was consecrated by divine virtue, with all that he did. For since, on account of the transgression of Adam, human nature had incurred much suffering and hurt in its members and senses, Christ, coming into the world, showed the perfection of human nature in himself, and on this account opened ears with his fingers, and gave the power of speech by his spittle. Wherefore it goes on, and spit, and touched his tongue. Theophylact, that he might show that all the members of his sacred body are divine and holy, even the spittle which loosed the string of the tongue. For the spittle is only the superfluous moisture of the body, but in the Lord all things are divine. It goes on, and looking up to heaven, he groaned and saith unto him, Ephrathah, that is, be opened. Bede, he looked up to heaven, that he might teach us that thence is to be procured speech for the dumb, hearing for the deaf, health for all who are sick. And he sighed, not that it was necessary for him to beg anything from his father with groaning, for he together with the father gives all things to them who ask, but that he might give us an example of sighing, when for our errors and those of our neighbors we invoke the guardianship of the divine mercy. Pseudo Chrysostom he at the same time also groaned, as taking our cause upon himself, and pitying human nature, seeing the misery into which it had fallen. Bede, 
But that which he says, Ephratha, that is, be opened, belongs properly to the ears, for the ears are to be opened for hearing, but the tongue to be loosed from the bonds of its impediment, that it may be able to speak. Wherefore it goes on, and straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. Where each nature of one and the same Christ is manifestly distinct, looking up indeed into heaven as man, praying unto God, he groaned, but presently with one word, as being strong in the divine majesty, he healed. It goes on, and he charged them that they should tell no man. Sotokrasostom, by which he has taught us not to boast in our powers, but in the cross and humiliation. He also bade them conceal the miracle, lest he should excite the Jews by envy to kill him before the time. Pseudo Jerome, the city, however, placed on a hill cannot be hid, and loneliness always comes before glory. Wherefore it goes on, but the more he charged them, so much the more, a great deal, they published it. Theophylact, by this we are taught, when we confer benefits on any, by no means to seek for applause and praise, but when we have received benefits, to proclaim and praise our benefactors, even though they be unwilling. Augustine, if, however, he as one who knew the present and the future wills of men, knew that they would proclaim him the more in proportion as he forbade them, why did he give them this command? If it were not that he wished to prove to men who are idle how much more joyfully, with how much greater obedience, they whom he commands to proclaim him should preach, when they who were forbidden could not hold their peace. Gloss. From the preaching, however, of those who were healed by Christ, the wonder of the multitude and their praise of the benefits of Christ increased. Wherefore it goes on, and they were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Pseudo Jerome. Mystically, Tyre is interpreted narrowness and signifies Judea, to which the Lord says, For the bed is grown too narrow and from which he turns himself to the Gentiles. Sidon means hunting, for our race is like an untamed beast, and see which means a wavering inconstancy. Again the Savior comes to save the Gentiles in the midst of the coast of Decapolis, which may be interpreted as the commands of the Decalogue. Further, the human race, throughout its many members, is reckoned as one man, eaten up by varying pestilence. In the first created man, it is blinded, that is, its eye is evil, it becomes deaf when it listens to, and dumb when it speaks evil. And they prayed him to lay his hands upon him, because many just men and patriarchs wished and longed for the time when the Lord should come in the flesh. Bede, or he is deaf and dumb, who neither has ears to hear the words of God, nor opens his mouth to speak them, and such must be presented to the Lord for healing by men who have already learned to hear and speak the divine oracles. So do Jerome. Further, he who obtains healing is always drawn aside from turbulent thoughts, disordered actions, and incoherent speeches. And the fingers which are put into the ears are the words and the gifts of the Holy Ghost, of whom it is said, This is the finger of God. The spittle is heavenly wisdom, which looses the sealed lips of the human race, so that it can say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and the rest of the creed. And looking up to heaven, he groaned, that is, he taught us to groan, and to raise up the treasures of our hearts to the heavens, because by the groaning of heartly compunction, the silly joy of the flesh is purged away. But the ears are open to hymns and songs and psalms, and he looses the tongue, that it may pour forth the good word, which neither threats nor stripes can restrain. End of chapter 7Jesus called his disciples unto him, and saith unto them, 
I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their houses, they will faint by the way. For diverse of them came from afar. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and give thanks and break, and give to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes. And he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about four thousand. And he sent them away. Theophylact. After the Lord had performed the former miracle concerning the multiplication of the loaves, now again a fitting occasion presents itself, and he takes the opportunity of working a similar miracle. Wherefore it is said, In those days the multitude being very great, and having nothing to eat. Jesus called his disciples unto him, and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And he did not always work miracles concerning the feeding of the multitude, lest they should follow him for the sake of food. Now therefore he would not have performed this miracle if he had not seen that the multitude was in danger. Wherefore it goes on, And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. For diverse of them came from afar. Bead. Why they who came from afar hold out for three days, Matthew says more fully, And he went up to a mountain, and sat down there, and great multitudes came unto him, having with them many sick persons, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Theophylact, The disciples did not yet understand, nor did they believe in his virtue, notwithstanding former miracles. Wherefore it continues, And his disciples said unto him, From whence can a man satisfy these men, with bread here in the wilderness. But the Lord himself does not blame them, teaching us that we should not be grievously angry with ignorant men and those who do not understand, but bear with their ignorance. After this it continues, And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they answered, Seven. Rigmigius. Ignorance was not his reason for asking them, but that from their answering seven, the miracle might be noised abroad and become more known in proportion to the smallness of the number. It goes on, and he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. In the former feeding they lay down on grass, in this one on the ground. It continues, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break. In giving thanks he has left us an example, that for all gifts conferred on us from heaven we should return thanks to him. And it is to be remarked that our Lord did not give the bread to the people, but to his disciples, and the disciples to the people. For it goes on, And he gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And not only the bread, but the fish also he blessed, in order to be set before them. For there comes after, and they had a few small fishes. And he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. Bede. In this passage, then, we should notice in one and the same, our Redeemer, a distinct operation of divinity and of manhood. Thus the error of Eutychides, who presumes to lay down the doctrine of one only operation in Christ, is to be cast out far from the Christian pale. For who does not here see that the pity of our Lord for the multitude is the feeling of sympathy and humanity, and that at the same time his satisfying four thousand men with seven loaves and a few fishes is a work of divine virtue. It goes on, and they took up of the broken meat that was left, seven baskets. Theophylact, the multitudes who ate and were filled did not take with them the remains of the loaves, but the disciples took them up, as they did before the baskets, in which we learn, according to the narration, that we should be content with what is sufficient, and not to look for anything beyond. The number of those who ate is put down, when it is said, And they that had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. 
where we may see that Christ sends no one away fasting, for he wishes all to be nourished by his grace. Feed. The typical difference between this feeding and the other of the five loaves and two fishes is that there the letter of the Old Testament, full of spiritual grace, is signified, but here the truth and grace of the New Testament, which is to be ministered to all the faithful, is pointed out. Now the multitude remains three days, waiting for the Lord to heal their sick. As Matthew relates, when the elect, in the faith of the Holy Trinity, supplicate for sins, with persevering earnestness, or because they turn themselves to the Lord in deed, in word, and in thought. Theophylact, or by those who wait for three days, he means the baptized, for baptism is called illumination, and is performed by triune immersion. Gregory, he does not, however, wish to dismiss them fasting, lest they should faint by the way, for it is necessary that men should find in what is preached the word of consolation, lest hungering through want of the food of truth they sink under the toil of this life. Ambrose, the good Lord indeed, whilst he requires diligence, gives strength, nor will he dismiss them fasting, lest they faint by the way, that is, either in the course of this life, or before they have reached the fountainhead of life, that is, the Father, and have learnt that Christ is of the Father, lest haply, after receiving that he is born of a virgin, they begin to esteem his virtue, not that of God, but of a man. Therefore the Lord Jesus divides the food, and his will indeed is to give to all, to deny none. He is the dispenser of all things. But if thou refusest to stretch forth thy hand to receive the food, thou wilt faint by the way, nor canst thou find fault with him who pities and divides. Bede. But they who return to repentance after the crimes of the flesh, after thefts, violence, and murderers, came to the Lord from afar. For in proportion as a man has wandered farther in evil working, so he has wandered farther from Almighty God. The believers amongst the Gentiles came from afar to Christ, but the Jews from near, for they had been taught concerning him by the letter of the law and the prophets. In the former case, however, of the feeding with the five loaves, the multitude lay upon the green grass, here, however, upon the ground, because by the writing of the law we are ordered to keep the desires of the flesh. But in the New Testament we are ordered to leave even the earth itself and our temporal goods. Theophylact. Further, the seven loaves are spiritual discourses, for seven is the number which points out the Holy Ghost, who perfects all things, for our life is perfected in the number of seven days. Pseudo Jerome. Or else the seven loaves are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The fragments of the loaves are the mystical understanding of the first week. Bede. For our Lord's breaking the bread means the opening of mysteries. His giving of thanks shows how great a joy he feels in the salvation of the human race. His giving the loaves to his disciples that they might set them before the people, signifies that he assigns the spiritual gifts of knowledge to the apostles, and that it was his will that by their ministry the food of life should be distributed to the church. So to Jerome, the small fishes blessed are the books of the New Testament, for our Lord, when risen, asks for a piece of broiled fish, or else in these little fishes we receive the saints, seeing that in the scriptures of the New Testament are contained the faith, life, and sufferings of them who snatched away from the troubled waves of this world have given us by their example spiritual refreshment. Bede. Again, what was over and above, after the multitude was refreshed, the apostles take up, because the higher precepts of perfection, to which the multitude cannot attain, belong to those whose life transcends that of the generality of the people of God. Nevertheless, the multitude is said to have been satisfied, because though they cannot leave all that they possess, nor come up to that which is spoken of virgins, yet by listening to the commands of the law of God, they attain to everlasting life. Pseudo Jerome. Again, the seven baskets are the seven churches. By the four thousand is meant the year of the new dispensation, with its four seasons. Fitly also are there four thousand that in the number itself it might be taught us 
that they were filled with the food of the gospel. Theophylact, or there are four thousand, that is, men perfect in the four virtues, and for this reason, as being more advanced, they ate more, and left fewer fragments. For in this miracle seven baskets remain full, but in the miracle of the five loaves twelve. For there are five thousand men, which means men enslaved to the five senses, and for this reason they could not eat, but were satisfied with little, and many of the fragments were over and above. Verses 10 through 21. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples, and came into the parts of Dalmanutha, and the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit, and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall be no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have no bread? And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your hearts yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not. And do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among the four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Theophylact. After our Lord had worked the miracle of the loaves, he immediately retires into another spot. Lest on account of the miracle the multitudes should take him and make him a king. Wherefore it is said, and straightway he entered into the ship with his disciples, and came into the parts of Delmanutha, Augustine. Now in Matthew we read that he entered into the parts of Magdala, but we cannot doubt that it is the same place under another name, for several manuscripts, even of St. Mark, have only Magdala. It goes on, and the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. Bede. The Pharisees then seek a sign from heaven, that he who had for the second time fed many thousands of men with a few loaves of bread should now, after the example of Moses, refresh the whole nation in the last time with manna sent from heaven, and dispersed amongst them all. Theophylact. Or they seek for a sign from heaven, that is, they wish him to make the sun and moon stand still, to bring down hail, and change the atmosphere, for they thought that he could not perform miracles from heaven, but could only in Beelzebub perform a sign on earth. Bede. As related above, he was about to refresh the believing multitude. He gave thanks. So now, on account of the foolish petition of the Pharisees, he groans, because, bearing about with him the feelings of human nature, as he rejoices over the salvation of men, so he grieves over their errors. Wherefore it goes on, and he groaned in spirit, and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, If a sign shall be given to this generation, that is, no sign shall be given, as it is written in the Psalms, I have sworn once by my holiness, if I shall fail David, that is, I will not fail David. Augustine, let no one, however, be perplexed that the answer which Mark says was given to them when they sought a sign from heaven, is not the same as that which Matthew relates, namely, that concerning Jonah. He says that the Lord's answer was that no sign should be given it, by which we must understand such an one as they asked for, that is, one from heaven. But he has omitted to say what Matthew has related. Theophylact. Now the reason why the Lord did not listen to them was that the time of signs from heaven had not arrived, that is, the time of the second advent, when the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and the moon shall not give her light. But in the time of the first advent all things are full of mercy, and such things do not take place. Bede. 
For a sign from heaven was not to be given to a generation of men who tempted the Lord, but to a generation of men seeking the Lord. He shows a sign from heaven when in the sight of the apostles he ascended into heaven. It goes on, and he left them, and entering into a ship again, he departed to the other side. Theophylact, the Lord indeed quits the Pharisees as men uncorrected, for where there is a hope of correction, there is a right to remain. But where the evil is incorrigible, we should go away. There follows, now they had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them, more than one loaf. Bede. Some may ask how they had no bread when they had filled seven baskets just before they embarked in the ship, but scripture relates that they had forgotten to take them with them, which is a proof how little care they had for the flesh and other things, since in their eagerness to follow the Lord, even the necessity of refreshing their bodies had escaped from their mind. Theophylact. By a special providence also, the disciples forgot to take bread, that they might be blamed by Christ, and thus become better, and arrive at a knowledge of Christ's power. For it goes on, and he charged them, saying, Take heed, and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the leaven of Herod. Pseudo-Chrysostom. Matthew says, Of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. Luke, whoever, of the Pharisees only. All three therefore name the Pharisees, as being the most important of them. But Matthew and Mark have mentioned one of the secondary sects, and fitly has Mark added of Herod as a supplement to Matthew's narrative, in which they were left out. But in saying this, he by degrees brings the disciples to understanding and faith. Theophylact, he means by leaven their hurtful and corrupt doctrine, full of the old malice, for the Herodians were the teachers who said that Herod was the Christ. Bede, or the leaven of the Pharisees, is making the decrees of the divine law inferior to the traditions of men, preaching the law in word, attacking it in deed, tempting the Lord and disbelieving his doctrine and his works. But the leaven of Herod is adultery, murder, rash swearing, a pretense of religion, hatred to Christ and his forerunner, Theophylact, but the disciples themselves thought that the Lord spoke of the leaven of bread, Wherefore it goes on, and they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And this they said, as not understanding the power of Christ, who could make bread out of nothing. Wherefore the Lord reproves them, for their follows, and when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Bede, taking occasion then from the precept, which he commanded, saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of Herod, our Savior teaches them what was the meaning of the five and seven loaves, concerning which he adds, And do ye not remember when I break the five loaves amongst five thousand, and how many baskets full of fragments ye took up? For if the leaven mentioned above means perverse traditions, of course the food with which the people of God was nourished means the true doctrine. End of chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. Chapter 8, verses 22 through 38 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 22 through 26. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that he put his hands again upon his eyes, and made him look up, and he was restored, and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his own house, saying, Neither go into the city, nor tell it to any in the town. Gloss. After the feeding of the multitude, the evangelist proceeds to the giving sight to the blind, saying, And they come to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man to him, and besought him to touch him. Bede, knowing that the touch of the Lord could give sight to a blind man, as well as cleanse a leper. It goes on, And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. Theophylact, 
for Bethsaida appears to have been infected with much infidelity. Wherefore the Lord reproaches it. Woe to thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. He then takes out of the town the blind man who had been brought to him, for the faith of those who brought him was not true faith. It goes on, and when he had spit in his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. Pseudocrysostom, he spat indeed and put his hands upon the blind man, because he wished to show that wonderful are the effects of the divine word added to action, for the hand is the symbol of working, but the spittle of the word proceeding out of the mouth. Again, he asked him whether he could see anything, which he had not done in the case of any whom he had healed, thus showing that by the weak faith of those who brought him, and of the blind man himself, his eyes could not altogether be opened. Wherefore there follows, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Because he was still under the influence of unfaithfulness, he said that he saw men obscurely, bead, seeing indeed the shapes of bodies amongst the shadows, but unable to distinguish the outlines of the limbs from the continued darkness of his sight, just as trees standing thick together are wont to appear to men who see them from afar, or by the dim light of the night, so that it cannot easily be known whether they be trees or men. Theophylact, but the reason why he did not see at once perfectly, but in part, was that he had not perfect faith, for healing is bestowed in proportion to faith. Pseudocrysostom. From the commencement, however, of the return of his senses, he leads him to apprehend things by faith, and thus makes him see perfectly. Wherefore it goes on, after that he put his hands again upon his eyes, and he began to see. And afterwards he adds, and he was restored, and saw all things clearly, that is, being perfectly healed in his senses and his intellect. It goes on, and he sent him away to his house, saying, Go into thy home, and if thou enter into the town, tell it not to any one. Theophylact, these precepts he gave him, because they were unfaithful. As has been said, lest perchance he should receive hurt in his soul from them, and they, by their unbelief, should run into a more grievous crime. Bede, or else he leaves an example to his disciples, that they should not seek for popular favor by the miracles which they did. Mystically, however, Bethsaida is interpreted the house of the valley, that is, the world, which is the veil of tears. Again, they bring to the Lord a blind man, that is, one who neither sees what he has been, what he is, nor what he is to be. They ask him to touch him, for what is being touched, but feeling compunction. Bede. For the Lord touches us when he enlightens our minds with the breath of his spirit, and he stirs us up that we may recognize our own infirmity and be diligent in good actions. He takes the hand of the blind man that he may strengthen him to the practice of good works. Pseudo Jerome. And he brings him out of the town, that is, out of the neighborhood of the wicked, and he puts spittle into his eyes that he may see the will of God by the breath of the Holy Spirit and putting his hands upon him, he asked him if he could see, because by the works of the Lord his majesty is seen. Bede, or else putting spittle into the eyes of the blind man, he lays his hands upon him that he may see, because he has wiped away the blindness of the human race, both by invisible gifts and by the sacrament of his assumed humanity. For the spittle proceeding from the head points out the grace of the Holy Ghost. But though by one word he could cure the man wholly, and all at once, still he cures him by degrees, that he may show the greatness of the blindness of man, which can hardly, and only as it were, step by step, be restored to light. And he exhibits to us his grace, by which he furthers each step towards perfection. Again, whoever is weighed down by the blindness of such long continence, that he is unable to distinguish between good and evil, sees, as it were, men like trees walking, because he sees the deeds of the multitude without the light of discretion. Pseudo Jerome, or else he sees men as trees, because he thinks all men higher than himself. But he puts his hands again upon his eyes, 
that he might see all things clearly, that is, understand invisible things by invisible, and with the eye of a pure mind contemplate, what the eye hath not seen, the glorious state of his own soul, after the rust of sin. He sent him to his home, that is, to his heart, that he might see in himself things which he had not seen before. For a man despairing of salvation does not think that he can do at all what, when enlightened, he can easily accomplish. Theophylact, or else after he has healed him, he sends him to his home. For the home of every one of us is heaven and the mansions which are there. Pseudo Jerome, and he says to him, If thou enter into the town, tell it not to any one, that is, relate continually to thy neighbors thy blindness, but never tell them of thy virtue. Verses 27 through 33. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders, and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Theophylact, after taking his disciples afar from the Jews, he then asks them concerning himself, that they might speak the truth without fear of the Jews. Wherefore it is said, And Jesus entered in his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. Bede, Philip was that brother of Herod, of whom we spoke above, who in honor of Tiberius Caesar called that town, which is now called Peneus Caesarea Philippi. It goes on, and by the way he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? So Chrysostom, he asks the question with a purpose, for it was right that his disciples should praise him better than the crowd. Bede, wherefore he first asks, What is the opinion of men, in order to try the faith of the disciples, lest their confession should appear to be founded on the common opinion? It goes on, and they answered, saying, Some say John the Baptist, some Elias, and others one of the prophets. Theophylact, for many thought that John had risen from the dead, as even Herod believed, and that he had performed miracles after his resurrection. After, however, having inquired into the opinion of others, he asked them what was the belief of their own minds on this point. Wherefore it continues, And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Chrysostom. From the manner, however, itself of the question, he leads them to a higher feeling, and to higher thoughts, concerning him, that they might not agree with the multitude. But the next words show what the head of the disciples, the mouth of the apostles, answered. When all were asked, Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. Theophylact. He confesses indeed that he is the Christ announced by the prophets. But the evangelist Mark passes over what the Lord answered to his confession, and how he blessed him, lest by this way of relating it he should seem to be favoring his master Peter. Matthew plainly goes through the whole of it. Origin. Or else Mark and Luke, as they wrote that Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, without adding what is put down in Matthew, the Son of the living God, so they omitted to relate the blessings which was conferred on this confession. It goes on, and he charged them that they should tell no man of him. Theophylact, for he wished in the meantime to hide his glory, lest many should be offended because of him, and so earn a worse punishment. Chrysostom, or else that he might wait to fix the pure faith in their minds till the crucifixion, which was an offense to them, was over for after it was once perfected, about the time of his ascension, he said unto the apostles, Go ye and teach all nations. Theophylact, 
But after the Lord had accepted the confession of the disciples, who called him the true God, he then reveals to them the mystery of the cross. Wherefore it goes on, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders, and of the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, that is, concerning his future passion. But his disciples did not understand the order of the truth, neither could they comprehend his resurrection, but thought it better that he should not suffer. Chrysostom. The reason, however, why the Lord told them this was to show that after his cross and resurrection, Christ must be preached by his witnesses. Again, Peter alone, from the fervor of his disposition, had the boldness to dispute about these things. Wherefore it goes on, and Peter took him up and began to rebuke him. Bede. This, however, he speaks with the feelings of a man who loves and desires, as if he said, This cannot be, neither can mine eyes receive that the Son of God is to be slain. Chrysostom. But how is this, that Peter, gifted with a revelation from the Father, has so soon fallen and become unstable? Surely, however, it was not wonderful that one who had received no revelation concerning the Passion should be ignorant of this. For that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, he had learnt by revelation. But the mystery of his cross and resurrection had not yet been revealed to him. He himself, however, showing that he must come to his Passion, rebuked Peter. Wherefore there follows, and when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, etc. Theophylact. For the Lord, wishing to show that his passion was to take place on account of the salvation of men, and that Satan alone was unwilling that Christ should suffer and the race of man be saved, called Peter Satan, because he savored the things that were of Satan, and from the unwillingness that Christ should suffer became his adversary. For Satan is interpreted the adversary. Pseudochrysostom. But he saith not to the devil when tempting him, Get thee behind me, but to Peter he saith, Get thee behind me, that is, follow me, and resist not the design of my voluntary passion. There follows, For thou savorest not the things which be of God, but which be of men. Theophylact. He says that Peter savors the things which be of men, in that he in some way savored carnal affections. For Peter wished that Christ would spare himself and not be crucified. Verses 34 through 38. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Bede, after showing to his disciples the mystery of his passion and resurrection, he exhorts them, as well as the multitude, to follow the example of his passion. Wherefore it goes, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Chrysostom, as if he would say to Peter, Thou indeed dost rebuke me, who am willing to undergo my passion, but I tell thee that not only is it wrong to prevent me from suffering, but neither canst thou be saved unless thou thyself diest. Again he says, Whosoever wishes to come after me, as if he said, I call you to those good things which a man should wish for. I do not force you to evil and burdensome things, for he who does violence to his hearer often stands in his way, but he who leaves him free rather draws him to himself, and a man denies himself when he cares not for his body, so that, whether it be scourged or whether of like nature it may suffer, he bears it patiently. Theophylact, for a man who denies another, be it brother or father, does not sympathize with him, nor grieve at his fate, though he be wounded and die. 
Thus we ought to despise our body, so that if it should be wounded or hurt in any way, we should not mind its suffering. Chrysostom. But he says not, a man should not spare himself, but what is more, that he should deny himself, as if he had nothing in common with himself, but face danger and look upon such things as if another were suffering, and this is really to spare himself. For parents then most truly act kindly to their children when they give them up to their masters, with an injunction not to spare them. Again, he shows the degree to which a man should deny himself when he says, and take up his cross, by which he means even to the most shameful death. Theophylact, for at that time the cross appeared shameful, because malefactors were fixed to it. Pseudo Jerome, or else as a skillful pilot, foreseeing a storm and a calm, wishes his sailors to be prepared. So also the Lord says, if any one will follow me, etc. Bede, for we deny ourselves when we avoid what we were of old, and strive to reach that point whether we are newly called. And the cross is taken up by us, when either our body is pained by abstinence, or our soul afflicted by fellow feeling for our neighbor. Theophylact, but because after the cross we must have a new strength, he adds and follow me. Chrysostom, and this he says, because it may happen that a man may suffer and yet not follow Christ, that is, when he does not suffer for Christ's sake, for he follows Christ who walks after him and conforms himself to his death, despising those principalities and powers under whose power before the coming of Christ he committed sin. Then there follows, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. I give you these commands, as it were, to spare you. For whosoever spares his son brings him to destruction, but whosoever does not spare him saves him. It is therefore right to be always prepared for death. For if in the battles of this world he who is prepared for death fights better than others, though none can restore him to life after death, much more is this the case in spiritual battle when so great a hope of resurrection is set before him, since he who gives up his soul unto death saves it. Rigmigius, and life is to be taken in this place for the present life, and not for the substance itself of the soul. Chrysostom, as therefore he had said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, lest anyone should suppose this loss to be equivalent to that salvation, he adds, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, etc.? As if he said, Think not that he has saved his soul, who has shunned the perils of the cross. For when a man at the cost of his soul, that is, his life, gains the whole world, what has he besides, now that his soul is perishing? Has he another soul to give for his soul? For a man can give the price of his house in exchange for the house, but in losing his soul he has not another soul to give. And it is with the purpose that he says, Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For God, in exchange for our salvation, has given the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bede, or else he says this, because in time of persecution our life is to be laid aside, but in time of peace our earthly desires are to be broken, which he implies when he says, For what shall it profit a man, etc.? but we are often hindered by a habit of shamefacedness from expressing with our voice the rectitude which we preserve in our hearts. And therefore it is added, for whosoever shall confess me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, him also shall the Son of Man confess when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Theophylact, for that faith which only remains in the mind is not sufficient, but the Lord requires also the confession of the mouth. For when the soul is sanctified by faith, the body ought also to be sanctified by confession. Pseudo Chrysostom, he then who has learned this is bound zealously to confess Christ without shame. And this generation is called adulterous because it has left God the true bridegroom of the soul and has refused to follow the doctrine of Christ, but has prostrated itself to the devil and taken up the seeds of impiety for which reason also it is called sinful. 
Whosoever, therefore, amongst them has denied the kingdom of Christ and the words of God revealed in the gospel shall receive a reward befitting his impiety when he hears in the second advent, I know you not. Theophylact. Him then who shall have confessed that his God was crucified, Christ himself also shall confess, not here, where he is esteemed poor and wretched, but in his glory and with a multitude of angels. Gregory, there are, however, some who confess Christ because they see that all men are Christians. For if the name of Christ were not at this day in such great glory, the Holy Church would not have so many professors. The voice of profession, therefore, is not sufficient for a trial of faith, whilst the profession of the generality defends it from shame. In the time of peace, therefore, there is another way, by which we may be known to ourselves. We are ever fearful of being despised by our neighbors. We think it shame to bear injurious words, if perchance we have quarreled with our neighbor. We blush to be the first to give satisfaction, for our carnal heart, in seeking the glory of this life, disdains humility. Theophylact, but because he had spoken of his glory, in order to show that his promises were not vain, he subjoins, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here who shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. As if he said, Some, that is, Peter, James, and John shall not taste of death, until I show them in my transfiguration with what glory I am to come in my second advent. For the transfiguration was nothing else but an announcement of the second coming of Christ, in which also Christ himself and the saints will shine. Bede. Truly it was done with a loving foresight, in order that they, having tasted for a brief moment the contemplation of everlasting joy, might with the greater strength bear up under adversity. Chrysostom. And he did not declare the names of those who were about to go up, lest the other disciples should feel some touch of human frailty. And he tells it to them beforehand, that they might come with minds better prepared to be taught all that concerned the vision. Bede. Or else the present church is called the kingdom of God, and some of the disciples were to live in the body until they should see the church built up and raised against the glory of the world. For it was right to make some promises concerning this life to the disciples who were uninstructed, that they might be built up with greater strength for the time to come. So to Chrysostom, but in a mystical sense, Christ is life, and the devil is death, and he tastes of death who dwells in sin. Even now every one, according as he has good or evil doctrines, tastes the bread either of life or of death. And indeed, it is a less evil to see death, a greater to taste of it, still worse to follow it, worst of all to be subject to it. End of chapter 8、nine, 13. Catina Aria, Gospel of Saint Mark, by Saint Thomas Aquinas. Chapter Nine, Verses One Through Thirteen, of Catina Aria, Gospel of Saint Mark, by Saint Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine, Verses One Through Eight. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there should be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can whiten them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. Pseudo Jerome. After the consummation of the cross, the glory of the resurrection is shown, and they who were to see with their own eyes the glory of the resurrection to come might not fear the shame of the cross, 
wherefore it is said, And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and led them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Chrysostom. Luke in saying, After eight days, does not contradict this, for he reckoned in both the day on which Christ had spoken, what goes before, and the day on which he took them up. And the reason that he took them up after six days was that they might be filled with a more eager desire during the space of these days, and with a watchful and anxious mind attend to what they saw. Theophylact, and he takes with him the three chiefs of the apostles, Peter as confessing and loving him, John as the beloved one, James as being sublime in speech and as a divine. For so displeasing was he to the Jews, that Herod wishing to please the Jews slew him. Pseudo Chrysostom, he does not, however, show his glory in a house, but he takes them up into a high mountain, for the loftiness of the mountain was adapted to showing forth the loftiness of his glory. Theophylact, and he took them apart, because he was about to reveal mysteries to them. We must also understand, by transfiguration, not the chains of his features, but that whilst his features remained as before, there was added unto him a certain ineffable brightness. Pseudo Chrysostom. It is not therefore fitting that in the kingdom of God any change of feature should take place, either in the Savior himself or in those who are to be made like unto him, but only an addition of brightness. Bede. Our Savior then, when transfigured, did not lose the substance of real flesh, but showed forth the glory of his own, or our future resurrection. For such as he then appeared to the apostles, he will after the adjudgment appear to all his elect. It goes on, and his raiment became shining. Gregory, because in the height of the brightness of heaven above, they who shine in righteousness of life will cling to him. For by the name of garments, he means the just whom he joins to himself. There follows, and there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Chrysostom, he brings Moses and Elias before them, first indeed because the multitude said that Christ was Elias and one of the prophets. He shows himself to the apostles with them, that they might see the difference between the Lord and his servants. And again, because the Jews accused Christ of transgressing the law and thought him a blasphemer, as if he arrogated to himself the glory of his Father, he brought before them those who shone conspicuous in both ways. For Moses gave the law, and Elias was zealous for the glory of God, for which reason neither would have stood near him, if he had been opposed to God and to his law, and that they might know that he holds the power of life and of death, he brings before them both Moses who was dead and Elias who had not yet suffered death. Furthermore, he signified by this that the doctrine of the prophets was the schoolmaster to the doctrine of Christ. He also signified the junction of the New and Old Testament, and that the apostles shall be joined in the resurrection with the prophets, and both together shall go forth to meet their common king. It goes on, And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Bede. If the transfigured humanity of Christ, and the society of but two saints, seen for a moment, could confer delight to such a degree that Peter would, even by serving them, stay their departure, how great a happiness will it be to enjoy the vision of deity amidst choirs of angels forever? It goes on, for he wist not what to say. Although, however, Peter from the stupor of human frailty knew not what to say, still he gives a proof of the feelings which were within him. For the cause of his not knowing what to say was his forgetting that the kingdom was promised to the saints by the Lord, not in any earthly vision, but in heaven. He did not remember that he and his fellow apostles were still hemmed in by mortal flesh, and could not bear the state of a mortal life, to which his soul had already carried him away, because in our Father's house in heaven a house made with hands is not needed. 
But again, even up to this time, he is pointed at as an ignorant man who wishes to make three tabernacles for the law, the prophets, and the gospel, since they in no way can be separated from each other. Chrysostom. Again, Peter neither comprehended that the Lord worked his transfiguration for the showing forth of his true glory, nor that he did this in order to teach men, nor that it was impossible for them to leave the multitude and dwell on the mountain. It goes on, for they were sore afraid. But this fear of theirs was one by which they were raised from their usual state of mind to one higher, and they recognized that those who appeared to them were Moses and Elias. The soul also was drawn on to a state of heavenly feeling, as though carried away from human sense by the heavenly vision. Theophylact, or else Peter fearing to come down from the mount, because he had now a presentiment that Christ must be crucified, said, It is good for us to be here, and not to go down there, that is, in the midst of the Jews. But if they who are furious against thee come hither, we have Moses, who beat down the Egyptians. We have also Elias, who brought fire down from heaven, and destroyed the five hundred. Origen. Mark says in his own person, for he wist not what to say. Where it is matter for consideration, whether perchance Peter spoke this in the confusion of his mind, by the motion of a spirit not his own, whether perchance that spirit himself who wished, as far as in him lay, to be a stumbling block to Christ, so that he might shrink from that passion, which was the saving of all men, did not here work as a seducer, and wish under the color of good to prevent Christ from condescending to men, from coming to them and taking death upon himself for their sakes. Bede, now because Peter sought for a material tabernacle, he was covered with the shadow of the cloud, that he might learn that in the resurrection they are to be protected, not by the covering of houses, but by the glory of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore it goes on, there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and the reason why they obtained no answer from the Lord was that they asked unadvisedly. But the Father answered for the Son, wherefore there follows, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Chrysostom. The voice proceeded from a cloud in which God is wont to appear, that they might believe that the voice was sent forth from God. But in that he says, This is my beloved Son, he declares that the will of the Father and the Son is one, and that, save in that he is the Son, he is in all things one with him who begot him. Bede. He then, whose preaching as Moses foretold, every soul that wished to be saved, should hear when he came in the flesh, he now come in the flesh is proclaimed by God, the Father to the disciples, as the one whom they were to hear. There follows, and suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. For as soon as the Son was proclaimed, that once the servants disappeared, lest the voice of the Father should seem to have been sent forth to them. Theophylact, again mystically after the end of this world, which was made in six days, Jesus will take us up, if we be his disciples, into an high mountain, that is, into heaven, where we shall see his exceeding glory. Bede, and by the garments of the Lord are meant his saints, who will shine with a new whiteness. By the fuller we must understand him to whom the psalmist says, Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For he cannot give to his faithful ones upon the earth that glory which remains laid up for them in heaven. Rigmigius or else by the fuller are meant holy preachers and purifiers of the soul, none of whom in this life can so live as not to be stained with some spots of sin. But in the coming resurrection all the saints shall be purged from every stain of sin. Therefore the Lord will make them such as neither they themselves, by taking vengeance on their own members, nor any preacher by his example and doctrine can make. Chrysostom or else white garments are the writings of evangelists and apostles, the like to which no interpreter can frame. Origen, or else fullers upon earth may be, by a mortal interpretation, 
considered to be the wise of this world, who were thought to adorn even their foul understandings and doctrines with a false whitening drawn from their own minds. But their skill as fullers could not produce anything like a discourse which shows forth the brightness of spiritual conceptions in the unpolished words of Scripture, which by many are despised. Bede, Moses and Elias, of whom one, as we read, died, the other was carried away to heaven, signify the coming glory of all the saints, that is, of all who in the judgment time are either to be found alive in the flesh or to be raised up from that death of which they tasted, and who are all equally to reign with him, Theophylact, or else it means that we are to see in glory both the law and the prophets speaking with him, that is, we shall then find that all those things which were spoken of him by Moses and the other prophets agree with the reality. Then, too, we shall hear the voice of the Father, revealing to us the Son of the Father, and saying, This is my beloved Son. And the cloud, that is, the Holy Ghost, the fount of truth, will overshadow us. Bede. And we must observe that, as when the Lord was baptized in Jordan, so on the mountain covered with brightness, the whole mystery of the Holy Trinity is declared, because we shall see in the resurrection that glory of the Trinity which we believers confess in baptism, and shall praise it all together. Nor is it without reason that the Holy Ghost appeared here in a bright cloud, there in the form of a dove, because he who now with a simple heart keeps the faith which he hath embraced shall then contemplate what he had believed with the brightness of open vision. But when the voice had been heard over the sun, he was found himself alone, because when he shall have manifested himself to his elect, God shall be all in all, yea, Christ with his own, as the head with the body shall shine through all things. Verses 9 through 13. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were raised from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things. But how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things, and be said at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. Origin After the showing of the mystery on the mount, the Lord commanded his disciples, as they were coming down from the mount, not to reveal his transfiguration before the glory of his passion and resurrection. Wherefore it is said, And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Chrysostom, where he not only orders them to be silent, but mentioning his passion, he implies the cause why they were to be silent. Theophylact, which he did lest men should be offended, hearing such glorious things of him whom they were about to see crucified. It was not therefore fitting to say such things of Christ before he suffered, but after his resurrection they were likely to be believed. So Chrysostom, but they, being ignorant of the mystery of the resurrection, took hold of that saying, and disputed one with another. Wherefore there follows, and they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. Pseudo Jerome, this which is particular to Mark means that when death shall have been swallowed up in victory, we shall have no memory for the former things. It goes on, and they asked him, saying, why say the scribes that Elias must first come? Chrysostom, the design of the disciples in asking this question seems to me to be this. We indeed have seen Elias with thee, and have seen thee before seeing Elias. But the scribes say that Elias cometh first. We therefore believe that they have lied. Bede, or thus, the disciples thought that the charge which they had seen in him in the mount was his transformation to glory. And they say, If thou hast already come in glory, wherefore doth not thy forerunner appear, chiefly because they had seen Elias go away? Chrysostom. 
But what Christ answered to this is seen by what follows. And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things, in which he shows that Elias will come before his second advent. For the scriptures declare two advents of Christ, namely one which has taken place, and another which is to come. But the Lord asserts that Elias is the forerunner of the second advent. Bede. Again, he will restore all things. That is, to say, those things which Malachi points out, saying, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. He will yield up also to death that debt, which by his prolonged life he has delayed to render. Theophylact. Now the Lord puts this forward to oppose the notion of the Pharisees, who held that Elias was the forerunner of the first advent, showing that it led them to a false conclusion. Wherefore he subjoins, And how is it written of the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things, and be set at naught? As if he had said, When Elias the Tishbite cometh, he will pacify the Jews, and will bring them to the faith, and thus be the forerunner of the second advent. If then Elias is the forerunner of the first advent, how is it written that the Son of Man must suffer? One of these two things therefore will follow, either that Elias is not the forerunner of the first advent, and thus the scripture will be true, or that he is the forerunner of the first advent, and then the scriptures will not be true, which say that Christ must suffer, for Elias must restore all things, in which case there will not be an unbelieving Jew, but all whosoever hear him must believe on his preaching. Bede, or this, how is it written, that is, in the same way as the prophets have written many things in various places concerning the passion of Christ, Elias also, when he comes, is to suffer many things, and to be despised by the wicked. Chrysostom. Now as the Lord asserted that Elias was to be the forerunner of the second advent, so consequently he asserted that John was the forerunner of the first. Wherefore he subjoins, But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come. Gloss. He calls John Elias, not because he was Elias in person, but because he fulfilled the ministry of Elias. For as the latter will be the forerunner of the second advent, so the former has been that of the first. Theophylact. For again John rebuked vice, and was a zealous man and a hermit like Elias. But they heard him not, as they will hear Elias, but killed him in wicked sport, and cut off his head. Wherefore there follows, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. Pseudo Chrysostom. Or else the disciples asked Jesus how it was written that the Son of Man must suffer. Now in answer to this, he says, As John came in the likeness of Elias, and they evil entreated him, so according to the scriptures must the Son of Man suffer. End of chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. Chapter 9 Verses 14 through 29 of Catina Aria, Gospel of St. Mark, by St. Thomas Aquinas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Verses 14 through 29. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples, that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground, and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire, and into the waters, to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us, and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. 
And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou deaf and dumb spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Theophylact, after he had shown his glory in the mount to the three disciples, he returns to the other disciples, who had not come up with him into the mount. Wherefore it is said, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. For the scribes, catching the opportunity of the hour, when Christ was not present, came up to them to try to draw them over to themselves. Pseudo Jerome, but there is no peace for man under the sun. Envy is ever slaying the little ones, and lightnings strike the tops of the great mountains. Of all those who run to the church, some as the multitudes come in faith to learn, others as the scribes with envy and pride. It goes on, and straightway all the people, when they beheld Jesus, were greatly amazed and feared. Bede, in all cases the difference between the mind of the scribes and of the people ought to be observed. For the scribes are never said to have shown any devotion, faith, humility, and reverence. But as soon as the Lord was come, the whole multitude was greatly amazed and feared, and ran up to him and saluted him. Wherefore there follows, and running to him, saluted him. Theophylact, for the multitude was glad to see him, so that they saluted him from afar, as he was coming to them. But some supposed that his countenance had become more beautiful from his transfiguration, and that this induced the crowd to salute him. Pseudo Jerome, now it was the people and not the disciples who on seeing him were amazed and feared, for there is no fear in love. Fear belongs to servants, amazement to fools. It goes on, and he asked them, What question ye with them? Why does the Lord put this question? What confession may produce salvation? And the murmuring of our hearts may be appeased by religious words. Bede, the question indeed which was raised may, if I am not deceived, have been this. Wherefore they, who were the disciples of the Savior, were unable to heal the demoniac, who was placed in the midst, which may be gathered from the following words. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And whithersoever he take him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. Chrysostom, the scriptures declare that this man was weak in faith. For Christ says, O faithless generation, and he adds, If thou canst believe. But although his want of faith was the cause of their not casting out the devil, he nevertheless accuses the disciples. Wherefore it is added, And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. But they could not. Now observe his folly. In praying to Jesus in the midst of the crowd, he accuses the disciples. Wherefore the Lord before the multitude so much the more accuses him. Not only aims the accusation at himself, but also extends it to all the Jews. For it is probable that many of those present had been offended, and had held wrong thoughts concerning his disciples. Wherefore there follows, he answereth them, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? By which he showed both that he desired death, and that it was a burden to him to converse with them. Bede. So far, however, is he from being angry with the person, though he reproved the sin, that he immediately added, Bring him unto me, and they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Chrysostom. But this the Lord permitted for the sake of the father of the boy, that when he saw the devil vexing his child, he might be brought on to believe that the miracle was to be wrought. Theophylact, he also permits the child to be vexed, that in this way we might know the devil's wickedness, who would have killed him, 
had he not been assisted by the Lord. It goes on, and he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it cast him into the fire, and into the waters to destroy him. Bead. Let Julian blush, who dares to say that all men are born in the flesh, without the infection of sin, as though they were innocent in all respects, just as Adam was when he was created. For what was there in the boy that he should be troubled from infancy with the cruel devil, if he were not held at all by the chain of the original sin, since it is evident that he could not yet have had any sin of his own? Gloss. Now he expresses in the words of his petition his want of faith, for that is the reason why he adds, But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us, and help us. For in that he says, If thou canst do anything, he shows that he doubts his power, because he had seen that the disciples of Christ had failed in curing him. But he says, Have compassion on us, to show the misery of the Son who suffered, and the Father who suffered with him. It goes on, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So to Jerome, this saying, If thou canst, is a proof of the freedom of the will. Again, all things are possible to him that believeth, which evidently means all those things which are prayed for with tears in the name of Jesus, that is, of salvation. Bead, the answer of the Lord was suited to the petition, for the man said, If thou canst do anything, help us. And to this the Lord answered, If thou canst believe. On the other hand, the leper who cried out with faith, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, received an answer according to his faith. I will, be thou clean. Chrysostom. His meaning is, Such a plenitude of virtue is there in me, that not only can I do this, but I will make others to have that power. Wherefore, if thou canst believe as thou oughtest to do, thou shalt be able to cure not only him, but many more. In this way, then, he endeavored to bring back to the faith the man who as yet speaks unfaithfully. There follows, and straightway the father of the child cried out, and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. But if he had already believed, saying, I believe, how is it that he adds, Help thou mine unbelief. We must say then that faith is manifold, that one sort of faith is elementary, another perfect. But this man, being but a beginner in believing, prayed the Savior to add to his virtue what was wanting. Bede. For no man at once reaches to the highest point, but in holy living a man begins with the least things that he may reach the great. For the beginning of virtue is different from the progress and the perfection of it because then faith mounts up through the secret inspiration of grace, by the steps of its own merits. He who had not yet believed perfectly was at once a believer and an unbeliever. So to Jerome, by this also we are taught that our faith is tottering, if it lean not on the stay of the help of God. But faith by its tears receives the accomplishment of its wishes. Wherefore it continues, when Jesus saw that the multitude came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. Theophylact. The reason that he rebuked the foul spirit when he saw the crowd running together was that he did not wish to cure him before the multitude, that he might give us a lesson to avoid ostentation. Pseudo Chrysostom. And his rebuking him and saying, I charge thee, is a proof of divine power. Again, in that he says not only come out of him, but also enter no more into him, he shows that the evil spirit was ready to enter again, because the man was weak in faith, but was prevented by the command of the Lord. It goes on, and the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. For the devil was not able to inflict death upon him, because the true life was come. Bede. But him whom the unholy spirit made like unto death, the holy Savior saved by the touch of his holy hand. Wherefore it goes on, but Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. 
Thus, as the Lord had shown himself to be very God by the power of healing, so he showed that he had the very nature of our flesh by the manner of his human touch. The Manichaean indeed madly denies that he was truly clothed in flesh. He himself, however, by raising, cleansing, enlightening so many afflicted persons by his touch, condemned his heresy before its birth. It goes on, and when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? Chrysostom. They feared that perchance they had lost the grace conferred upon them, for they had already received power over unclean spirits. It goes on, and he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Theophylact. That is, the whole class of lunatics, or simply of all persons possessed with devils, both the man to be cured and he who cures him should fast. For a real prayer is offered up, when fasting is joined with prayer, when he who prays is sober and not heavy with food. Bede. Again, in a mystical sense, on high the Lord unfolds the mysteries of the kingdom to his disciples, but below he rebukes the multitude for their sins of unfaithfulness and expels devils from those who are vexed by them. Those who are still carnal and foolish, he strengthens, teaches, punishes, whilst he more freely instructs the perfect concerning the things of eternity. Theophylact. Again, this devil is deaf and dumb. Deaf because he does not choose to hear the words of God. Dumb because he is unable to teach others their duty. Pseudo-Jerome. Again, a sinner foameth forth folly, gnashes with anger, pineth away in sloth, but the evil spirit tears him when coming to salvation, and in like manner those whom he would drag into his maw he tears asunder by terrors and losses, as he did Job. Bede, for oftentimes when we try to turn to God after sin, our old enemy attacks us with new and greater snares, which he does either to instill into us a hatred of virtue or to avenge the injury of his expulsion. Gregory, but he who is freed from the power of the evil spirit is thought to be dead. For whosoever has already subdued earthly desires puts to death within himself his carnal mode of life, and appears to the world as a dead man, and many look upon him as dead. For they who know not how to live after the spirit think that he who does not follow after carnal pleasures is altogether dead. Pseudo Jerome, Further, in his being vexed from his infancy, the Gentile people is signified, from the very birth of whom the vain worship of idols arose, so that they in their folly sacrificed their children to devils, and for this reason it is said that it cast him into the fire and into the water. For some of the Gentiles worshipped fire, others water, bead, or by this demoniac are signified those who are bound by the guilt of original sin, and coming into the world as criminals, are to be saved by grace, and by fire is meant the heat of anger, by water the pleasures of the flesh, which melt the soul by their sweetness. But he did not rebuke the boy who suffered violence, but the devil who inflicted it, because he who desires to amend a sinner ought, whilst he exterminates his vice by rebuking and cursing it, to love and cherish the man. Pseudo Jerome. Again the Lord applies to the evil spirit what he had inflicted on the man, calling him deaf and dumb spirit, because he never will hear and speak what the penitent sinner can speak and hear. But the devil quitting a man never returns, if the man keep his heart with the keys of humility and charity, and hold possession of the gate of freedom. The man who was healed became as one dead, for it is said to those who are healed, Ye are not dead, but your life is hid with Christ in God. Theophylact. Again, when Jesus, that is, the word of the gospel, takes hold of the hand, that is, of our powers of action, then shall we be freed from the devil, and observe that God first helps us, then it is required of us that we do good, for which reason it is said that Jesus raised him, in which is shown the aid of God, and that he arose, in which is declared the zeal of man. Bede. Further, our Lord, while teaching the apostles how the worst devil is to be expelled, gives all of us rules for our life. That is, he would have us know that all the more grievous attacks of evil spirits or of men are to be overcome by fastings and prayers. And again, that the anger of the Lord, when it is kindled for vengeance on our crimes, 
can be appeased by this remedy alone. But fasting in general is not only abstinence from food, but also from all carnal delights, yea, from all vicious passions. In like manner, prayer taken generally consists not only in the words by which we call upon the divine mercy, but also in all those things which we do with the devotedness of faith in obedience to our Maker, as the Apostle testifies when he says, Pray without ceasing, pseudo Jerome, or else the folly which is connected with the softness of the flesh is healed by fasting, anger and laziness are healed by prayer. Each wound has its own medicine, which must be applied to it. That which is used for the heal will not cure the eye. By fasting, the passions of the body, by prayer, the plagues of the soul are healed. End of chapter 9, verses 14 through 29.